stop somewhere else first, presumably to pick up another species in the same phase of the project as we are. And they will live in that other module inside Rama. That's what I would assume, Richard replied. Chapter 9 The day of departure was January the 13th, 2215, according to the calendar that had been fastidiously kept by Richard and or Nicole ever since Rama had escaped from the nuclear phalanx. Of course, this date didn't really mean anything, except to them. Their long trip to Sirius at slightly more than half the speed of light had slowed time inside Rama, at least relative to the Earth, so the date they were using was a complete artifice. Richard estimated that the actual date on the Earth, at the time of their departure from the Node, was three to four years later, in 2217 or 2218. It was impossible for him to compute the Earth date exactly, since he did not have an accurate velocity time history from the years that they had travelled inside Rama. Thus, Richard could only approximate the relativistic corrections necessary to transform their own time bases into the one being experienced on the Earth. The date on Earth right now really has no significance to us anyway, Richard explained to Nicole, soon after they had awakened from their final day at the Node. Besides, he continued, it's almost certain that we will be returning to our solar system at extremely high velocities, meaning there will be additional time dilation before we rendezvous in Mars orbit. Nicole had never really understood relativity. It was totally inconsistent with her intuition, and she certainly wasn't going to spend any energy worrying about it on her last day before separating from Simone and Michael. She knew that the final partings would be extremely difficult, for everybody and she wanted to concentrate all her resources on those last emotional moments. The eagle said that he would come for us at eleven, Nicole said to Richard while they were dressing. I was hoping that after breakfast we could all sit together in the living room. I want to encourage the children to express their feelings. Breakfast was light, even cheerful, but when the eight members of the family gathered together in the living room, each mindful that there were less than two hours remaining before the eagle arrived to take everyone but Michael and Simone away. The conversation was forced and strained. The newlyweds sat together on the love seat, facing Richard, Nicole, and the other four children. Katie, as usual, was completely frenetic. She talked constantly. She jumped from subject to subject, steering safely away from any discussion of the imminent departure. Katie was in the middle of a long monologue about a wild dream she had had the night before, when her story was interrupted by the sound of two voices coming from the entryway to the master suite. "'Damn it, Sir John,' said the first variation in Richard's voice. "'This is our last chance. I'm going out there to say goodbye, whether you're coming or not.' "'These goodbyes, my prince, do wrench my very soul. I'm not yet in my cups enough to deaden the pain. You yourself said the lass was the very apparition of an angel.' How can I possibly? Well, then, I'm going out there without you, said Prince Hal. All the eyes in the family were on Richard's tiny robot prince as he came down the hall to the living room. Falstaff staggered after him, stopping every four or five steps to take a drink from his flask. Hal walked over in front of Simone. Dearest lady, he said, bending down on one knee, I cannot find the words to express properly how much I will miss seeing your smiling face. Throughout my entire realm, there is not one member of the fairer sex who is your equal in beauty. Zunds, Falstaff interrupted, throwing himself on both knees beside his prince. Mayhap Sir John has made a mistake. Why am I going with this motley crew? He waved his arm at Richard, Nicole, and the other children, all of whom were smiling broadly when I could remain here in the presence of such magnificent grace, and only this one old man for competition. I remember dull tear sheet. While the pair of twenty-centimeter robots were entertaining the family, Benji rose from his chair and approached Michael and Simone. Hello, he said, fighting back his tears. I'm going to miss you. I love you. Benji paused for a moment, looking first at Simone and then at his father. I hope that you and that they will be very happy. Simone rose from her seat and put her arms around her trembling little brother. Oh, Benji, thank you, she said. I will miss you too. 
and I will carry your spirit with me every day. Her embrace was too much for the boy. Benji's body was racked by sobs, and his soft, sorrowful moan brought tears to the eyes of everyone else. Within moments, Patrick had crawled into his father's lap. He buried his swollen eyes in Michael's chest. Daddy, Daddy, he kept saying over and over. A choreographer could not have designed a more beautiful dance of goodbye. The radiant Simone, looking somehow still serene despite her tears, waltzed around the room, saying a meaningful farewell to each and every member of the family. Michael O'Toole remained sitting on the love seat, with Patrick on his lap and Benji beside him. His eyes brimmed repeatedly as one by one the departing family members came to him for a final embrace. I want to remember this moment forever. There is so much love here, Nicole said to herself as she glanced around the room. Michael was holding little Ellie in his arms. Simone was telling Katie how much she would miss their talks together. For once, even Katie was in emotional knots. She was surprisingly silent when Simone walked back across the room to rejoin her husband. Michael gently lifted Patrick off his lap and took Simone's extended hand. The two of them turned toward the others and dropped to their knees, their hands clasped in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Michael said in a strong voice. He paused for several seconds while the rest of the family, even Richard, knelt beside the couple on the floor. We thank thee for having allowed us the joyful love of this wonderful family. We thank thee also for having shown us thy miraculous handiwork throughout the universe. At this moment we beseech thee, if it be thy will, to look after each of us as we go our separate ways. We know not if it is in thy plan for us once again to share the camaraderie and love that has uplifted all of us. Stay with us all, wherever our paths take us in thy amazing creation, and let us, O Lord, some day be joined together again in this world or the next. Amen. Seconds later, the doorbell rang. The eagle had arrived. Nicole left the house, purposely designed as a smaller version of her family villa at Beauvoir in France, and walked down the narrow lane in the direction of the station. She passed other houses, all dark and empty, and tried to imagine what it would be like when they were full of people. My life has been like a dream, she said to herself. Surely no human has ever had a more varied experience. Some of the houses cast shadows on the lane as the simulated sun completed its arc in the ceiling far above her head. Another remarkable world, Nicole mused, surveying the village in the southeast corner of New Eden. The eagle was correct when he said that the habitat would be indistinguishable from Earth. For a fleeting moment, Nicole thought of that blue, oceanic world nine light years away. In her mental picture, she was standing beside Janos Taburi, thirteen years earlier, as the Newton spacecraft had pulled away from LEO 3. That's Budapest, Janos had said, circling with his fingers a specific feature on the lighted globe shimmering in the observation window. Nicole had then located Beauvoir, or at least the general region, by backtracking up the Loire River from where it emptied into the Atlantic. My home is just about here, she had said to Janos. Maybe my father and daughter are looking in this direction right now. Genevieve, Nicole thought, as the brief recollection faded. My Genevieve. You would be a young woman now, almost thirty. She continued to walk slowly down the lane near her new house in the earth habitat inside Rama. Thinking of her first daughter made Nicole remember a short conversation she had had with the eagle during a break in the video recording at the node. Will I be able to see my daughter Genevieve while we are close to the earth? Nicole had asked. We don't know, the eagle had replied after a short hesitation. It depends entirely on how your fellow humans respond to your message. You yourself will stay inside Rama, even if the contingency plans are evoked, but it is possible that your daughter will be one of the two thousand who come from Earth to live in New Eden. It has happened before, with other spacefarers. And what about Simone? Nicole had asked when the eagle was finished. Will I ever see her again? That is more difficult to answer, the eagle had replied. There are many, many factors involved. The alien creature had stared at his despondent human friend. 
I'm sorry, Mrs. Wakefield, he had said. One daughter left on Earth, another in an alien space world almost a hundred trillion kilometers away, and I will be somewhere else. Who knows where? Nicole was feeling extremely lonely. She stopped her walk and focused her eyes on the scene around her. She was standing beside a circular area in the village park. Inside the rock circumference was a slide, a sandbox, a jungle gym, and a merry-go-round, a perfect playground for Earth children. Underneath her feet, the network of GEDs was interleaved throughout the portions of the park that would eventually contain the grasses brought from Earth. Nicole bent down to examine the individual gas exchange devices. They were compact round objects, only two centimetres in diameter. There were several thousand of them arrayed in rows and columns that crisscrossed the park. Electronic plants, Nicole thought, converting carbon dioxide to oxygen, making it possible for us animals to survive. In her mind's eye, Nicole could see the park with grass, trees and lilies in the small pond, just as it had appeared in the holographic image in the conference room at the node. But even though she knew that Rama was returning to the solar system to acquire human beings who would fill up this technological paradise, it was still difficult for her to imagine this park teeming with children. I have not seen another human being except for my family in almost fifteen years. Nicole left the park and continued toward the station. The residential houses that had lined the narrow lanes were now replaced by rows of buildings containing what would eventually be small shops. Of course, they were all empty, as was the large rectangular structure destined to be a supermarket that was right opposite the station. She walked through the gate and boarded the waiting train in the front, just behind the control cab that was manned by a Benita Garcia robot. Almost dark, Nicole said out loud. Eighteen more minutes, the robot replied. How long to the somnarium? Nicole asked. The ride to Grand Central Station takes ten minutes, Benita answered, as the train left the southeast station. Then you have a two-minute walk. Nicole had known the answer to her question. She had just wanted to hear another voice. This was her second day alone, and a conversation with a Garcia robot was better than talking to herself. The train ride took her from the southeast corner of the colony to its geographic centre. Along the way, Nicole could see Lake Shakespeare on the left-hand side of the train, and the slopes of Mount Olympus, which were covered with more GEDs, on the right. Electronic message monitors inside the train displayed information about the sites that were being passed, the time of day, and the distance that had been travelled. You and the Eagle did a good job on this train system, Nicole thought, thinking of her husband Richard, now asleep along with all the other members of her family. Soon I will be joining you in the big round room. The somnarium was in reality just an extension of the main hospital that was located about two hundred metres from the central train station. After leaving the train and walking past the library, Nicole entered the hospital, walked through it, and then reached the somnarium through a long tunnel. The rest of her family were all asleep in a large, circular room on the second floor. Each was in a berth along the wall, a long, coffin-like contraption hermetically sealed against the outside environment. Only their faces were visible through the small windows near their heads. As she had been trained to do by the eagle, Nicole examined the monitors containing the data about the physical condition of her husband, two daughters, and two sons. Everybody was fine. There were not even any hints of irregularities. Nicole stopped and gazed longingly at each of her loved ones. This was to be her last inspection. According to the procedure, since everyone's critical parameters were well within tolerances, it was now time for Nicole to go to sleep herself. It could be many years before she saw any of her family again. Dear, dear Benji. Nicole sighed as she studied her retarded son in repose. Of all of us, this break in life will be the hardest on you. Katie, Patrick and Ellie will catch up quickly. Their minds are quick and agile, but you will miss the years that might have made you independent. The berths were held out from the circular wall by what looked like wrought iron metalwork. The distance from the head of one berth to the foot of the next was only about a metre and a half. Nicole's empty berth was in the middle. Richard and then Katie were behind her head. Patrick, Benji and Ellie were at her feet. 
She lingered for several minutes beside Richard's berth. He had been the last to go to sleep two days before. As he had requested, Prince Hal and Falstaff were lying on his chest inside the sealed container. Those final three days were wonderful, my love, Nicole said to herself as she stared at her husband's expressionless face through the window. I could not have asked for more. They had swum and even water-skied in Lake Shakespeare, climbed Mount Olympus and made love whenever either one of them had had the slightest inclination. They had clung to each other all through one night in the big bed in their new home. Richard and Nicole had checked on the sleeping children once each day, but had mostly used the time for a thorough exploration of their new realm. It had been an exciting, emotional time. Richard's last words before Nicole activated the system that put him to sleep were, You are a magnificent woman, and I love you very much. Now it was Nicole's turn. She could procrastinate no longer. She climbed into her berth, as she had practised many times during their first week inside New Eden, and flipped all the switches except one. The foam around her was unbelievably comfortable. The top of the berth closed over her head. She had only to trip the final switch to bring the sleeping gas into her compartment. She sighed deeply. As Nicole was lying on her back, she remembered the dream she had had about sleeping beauty during one of her final tests at the node. Her mind then plunged backwards to her childhood, to those wonderful weekends she had spent with her father, watching the Sleeping Beauty pageants at the Chateau de Housset. That's a nice way to go, she said to herself, feeling her drowsiness as the gas crept into her berth, thinking that it will be some Prince Charming who will awaken me. Rendezvous at Mars Chapter One Mrs. Wakefield. The voice seemed far, far away. It intruded gently into her consciousness, but did not quite awaken her from sleep. Mrs. Wakefield. This time it was louder. Nicole tried to recall where she was before opening her eyes. She shifted her body, and the foam reoriented itself to provide maximum comfort. Slowly, her memory began to send signals to the remainder of her brain. New Eden. Inside Rama. Back to the solar system, she recalled. Is this all just a dream? She finally opened her eyes. Nicole had difficulty focusing for several seconds. At length, the figure bending over her resolved itself. It was her mother, dressed in a nurse's uniform. Mrs. Wakefield, the voice said. It is now time to wake up and prepare for their rendezvous. For a moment, Nicole was in a state of shock. Where was she? What was her mother doing here? Then she remembered. The robots, she thought. Mother is one of the five kinds of human robots. An Anawi Tiaso robot is a health and fitness specialist. The robot's helping arm steadied Nicole as she sat up in her berth. The room had not changed during the long time that she had been asleep. Where are we? Nicole asked as she prepared to climb out of the berth. We have completed the major deceleration profile and entered your solar system, the jet-black Anawi Tiasso replied. Mars orbit insertion will be in six months. Her muscles did not seem at all strange. Before Nicole had left the node, the eagle had informed her that each of the sleeping compartments included special electronic components that would not only regularly exercise the muscles and other biological systems to preclude any atrophy, but also monitor the health of all the vital organs. Nicole stepped down the ladder. When she reached the floor, she stretched. How do you feel? asked the robot. She was Anawi Tiaso number 017. Her number was prominently displayed on the right shoulder of her uniform. Not bad, answered Nicole. Not bad, 017, she repeated while examining the robot. It did look remarkably like her mother. Richard and she had seen all the prototypes before they had left the node, but only the Benita Garcias had been operational during the two weeks before they went to sleep. All the rest of the New Eden robots had been built and tested during the long flight. It really does look just like Mother, Nicole mused, admiring the handiwork of the unknown Raman artists. They made all the changes to the prototype that I suggested. In the distance she heard footsteps coming toward them. Nicole turned around. 
Approaching them was a second Anawi Tiaso, also dressed in the white uniform of a nurse. Number 009 has been assigned to help with the initialization procedure as well, the Tiaso robot beside her said. Assigned by whom? Nicole asked, struggling to remember her discussions with the Eagle about the wake-up procedure. By the pre-programmed mission plan, number 017 replied. Once all you humans are alive and alert, we will take all our instructions from you. Richard woke up more rapidly, but was quite clumsy descending the short ladder. It was necessary for the two Tiassos to support him to prevent his falling. Richard was clearly delighted to see his wife. After a long hug and a kiss, he stared at Nicole for several seconds. You look none the worse for wear, he said jokingly. The grey in your hair has spread, but there are still healthy clutches of black in isolated spots. Nicole smiled. It was great to be talking to Richard again. By the way, he asked a second later, how long did we spend in those crazy coffins? Nicole shrugged her shoulders. I don't know, she answered. I haven't asked yet. The first thing I did was wake you up. Richard turned to the two Tiassos. Do you fine women know how long it has been since we left the node? You have slept for nineteen years of traveller's time. Tiasso number 009 replied. What does she mean, traveller's time? Richard smiled. That's a relativistic expression, darling, he said. Time doesn't mean anything unless you have a frame of reference. Inside Rama, nineteen years have passed. But those years only pertain to... Don't bother, Nicole interrupted. I didn't sleep all this time to wake up to a relativity lesson. You can explain it to me later over dinner. Meanwhile, we have a more important issue. In what order should we awaken the children? I have a different suggestion, Richard replied after a moment's hesitation. I know you're eager to see the children, so am I. However, why don't we let them sleep for several more hours? It certainly won't hurt them, and you and I have a lot to discuss. We can begin our preparations for the rendezvous, outline what we are going to do about the children's education, maybe even take a moment or two to become reacquainted ourselves. Nicole was anxious to talk to the children, but the logical part of her mind could see the merit in Richard's suggestion. The family had developed only a rudimentary plan for what would happen after they woke up, primarily because the eagle had insisted that there were too many uncertainties to specify the conditions exactly. It would be much easier to do some planning before the children were awake. All right, Nicole said at length, as long as I know for certain that everyone is all right. She glanced over at the first Yasso. All the monitor data indicates that each of your children survived the sleep period without any significant irregularities, the biot said. Nicole turned back to Richard and carefully studied his face. It had aged a little, but not as much as she had expected. Where's your beard? she blurted out suddenly, realizing that his face was strangely clean-shaven. We shaved the men yesterday while they were sleeping, Tiasso 009 replied. We also cut everybody's hair and gave everyone a bath, in accordance with the pre-programmed mission plan. The men? Nicole thought. She was momentarily puzzled. Of course, she said to herself. Benji and Patrick are now men. She took Richard's hand, and they walked quickly over to Patrick's berth. The face she saw through the window was astonishing. Her little Patrick was no longer a boy. His features had lengthened considerably, and the rounded contours of his face had disappeared. Nicole stared at her son silently for over a minute. His age equivalence is sixteen or seventeen, Tiasso number 017 said in response to Nicole's questioning glance. Mr. Benjamin O'Toole remains a year and a half older. Of course, these ages are only approximations. As the Eagle explained before your departure from the node, we have been able to retard somewhat the key aging enzymes in each of you, but not all at the same rate. When we say that Mr. Patrick O'Toole is sixteen or seventeen now, we are referring only to his personal internal biological clock. The age quoted is some kind of average across his growth, maturation, and subsystem aging processes. Nicole and Richard stopped at each of the other berths and stared for several minutes through the windows at their sleeping children. Nicole repeatedly shook her head in bewilderment. Where have my babies gone? she said, after seeing that even little Ellie had become a teenager during the long voyage. 
We knew this would happen, Richard commented without emotion. Not helping the mother and Nicole cope with the sense of loss that she was feeling. Knowing is one thing, said Nicole, but seeing it and experiencing it is another. This is not a case of a typical mother who suddenly realizes her boys and girls have all grown up. What has happened to our children is truly staggering. Their mental and social development has been interrupted for the equivalent of ten to twelve years. We now have small children walking around in adult bodies. How can we prepare them to meet other humans in just six months? Nicole was overwhelmed. Had some part of her not believed the eagle when he had described what was going to happen to her family? Perhaps. It was one more unbelievable event in a life that had long been beyond comprehension. But, as their mother, Nicole thought to herself, I have much to do, and almost no time. Why didn't I plan for all this before we left the node? While Nicole was struggling with her powerful emotional response to seeing her children suddenly grown, Richard chatted with the two Tiassos. They easily answered all his questions. He was extremely impressed with their capabilities, both physical and mental. Do all of you have such a wealth of information stored in your memories? He asked the robots in the middle of their conversation. Only we Tiassos have the detailed historical health data on your family, 009 replied. But all the human biots can access a wide range of basic facts. However, a portion of that knowledge will be removed at the moment of first contact with other humans. At that time, the memory devices of all biot types will be partially purged. Any event or piece of data pertaining to the eagle, the node, or any situations that transpired before you awakened will not remain in our databases after we rendezvous with the other humans. Only your personal health information will be available from that earlier time period, and this data will be localized in the Tiasos. Nicole had already been thinking about the node before this last comment. Are you still in contact with the eagle? she suddenly asked. No. It was Tiasso 017 who replied this time. It is safe to assume that the eagle, or at least some representative of the nodal intelligence, is periodically monitoring our mission, but there is never any interaction with Rama once it leaves the hangar. You, we, Rama, we are on our own until the mission objectives are fulfilled. Katie stood in front of the full-length mirror and studied her naked body. Even after a month it was still new to her. She loved to touch herself. She especially liked to run her fingers across her breasts and watch her nipples swell in response to the stimulation. Katie liked it even more at night when she was all alone underneath the sheets. Then she could rub herself everywhere until waves of tingles rolled across her body and she wanted to cry out from pleasure. Her mother had explained the phenomenon to her but had seemed a little uncomfortable when Katie had wanted to discuss it a second and a third time. Masturbation is a very private affair, darling, Nicole had said in a low voice one night before dinner, and generally only discussed, if at all, with one's closest friends. Ellie was no help. Katie had never seen her sister examining herself, not even once. She probably doesn't do it at all, Katie thought, and she certainly doesn't want to talk about it. Are you through in the shower? Katie heard Ellie call from the next room. Each of the girls had her own bedroom, but they shared the bath. Yes, Katie shouted in response. Ellie came into the bathroom, modestly wrapped in a towel, and glanced briefly at her sister, standing completely naked in front of the mirror. The younger girl started to say something, but apparently changed her mind, for she dropped the towel and stepped gingerly into the shower. Katie watched Ellie through the transparent door. She looked first at Ellie's body, and then glanced in the mirror, comparing every possible anatomical feature. Katie preferred her own face and skin colour. She was by far the lightest member of the family other than her father. But Ellie had a superior figure. "'Why do I have such a boyish shape?' Katie asked Nicole one evening, two weeks later, after Katie had finished reading through a data cube containing some very old-fashioned magazines. I can't explain exactly, Nicole replied, looking up from her own reading. Genetics is a wonderfully complicated subject, far more complex than Gregor Mendel originally thought. Nicole laughed at herself, realizing immediately that Katie could not possibly have understood what she had just said. Katie, 
she continued in a less pedantic tone. Each child is a unique combination of the characteristics of her two parents. These identifying characteristics are stored in molecules called genes. There are literally billions of different ways the genes from one pair of parents can express themselves. That's why children from the same parents are not all identical. Katie's brow furrowed. She had been expecting a different kind of answer. Nicole quickly understood. Besides, she added in a comforting tone, your figure is really not boyish at all. Athletic would be a more descriptive word. At any rate, Katie rejoined, pointing at her sister, who was studying hard over in the corner of the family room. I certainly don't look like Ellie. Her body is really attractive. Her breasts are even larger and rounder than yours. Nicole laughed naturally. <laughs> Ellie does have an imposing figure, she said. But yours is just as good. It's simply different. Nicole returned to her reading, thinking the conversation was over. They don't have many women with my kind of figure in these old magazines, Katie persisted after a short silence. She was holding up her electronic notebook, but Nicole was no longer paying attention. You know, mother, her daughter then said, I think that the eagle made some kind of mistake with the controls in my birth. I think I must have received some of the hormones that were meant for Patrick or Benji. Katie, darling, Nicole replied, finally realizing that her daughter was obsessed with her figure. It is virtually certain that you have become the person your genes were programmed to be at conception. You are a lovely, intelligent young woman. You would be happier if you spent your time thinking about your many excellent attributes instead of finding an imperfection in yourself and wishing to be somebody different. Since they had awakened, many of their mother-daughter conversations had had a similar pattern. To Katie, it seemed that her mother did not try to understand her and was too ready with a lecture and or an epigram. There's far more to life than just feeling good, was a regular refrain that resounded in Katie's ears. On the other hand, her mother's praise for Ellie seemed effusive to Katie. Ellie is such a good student, even though she started so late. Ellie is always helpful without asking her. Or, why can't you be a little more patient with Benji, like Ellie is? First Simone, and now Ellie, Katie said to herself as she lay naked in bed late one night, after she and her sister had quarrelled and her mother had reprimanded only her. I've never had a chance with mother. We're just too different. I might as well stop trying. Her fingers roamed over her body, stimulating her desire, and Katie sighed in anticipation. At least, she thought, there are some things that I don't need mother for. Richard, Nicole said, one evening in bed, when they were only six weeks away from Mars. Mm, he responded slowly. He had been almost asleep. I'm concerned about Katie she said. I'm happy with the progress the other children are making, especially Benji, bless his heart. But I have real worries about Katie. What exactly is it that's bothering you? Richard said, propping himself on one elbow. Her attitudes, mostly. Katie is incredibly self-centered. She also has a quick temper and is impatient with the other children, even Patrick, who absolutely adores her. She argues with me all the time, often when it's a nonsensical dispute and I think she spends far too many hours alone in her room. She's just bored, Richard replied. Remember, Nicole, physically she's a young woman in her early twenties. She should be dating, asserting her independence. There's really nobody here who is a peer, and you must admit that sometimes we treat her like a twelve-year-old. Nicole did not say anything. Richard leaned over and touched her arm. We've always known that Katie was the most high-strung of the children. Unfortunately, she's a lot like me. But at least you channel your energy into worthwhile projects, Nicole said. Katie is as likely to be destructive as constructive. Really, Richard, I wish you would talk to her. Otherwise, I'm afraid we're going to have big problems when we meet the other humans. What do you want me to say to her? Richard replied after a short silence. That life is not just one excitement after another. And why should I ask her not to retreat into her fantasy world in her own room? It's probably more interesting there. Unfortunately, there's nothing very exciting for a young woman anywhere in New Eden at the present time. I had hoped you would be a little more understanding, Nicole replied, slightly miffed. 
I need your help, Richard. And Katie responds better to you. Again, Richard was silent. All right, he said finally, in a frustrated tone. He lay back down in the bed. I'll take Katie water skiing tomorrow. She loves that. And at least ask her to be more considerate of the other members of the family. Very good. Excellent, Richard said, finishing his reading of the material in Patrick's notebook. He switched off the power and glanced over at his son, who was sitting somewhat nervously in the chair opposite Richard. You have learned algebra quickly, Richard continued. You are definitely gifted in mathematics. By the time we have other people in New Eden, you will be almost ready for university courses, at least in mathematics and science. But Mother says I'm still way behind in my English, Patrick replied. She says that my compositions are those of a young child. Nicole overheard the conversation and walked in from the kitchen. Patrick, darling, Garcia 041 says that you do not take writing seriously. I know that you cannot learn everything overnight, but I don't want you to be embarrassed when we meet the other humans. But I like maths and science better, Patrick protested. Our Einstein robot says he could teach me calculus in three or four weeks, if I didn't have so many other subjects to study. The front door suddenly opened, and Katie and Ellie breezed in. Katie's face was bright and alive. Sorry we're late, she said, but we have had a big day. She turned to Patrick. I drove the boat across Lake Shakespeare by myself. We left the Garcia on the shore. Ellie was not nearly as ecstatic as her sister. In fact, she looked a little piqued. Are you all right, dear? Nicole said quietly to her younger daughter, while Katie was regaling the rest of the family with her tales of their adventure on the lake. Ellie nodded, but didn't say anything. What was really exciting, Katie enthused, was crossing over our own waves at high speeds. Bam, bam, bam! We bounced from wave to wave. Sometimes I felt as if we were flying. Those boats are not toys, Nicole commented a few moments later. She motioned for everyone to come to the dinner table. Benji, who had been in the kitchen, picking at the salad with his fingers, was the last to sit down. What would you have done if the boat had capsized? Nicole asked Katie when everyone was seated. The Gassiers would have rescued us, Katie answered flippantly. There were three of them watching us from the shore. After all, that's what they're for. Besides, we were wearing life vests, and I can swim anyway. But your sister can't, Nicole replied quickly, a critical tone in her voice. And you know she would have been terrified if she had been thrown into the lake. Katie started to argue, but Richard interceded and changed the subject before the conflict escalated. In truth, the entire family was edgy. Rama had gone into orbit around Mars a month earlier, and there was still no sign of the contingent from Earth that they were supposed to meet. Nicole had always assumed that their rendezvous with their fellow humans would take place immediately after Mars' orbit insertion. After dinner, the family went out into Richard's small backyard observatory to look at Mars. The observatory had access to all the external sensors on Rama, but none of the internal ones outside of New Eden. The Eagle had been very firm about this particular point during their design discussions, and could present a splendid telescopic view of the Red Planet for part of each Martian day. Benji especially liked the observing sessions with Richard. He proudly pointed out the volcanoes in the Tharsis region, the great canyon called Valles Marineris, and the Kreis area, where the first Viking spacecraft had landed over two hundred years before. A dust storm was just forming south of Much Station, the hub of the large Martian colony that had been abandoned in the fitful days following the Great Chaos. Richard speculated that the dust might spread across the entire planet, since it was the proper season for such global storms. Katie asked during a quiet point in their Martian observations. And mother, please give us a straight answer this time. After all, we're not children any more. Nicole ignored the challenging tone in Katie's comment. If I remember correctly, the baseline plan is for us to wait here in Mars orbit for six months, she replied. If there is no rendezvous during that time, Rama will head for Earth. She paused for several seconds. Neither your father nor I know what the procedure will be from that point forward. The Eagle told us that if any of the contingency plans are invoked, we will be told at the time as much as we are required to know. The room was quiet for almost a minute, as images of Mars at different resolutions appeared on the giant screen on the wall. Where is Earth? Benji then asked. It's the planet just inside Mars, 
The next one closer to the sun, Richard answered. Remember, I showed you the planetary lineup in the subroutine in my computer. That's not what I meant, Benji answered very slowly. I want to see Earth. It was a simple enough request. It had never occurred to Richard, although he had brought the family out to the observatory several times before, that the children might be interested in that barely blue light in the Martian night sky. Earth is not very impressive from this distance, Richard said, interrogating his database to obtain the right sensor output. In fact, it looks pretty much like any other bright object, such as Sirius, for example. Richard had missed the point. Once he had identified the Earth in a specific celestial frame and then centred the image around that apparently insignificant reflection, the children all stared with rapt attention. That is their home planet, Nicole thought, fascinated by the sudden change of mood in the room. Even though they have never been there. Pictures of the Earth from her memory flooded Nicole as she too stared at the tiny light in the centre of the image. She became aware of a profound homesickness deep within her, a longing to return to that blessed, oceanic planet filled with so much beauty. Tears swelled into her eyes as she moved up closer to her children and put her arms around them. "'Wherever we go in this amazing universe,' she said softly, "'both now and in the future, that blue speck will always be our home.'" Chapter 2 Nai Boitong rose in the pre-dawn dark. She slipped into a sleeveless cotton dress, stopped briefly to pay respects to her personal Buddha in the family's Hong Pra adjacent to the living room, and then opened the front door without disturbing any of the other members of the family. The summer air was soft. In the breeze she could smell flowers mixed with Thai spices. Someone was already cooking breakfast in the neighbourhood. Her sandals made no sound on the soft dirt lane. Nye walked slowly, her head turning from right to left, her eyes absorbing all the familiar shadows that would soon be only memories. My last day, she thought. It has finally come. After a few minutes, she turned right onto the paved street that led to the small Lampun business district. An occasional bicycle passed her, but the morning was mostly quiet. None of the shops were yet open. As she approached a temple, Nye passed two Buddhist monks, one on either side of the road. Each of the monks was dressed in the customary saffron robe and was carrying a large metal urn. They were seeking their breakfasts, just as they did every morning throughout Thailand, and were counting on the generosity of the townspeople of Lampun. A woman appeared in a shop doorway right in front of Nai and dropped some food in the monk's urn. No words were exchanged, and the monk's expression did not visibly alter to acknowledge the donation. They owe nothing, Nye mused to herself, not even the robes upon their backs, and yet they're happy. She recited quickly the basic tenet, the cause of suffering is desire, and recalled the incredible wealth of her new husband's family in the Higashiyama district on the edge of Kyoto, Japan. Kenji says his mother has everything but peace. It eludes her because she cannot buy it. For a moment the recent memory of the grand house of the Watanabes filled her mind, pushing aside the image of the simple Thai road along which she was walking. Nye had been overwhelmed by the opulence of the Kyoto mansion. But it had not been a friendly place for her. It had been immediately obvious that Kenji's parents viewed her as an interloper, an inferior foreigner who had married their son without their support. They had not been unkind, just cold. They had dissected her with questions about her family and educational background, that had been delivered with emotionless and logical precision. Kenji had later comforted Nye by pointing out that his family would not be with them on Mars. She stopped in the street in Lampun and looked across at the temple of Queen Kamatevi. It was Nye's favourite place in town, probably her favourite place in all of Thailand. Parts of the temple were fifteen hundred years old. Its silent stone sentinels had seen a history so different from the present that it might as well have occurred on another planet. Nye crossed the street and stood in the courtyard, just inside the temple walls. It was an unusually clear morning. Just above the uppermost chedi of the old Thai temple, a strong light shone in the dark morning sky. Nye realized that the light was Mars, her next destination. 
the juxtaposition was perfect. For all twenty-six years of her life, except for the four years she had spent at the University of Chiang Mai, this town of Lampun had been her home. Within six weeks she would be on board a giant spaceship that would take her to her living quarters for the next five years, in a space colony on the Red Planet. Nye sat down in the lotus position in a corner of the courtyard and stared fixedly at that light in the sky. How fitting, she thought, that Mars is looking down on me this morning. She began the rhythmic breathing that was the prelude for her morning meditation. But as she was preparing for the peace and calm that usually centred her for the day ahead, Nye recognised that there were many powerful and unresolved emotions inside her. First, I must reflect, Nye thought, deciding to forego her meditation temporarily. On this, my last day at home, I must make peace with the events that have changed my life completely. Eleven months earlier, Nai Boitong had been sitting in the identical spot, her French and English lesson cubes neatly packed beside her in a carrying case. Nai had been planning to organise her material for the coming school term, determined that she was going to be more interesting and energetic as a high school language teacher. Before she had started working on her lesson outlines on that fateful day the previous year, Nai had read the daily Chiang Mai newspaper. Slipping the cube into her reader, she had flipped quickly through the pages, scarcely reading more than the headlines. On the back page there had been a notice, written in English, that had caught her eye. Doctor, nurse, teacher, farmer. Are you adventurous, multilingual, healthy? The International Space Agency, ISA, is mounting a major expedition to recolonize Mars. Outstanding individuals with the critical skills defined above are sought for a five-year assignment in the colony. Personal interviews will be held in Chiang Mai on Monday, August the 23rd, 2244. Pay and benefits are exceptional. Applications may be requested from Thai Telemail, number 462624930. When she had first submitted her application to the ISA, Nye had not thought that her chances were very high. She had been virtually certain that she would not pass the first screening and therefore would not even qualify for the personal interview. Nye was quite surprised, in fact, when, six weeks later, she received a notice in her electronic mailbox that she had been provisionally selected for the interviews. The notice also informed Nye that, according to the procedure, she should ask whatever personal questions she might have by mail first, before the interview. The ISA stressed that they only wanted to interview those candidates who intended to accept if an assignment in the Martian colony were to be offered. Nye responded by telemail with a single question. Could a significant portion of her earnings while she was living on Mars be directed to a bank on Earth? She added that this was an essential precondition for her acceptance. Ten days later, another electronic mail notice arrived. It was very succinct. Yes, the message said a portion of her earnings could be regularly sent to a bank on Earth. However, it continued, Nye would have to be absolutely certain about her division of the monies. Whatever split a colonist decided on could not be changed after he or she left the Earth. Because the cost of living in Lampun was low, the salary offered by the ISA for a language teacher in the Martian colony was almost double what Nye needed to handle all her family obligations. The young woman was heavily burdened with responsibility. She was the only wage earner in a family of five that included her invalid father, her mother, and her two younger sisters. Her childhood had been difficult, but her family had managed to survive just above the poverty line. During Nye's final year at the university, however, disaster had struck. First her father had had a debilitating stroke. Then her mother, whose business sense was non-existent, had ignored the recommendations of family and friends and had tried to manage the small family craft shop on her own. Within a year the family had lost everything, and Nye was forced not only to use her personal savings to provide food and clothing for her family. Within a year the family had lost everything, and Nye was forced not only to use her personal savings to provide food and clothing for her family, but also to abandon her dream of doing literary translation work for one of the big publishing houses in Bangkok. Nye taught school during the week and was a tourist guide on the weekend. On the Saturday before the ISA interview, Nye was conducting a tour in Chiang Mai, 30 kilometres from her home. 
In her group were several Japanese, one of whom was a handsome, articulate young man in his early thirties, who spoke practically unaccented English. His name was Kenji Watanabe. He paid very close attention to everything Nai said, always asked intelligent questions, and was extremely polite. Near the end of the tour of the Buddhist holy places in the Chiang Mai area, the group rode the cable car up the mountain Doi Sutep to visit the famous Buddhist temple on its summit. Most of the tourists were exhausted from the day's activities, but not Kenji Watanabe. First, the man insisted on climbing the long dragon stairway like a Buddhist pilgrim, rather than riding the funicular from the cable car exit to the top. Then, he asked question after question while Nai was explaining the wonderful story of the founding of the temple. Finally, when they had descended and Nai was sitting by herself, having tea in the lovely restaurant at the foot of the mountain, Kenji left the other tourists in the souvenir shops and approached her table. Kaotori cup, he said in excellent Thai, astonishing Miss Boitong. May I sit down? I have a few more questions. Kung po de pasa tai dai mai ka? Nai asked, still shocked. Pong kao jai pasa tai dai nit boy? He answered, indicating that he understood a little Thai. How about you? Ni hong go hanshimasen. She smiled. Only English, French, and Thai. Although I can sometimes understand simple Japanese if it is spoken very slowly. I was fascinated, Kenji said in English, after sitting down opposite Nai, by the murals depicting the founding of the temple on Doi Sutep. It is a wonderful legend, a blend of history and mysticism. But as a historian, I'm curious about two things. First, couldn't this venerable monk from Sri Lanka have known from some religious sources outside of the kingdom of Lan Na, that there was a relic of the Buddha in that nearby abandoned pagoda. It seems unlikely to me that he would have risked his reputation otherwise. Second, it seems too perfect, too much like life imitating art, for that white elephant carrying the relic to have climbed Doi Sutep by chance, and then to have expired just when he reached the peak. Are there any non-Buddhist historical sources from the 15th century that corroborate the story? Nye stared at the eager Mr. Watanabe for several seconds before replying. Sir, she said with a wan smile, in my two years of conducting tours of the Buddhist sites of this region, I have never had anybody ask me either one of those questions. I certainly do not know the answers myself, but if you are interested, I can give you the name of a professor at Chiang Mai University who is extremely well versed in the Buddhist history of the kingdom of Lan Na. He is an expert on the entire time period, beginning with King Mengrai. Their conversation was interrupted by an announcement that the cable car was now ready to accommodate passengers for the trip back to the city. Nai rose from her seat and excused herself. Kenji rejoined the rest of the group. As Nai watched him from afar, she kept recalling the intensity in his eyes. They were incredible, she was thinking. I have never seen eyes so clear and so full of curiosity. She saw those eyes again the following Monday afternoon, when she went to the Dusit Tani Hotel in Chiang Mai for her ISA interview. She was astonished to see Kenji sitting behind a desk with the official ISA emblem on his shirt. Nai was initially flustered. I had not looked at your documents before Saturday, Kenji said as an apology. I promise. If I had known you were one of the applicants, I would have taken a different tour. The interview eventually went smoothly. Kenji was extremely complimentary, both about Nai's outstanding academic record and her volunteer work with the orphanages in Lampun and Chiang Mai. Nai was honest in admitting that she had not always had an overpowering desire to travel in space, but since she was basically adventurous by nature, and this ISA position would also allow her to take care of her family obligations, she had applied for the assignment on Mars. Toward the end of the interview, there was a pause in the conversation. Is that all? Nai asked pleasantly, rising from her chair. One more thing, perhaps, Kenji Watanabe said, suddenly awkward. That is, if you're any good at interpreting dreams. Nai smiled and sat back down. Go on, she said. Kenji took a deep breath. Saturday night, I dreamed I was in the jungle. Somewhere near the foot of Doi Sutep. I knew where I was because I could see the golden chedi at the top of my dream screen. 
I was rushing through the trees, trying to find my way, when I encountered a huge python sitting on a broad branch beside my head. Where are you going? the python asked me. I'm looking for my girlfriend, I answered. She's at the top of the mountain, the python said. I broke free of the jungle, into the sunlight, and looked at the summit of Doi Sutep. My childhood sweetheart, Kiko Murasawa, was standing there, waving down at me. I turned around and glanced back at the python. Look again, it said. When I looked up the mountain the second time, the woman's face had changed. It was no longer Kiko. It was you, who was now waving to me from the top of Doi Sutep. Kenji was silent for several seconds. I have never had such an unusual or vivid dream. I thought, perhaps... Nai had had goosebumps on her arms while Kenji was telling the story. She had known the ending. That she, Nai Boatong, would be the woman waving from the top of the mountain before he had finished. Nai leaned forward in her chair. Mr. Watanabe, she said slowly, I hope that what I am going to say does not offend you in any way. Nai was quiet for several seconds. We have a famous Thai proverb, she said at length, her eyes avoiding his, that says when a snake talks to you in a dream, you have found the man or woman that you will marry. Six weeks later, I received the notice, Nai remembered. She was still sitting in the courtyard beside Queen Kamatevi's temple in Lampun. The package of ISA materials came three days afterward, along with the flowers from Kenji. Kenji himself had appeared in Lampun the following weekend. I'm sorry I didn't call or anything, he had apologized. But it just didn't make sense to pursue the relationship unless you also were going to Mars. He had proposed on Sunday afternoon, and Nai had quickly accepted. They had been married in Kyoto three months later. The Watanabes had graciously paid for Nai's two sisters and three of her other Thai friends to travel to Japan for the wedding. Her mother could not come, unfortunately, for there was nobody else to look after Nai's father. Nai took a deep breath. Her review of the recent changes in her life was now over. She was ready to begin her meditation. Thirty minutes later, she was quite serene, happy and expectant about the unknown life in front of her. The sun had risen, and there were other people on the temple grounds. She walked slowly around the perimeter, trying to savour her last moments in her home village. Inside the main vihan, after an offering and the burning of incense at the altar, Nai carefully studied every panel of the paintings on the walls she had seen so many times before. The pictures told the life story of Queen Kamatevi, her one and only heroine ever since childhood. In the seventh century, the many tribes in the Lampun area had had different cultures and had often been at war with each other. All they had in common at that particular epoch was a legend, a myth that said a young queen would arrive from the south, borne by huge elephants, and would unite all the diverse tribes in the Haripunchai kingdom. Kamatevi had been only twenty-three when an old soothsayer identified her to some emissaries from the north as the future queen of the Hampuchai as the future queen of the Haripunchai. She was a young and beautiful princess of the Mons, the Khmer people who would later construct Angkor Wat. Kamatevi was also extremely intelligent, a rare woman of the era, and very much favoured by everyone at the royal court. The Mons were therefore stunned when she announced that she was giving up her life of leisure and plenty and heading north on a harrowing six-month journey across seven hundred kilometres of mountains, jungles and swamps. When Kamatevi and her retinue, borne by huge elephants, reached the verdant valley in which Lampun lay, her future subjects immediately put aside their factional quarrels and placed the beautiful young queen on the throne. She ruled for fifty years in wisdom and justice, lifting her kingdom from obscurity into an age of social progress and artistic accomplishment. When she was seventy years old, Kamatevi abdicated her throne and divided her kingdom in half, each ruled by one of her twin sons. The queen then announced that she was dedicating the remainder of her life to God. She entered a Buddhist monastery and gave away all of her possessions. She lived a simple, pious life in the monastery, dying at the age of ninety-nine. By then the golden age of the Haripunchai was over. 
On the final wall panel inside the temple, an ascetic and wizened woman is carried away to Nirvana in a magnificent chariot. A younger Queen Kamatevi, radiantly beautiful beside her Buddha, sits above the chariot in the splendor of the heavens. Nai Bwatong Watanabe, Martian colonist designate, sat on her knees in the temple in Lampun, Thailand, and offered a silent prayer to the spirit of her heroine from the distant past. Dear Kamatevi, she said, you have watched over me for these twenty-six years. Now I am about to leave for an unknown place, much as you did when you came north to find the Haripunchai. Guide me with your wisdom and insight as I go to this new and wonderful world. Chapter 3 Yukiko was wearing a black silk shirt, white pants, and a black and white beret. She crossed the living room to talk to her brother. I wish you would come, Kenji, she said. It's going to be the largest demonstration for peace that the world has ever seen. Kenji smiled at his younger sister. I would like to, Yuki, he replied. But I only have two more days before I must leave, and I want to spend the time with mother and father. Their mother entered the room from the opposite side. She looked harried, as usual, and was carrying a large suitcase. Everything is now packed properly, she said but I still wish you would change your mind. Hiroshima is going to be a madhouse. The Asahi Simbun says they are expecting a million visitors, almost half of them from abroad. Thank you, mother, Yukiko said, reaching for the suitcase. As you know, Satoko and I will be at the Hiroshima Prince Hotel. Now, don't worry. We will call every morning before the activities begin, and I'll be home Monday afternoon. The young woman opened the suitcase and reached inside a special compartment, pulling out a diamond bracelet and a sapphire ring. She put them both on. Don't you think you should leave those things at home? Her mother fussed. Remember, there will be all those foreigners. Your jewellery may be too much temptation for them. Yukiko laughed in the uninhibited way that Kenji adored. Mother, she said, you're such a worrywart. All you ever think about is what bad things might happen. We're going to Hiroshima for the ceremonies commemorating the 300th anniversary of the dropping of the atomic bomb. Our Prime Minister will be there, as well as three of the members of the Central Council of the COG. Many of the world's most famous musicians will be performing in the evenings. This will be what Father calls an enriching experience. And all you can think about is who might steal my jewellery. When I was young, it was unheard of for two girls not yet finished at the university, to travel around Japan unchaperoned. Mother, we've been through this before, Yuki interrupted. I'm almost twenty-two years old. Next year, after I finish my degree, I'm going to live away from home, on my own, maybe even in another country. I'm no longer a child, and Satoko and I are perfectly capable of looking after one another. Yukiko checked her watch. I must go now, she said. She is probably already waiting for me at the subway station. She strode gracefully over to her mother and gave her a perfunctory kiss. Yuki shared a longer embrace with her brother. Be well, Anisan, she whispered in his ear. Take care of yourself and your lovely wife on Mars. We're all very proud of you. Kenji had never really known Yukiko very well. He was, after all, almost twelve years older than she. Yuki had been only four when Mr. Watanabe had been assigned to the position of president of the American Division of International Robotics. The family had moved across the Pacific to a suburb of San Francisco. Kenji had not paid much attention to his younger sister in those days. In California, he had been much more interested in his new life, especially after he started at UCLA. The elder Watanabes and Yukiko had returned to Japan in 2232, leaving Kenji as a sophomore in history at the university. He had had very little contact with Yuki since then. During his annual visits to his home in Kyoto, Kenji always meant to spend some private hours with Yukiko, but it never seemed to happen. Either she was too deeply involved in her own life, or his parents had scheduled too many social functions, or Kenji himself had just not left enough time. Kenji was vaguely sad as he stood at the door and watched Yukiko disappear in the distance. I'm leaving this planet, he thought, and yet I've never taken the time to know my own sister. Mrs. Watanabe was talking in a monotone behind him, expressing her feeling that her life had been a failure because none of her children had any respect for her 
and they had all moved away. Now her only son, who had married a woman from Thailand just to embarrass them, was going off to live on Mars, and she wouldn't see him for over five years. As for her middle daughter, she and her banker husband had at least given her two grandchildren, but they were as dull and boring as their parents. How is Fumiko? Kenji interrupted his mother. Will I have a chance to see her and my nieces before I leave? They're coming over from Kobe for dinner tomorrow night, his mother replied, although I have no idea what I'm going to feed them. Did you know that Tatsuo and Fumiko are not even teaching those girls how to use chopsticks? Can you imagine? A Japanese child who does not know how to use chopsticks is nothing sacred. We've given up our identity to become rich. I was telling your father. Kenji excused himself from his mother's querulous monologue and sought refuge in his father's study. Framed photographs lined the walls of the room, the archives of a successful man's personal and professional life. Two of the pictures held special memories for Kenji as well. In one of the photos, he and his father were each holding on to a large trophy given by the country club to the winners in the annual father-son golf tournament. In the other, the beaming Mr. Watanabe was presenting a large medal to his son after Kenji had won first prize in all Kyoto in the high school academic competition. What Kenji had forgotten until seeing the photographs again was that Toshio Nakamura, the son of his father's closest friend and business associate, had been the runner-up in both contests. In both pictures, the young Nakamura, almost a head taller than Kenji, was wearing an intense, angry frown on his face. That was long before all his trouble, Kenji thought. Kenji thought. He remembered the headline, Osaka Executive Arrested, which had proclaimed four years earlier the indictment of Toshio Nakamura. The article underneath the headline had explained that Mr. Nakamura, who was at the time already a vice president in the Tomozawa Hotel Group, had been charged with very serious crimes, ranging from bribery to pandering to trafficking in human slavery. Within four months, Nakimura had been convicted and sentenced to several years in detention. Kenji had been astonished. What in the world happened to Nakimura? He had wondered many times in the intervening four years. While Kenji was remembering his boyhood rival, he felt very sorry for Keiko Murasawa, Nakimura's wife, for whom Kenji himself had had a special affection when he was a sixteen-year-old in Kyoto. Kenji and Nakamura had, in fact, vied for the love of Keiko for almost a year. When Keiko had finally made it clear that she preferred Kenji over Toshio, young Nakamura had been furious. He had even confronted Kenji one morning, near the Ryoanji temple, and threatened him physically. I might have married Keiko myself, Kenji thought, if I had stayed in Japan. He gazed out the window at the moss garden. It was raining outside. He suddenly had an especially poignant memory of a rainy day during his adolescence. Kenji had walked over to her house as soon as his father had told him the news. A Chopin concerto had greeted his ears the moment he turned into the lane leading to her house. Mrs. Murasawa had answered the door and had addressed him sternly. Keiko is practicing now she had said to Kenji. She won't be finished for over an hour. Please, Mrs. Murasawa, the sixteen-year-old boy had said. It's very important. Her mother was about to close the door when Keiko herself caught sight of Kenji through the window. She stopped playing and rushed over. Her radiant smile sending a rush of joy through the young man. Hi, Kenji, she said. What's up? Something very important, he replied mysteriously. Can you come with me for a walk? Mrs. Murasawa had grumbled about the coming recital, but Keiko convinced her mother that she could afford to miss practice for one day. The girl grabbed an umbrella and joined Kenji in front of the house. As soon as they were out of view of her home, she slipped her arm through his, as she always did when they walked together. So, my friend, Keiko said, as they followed their normal route toward the hills behind their section of Kyoto. What's so very important? I don't want to tell you now, Kenji answered. Not here, anyway. I want to wait until we're in the right place. Kenji and Keiko laughed and made small talk as they headed for Philosopher's Walk, a beautiful path that wound for several kilometres along the bottom of the eastern hills. The route had been made famous by the twentieth-century philosopher Nashida Kitaro, who supposedly took the walk every morning. 
It led past some of Kyoto's most famous scenic spots, including Ginkakuji, the Silver Pavilion, and Kenji's personal favorite, the old Buddhist temple called the Honen Inn. Behind and to the side of the Honen Inn was a small cemetery with about seventy or eighty graves and tombstones. Earlier that year, Kenji and Keiko, while adventuring on their own, had discovered that the cemetery housed the remains of some of Kyoto's most prominent citizens of the twentieth century, including the celebrated novelist Yunichiro Tanizaki and the doctor poet Iwao Matsuo. After their discovery, Kenji and Keiko made the cemetery their regular meeting place. Once, after they had both read the Makioka sisters, Tanizaki's masterpiece of Osaka life in the 1930s, they had laughingly argued for over an hour while sitting beside the author's tombstone about which of the Makioka sisters Keiko resembled the most. On the day that Mr. Watanabe informed Kenji that the family was moving to America, it had already started to rain by the time Kenji and Keiko reached the Honin Inn. There, Kenji turned right onto a small lane and headed toward an old gate with a woven straw roof. As Keiko expected, they did not enter the temple, but instead climbed the steps leading to the cemetery. But Kenji did not stop at Tanazaki's tomb. He climbed up higher, to another graveside. This is where Dr. Iwao Matsuo is buried, Kenji said, pulling out his electronic notebook. We are going to read a few of his poems. Keiko sat close beside her friend. The two of them nestled under her umbrella in the light rain, while Kenji read three poems. I have one final poem, Kenji then said, a special haiku written by a friend of Dr. Matsuo's. One day, in the month of June, after a cooling dish of ice cream, we bid each other farewell. They were both silent for several seconds after Kenji recited the haiku from memory a second time. Keiko became alarmed and even a little frightened when Kenji's serious expression did not waver. The poem talks of a parting, she said softly. Are you telling me that? Not by choice, Keiko, Kenji interrupted her. He hesitated for several seconds. My father has been assigned to America, he continued at length. We will move there next month. Kenji had never seen such a forlorn look on Keiko's beautiful face. When she looked up at him with those terribly sad eyes, he thought his heart would tear apart. He held her tightly in the afternoon rain, both of them crying, and swore he would love only her forever. Chapter 4 The younger waitress, the one in the light blue kimono with the old-fashioned obi, pulled back the sliding screen and entered the room. She was carrying a tray with beer and sake. Oh, sake, onagai, shimasu, Kenji's father said politely, holding up his sake cup as the lady poured. Kenji took a drink of his cold beer. The older waitress now returned, soundlessly, with a small plate of hors d'oeuvres. In the centre was a shellfish of some kind, in a light sauce, but Kenji could not have identified either the mollusk or the sauce. He had not eaten more than a handful of these kaiseki meals in the seventeen years since he had left Kyoto. Kampai, Kenji said, clinking his beer glass against his father's sake cup. Thank you, father. I am honoured to be having dinner here with you. Kicho was the most famous restaurant in the Kansai region, perhaps in all of Japan. It was also frighteningly expensive, for it preserved the full traditions of personal service, private eating rooms, and seasonal dishes with only the highest quality ingredients. Every course was a delight to the eye as well as to the palate. When Mr. Watanabe had informed his son that they were going to dine alone, just the two of them, Kenji had never imagined that it would be at Kicho. They had been talking about the expedition to Mars. How many of the other colonists are Japanese? Mr. Watanabe asked. Quite a few, Kenji replied. Almost three hundred, if I remember correctly. There were many top-quality applications from Japan. Only America has a larger contingent. Do you know any of the others from Japan personally? Two or three. Yasuko Horikawa was briefly in my class in Kyoto in junior high school. You may remember her. Very, very smart. Buck teeth, thick glasses. She is, or was, I should say, a chemist with Dai Nippon. Mr. Watanabe smiled. I think I do remember her, he said. Uh, did she come over to the house the night that Keiko played the piano? Yes, I think so, 
Kenji said easily. He laughed. But I have a hard time remembering anything other than Keiko from that night. Mr. Watanabe emptied his sake cup. The younger attendant, who was sitting unobtrusively on her knees in a corner of the tatami mat room, came to the table to refill it. Kenji, I am concerned about the criminals, Mr. Watanabe said as the young lady departed. What are you talking about, father? Kenji said. I read a long story in a magazine that said the ISA had recruited several hundred convicts to be part of your Lowell colony. The article stressed that all of the criminals had perfect records during their times of detention, as well as outstanding skills. But why was it necessary to accept convicts at all? Kenji took a swallow from his beer. In truth, father, he replied, we have had some difficulty with the recruitment process. First, we had an unrealistic view of how many people would apply, and we set up screening criteria that were far too tough. Second, the five-year minimum time requirement was a mistake. To young people in particular, a decision to do anything for that long a period is an overwhelming commitment. Most importantly, the press seriously undermined the entire staffing process. At the time we were soliciting applications, there were myriad articles in magazines and specials on television about the demise of the Martian colonies a hundred years ago. People were frightened that history might repeat itself, and they too could be left permanently abandoned on Mars. Kenji paused briefly, but Mr. Watanabe said nothing. In addition, as you are well aware, the project has had recurring financial crises. It was during a budget squeeze last year that we first began to consider skilled model convicts as a way of solving some of our personnel and budgetary difficulties. Although they would be paid only modest salaries, there were still plenty of inducements to cause the convicts to apply. Selection meant granting of full pardons and therefore freedom when they returned to Earth after the five-year term. In addition, the ex-prisoners would be full citizens of Lowell Colony like everyone else and would no longer have to tolerate the onerous monitoring of their every activity. Kenji stopped as two small pieces of broiled fish, delicate and beautiful and sitting on a bed of variegated leaves, were placed upon the table. Mr. Watanabe picked up a piece of fish with his chopsticks. Oishi desu, he commented, without glancing at his son. Kenji reached for his piece of fish. The discussion of the convicts in Lowell Colony had apparently ended. Kenji looked behind his father, where he could see the lovely garden for which the restaurant was so famous. A tiny stream dropped down polished steps and ran beside a half-dozen exquisite dwarf trees. The seat facing the garden was always the position of honour for a traditional Japanese meal. Mr. Watanabe had insisted that Kenji should have the garden view during this last dinner. "'You are not able to attract any Chinese colonists?' his father asked, after they had finished the fish. Kenji shook his head. Only a few from Singapore and Malaysia. Both the Chinese and Brazilian governments forbade their citizens to apply. The Brazilian decision was expected. Their South American empire is virtually at war with the COG. But we had hoped that the Chinese might soften their stand. I guess a hundred years of isolation doesn't die that easily. You can't really blame them, Mr. Watanabe commented. Their nation suffered terribly during the great chaos. All the foreign capital disappeared overnight, and their economy immediately collapsed. We did manage to recruit a few black Africans, maybe a hundred altogether, and a handful of Arabs. But most of the colonists are from the countries that contribute significantly to the ISA. That's probably to be expected. Kenji became suddenly embarrassed. The entire conversation since they had entered the restaurant had been about him and his activities. During the next few courses, Kenji asked his father questions about his work at International Robotics. Mr. Watanabe, who was now the chief operating officer of the corporation, always glowed with pride when he talked about his company. It was the world's largest manufacturer of robots for the factory and the office. The annual sales of IR, as it was always called, placed it among the top 50 manufacturers in the world. I'll be 62 next year, Mr. Watanabe said the many cups of sake making him unusually talkative. And I had thought that I might retire. But Nakamura says that would be a mistake. He says that the company still needs me. Before the fruit arrived, Kenji and his father were again discussing the coming Martian expedition. 
Kenji explained that Nye and most of the other Asian colonists who were travelling on either the Pinta or the Nina were already at the Japanese training site in southern Kyushu. He would join his wife there as soon as he left Kyoto, and, after ten more days of training, they and the rest of the passengers on the Pinta would be transported to an LEO, Low Earth Orbit, space station, where they would undergo a week of weightlessness training. The final leg of their near-Earth journey would be a ride aboard a space tug from LEO to the geosynchronous space station at Geo 4, where the Pinta was currently being assembled while undergoing its final checks and being outfitted for the long trip to Mars. The younger waitress brought them two glasses of cognac. Well, that wife of yours is really a magnificent creature, Mr. Watanabe said, taking a small sip of the liquor. I have always thought that the Thai women were the most beautiful in the world. She is also beautiful inside, Kenji hastily added, suddenly missing his new bride. And she is quite intelligent as well. Her English is excellent, Mr. Watanabe remarked. But your mother says her Japanese is awful. Kenji bristled. Nai tried to speak Japanese, which, incidentally, she has never studied, because mother refused to speak English. It was deliberately done to make Nye feel ill at ease. Kenji caught himself. His remarks defending Nye were not appropriate for the occasion. Gomen nasai, he said to his father. Mr. Watanabe took a long drink from his cognac. Well, Kenji, he said, this is the last time we will be alone together for at least five years. I have very much enjoyed our dinner and our conversation. He paused. There is, however, one more item that I want to discuss with you. Kenji shifted his position. He was no longer used to sitting cross-legged on the floor for four hours at a time, and sat up straight, trying to clear his mind. He could tell from his father's tone that the one more item was a serious one. My interest in the criminals in your low colony is not just idle curiosity, Mr. Watanabe began. He paused to gather his thoughts before continuing. Nakamura-san came into my office late last week, at the end of the business day, and told me that his son's second application for Lowell Colony had also been denied. He asked me if I would talk to you about looking into the matter. The comment hit Kenji like a thunderbolt. He had never even been told that his boyhood rival had applied for Lowell Colony. Now, here was his father. I have not been involved in the process of selecting the convict colonists, Kenji replied slowly. That's an entirely different division in the project. Mr. Watanabe did not say anything for several seconds. Our connections, tell us, he eventually continued, after finishing his cognac, are that the only a real opposition to the application is coming from a psychiatrist, a Dr. Ridgemore, from New Zealand, who has the opinion despite Toshio's excellent record during his detention period, that Nakabura's son still does not recognize that he did anything wrong. I believe that you were personally responsible for recruiting Dr. Ridgemore for the Lowell Colony team. Kenji was staggered. This was no idle request his father was making. He had done extensive background research. But why? Kenji wondered. Why is he so interested? Nakamura-san is a brilliant engineer, Mr. Watanabe said. He has personally been responsible for many of the products that have established us as leaders in our field. But his laboratory has not been very innovative lately. In fact, its productivity began to drop around the time of his son's arrest and conviction. Mr. Watanabe leaned toward Kenji, resting his elbows on the table. Nakamura-san has lost his self-confidence. He and his wife must visit Toshio in that detention apartment once a month. It is a constant reminder to Nakamura of how his family has been disgraced. If the son could go to Mars, then perhaps... Kenji understood too well what his father was asking. Emotions that had long been suppressed threatened to erupt. Kenji was angry and confused. He was going to tell his father that his request was improper when the elder Watanabe spoke again. It has been equally hard on Keiko and the little girl. 
Aiko is almost seven now. Every other weekend, they dutifully ride the train to Ashia. Try as he might, Kenji could not prevent the tears from forming in the corners of his eyes. The picture of Keiko, broken and dejected, leading her daughter inside the restricted area for the bi-weekly visit with her father, was more than he could bear. I talked to Keiko myself last week, his father added, at Nakamura-san's request. She was very despondent. But she seemed to perk up when I told her that I was going to ask you to intercede on her husband's behalf. Kenji took a deep breath and gazed at his father's emotionless face. He knew what he was going to do. He knew also that it was indeed improper. Not wrong, just improper. But it made no sense to agonize over a decision that was a foregone conclusion. Kenji finished his cognac. Tell Nakamura-san that I will call Dr. Ridgemore tomorrow, he said. What if his intuition was wrong? Then I would have wasted an hour, ninety minutes at the most, Kenji thought, as he excused himself from the family gathering with his sister Fumiko and her daughter and ran out into the street. He turned immediately toward the hills. It was about an hour before sunset. She'll be there, he said to himself. This will be my only chance to say goodbye. Kenji went first to the small Anrakuji temple. He walked inside the hondo, expecting to find Keiko in her favorite spot, in front of the side wooden altar commemorating two twelfth-century Buddhist nuns, formerly members of the court harem, who had committed suicide when Emperor Gotoba had ordered them to repudiate the teachings of St. Holen. Keiko was not there. Nor was she outside where the two women were buried, just at the edge of the bamboo forest. Kenji began to think that he had been mistaken. Keiko has not come, he thought. She feels that she has lost too much face. His only other hope was that Keiko was waiting for him in the cemetery beside the Honan Inn, where seventeen years earlier he had informed her that he was moving away from Japan. Kenji's heart skipped a beat as he walked up the lane leading to the temple. Off in the distance to his right, he could see a woman's figure. She was wearing a simple black dress and was standing beside the tomb of Junichiro Tanizaki. Although her body was facing away from him and he could not see clearly in the fading twilight, Kenji was certain that the woman was Keiko. He raced up the steps and into the cemetery, finally stopping about five meters away from the woman in black. Keiko, he said, catching his breath. I'm so glad. What an abisan, the figure said formally, turning around with her head low and her eyes on the ground. She bowed very deeply, as if she were a servant. Toma arigato gozaimasu, she repeated twice. Finally she rose, but still she did not look up at Kenji. Keiko, he said softly, it's only Kenji. I'm alone. Please look at me. I cannot, she answered in a voice that was scarcely audible. But I can thank you for what you have done for Aiko and me. Again she bowed. Tomo arigato gozaimasu, she said. Kenji bent down impulsively and put his hand under Keiko's chin. He gently raised her head until he could see her face. Keiko was still beautiful. But Kenji was shocked to see such sadness permanently carved into those delicate features. Keiko, he murmured her tears cutting into his heart like tiny knives. I must go, she said. I wish you happiness. She pulled away from his touch and bowed again. Then she rose, without looking at him, and walked slowly down the path in the twilight shadows. Kenji's eyes followed her until she disappeared in the distance. It was only then that he realized he had been leaning on Tanizaki's tombstone. He stared for several seconds at the two kanji characters, Ku and Jaku, on the grey markers. One of them said, Emptiness. The other, Solitude. Chapter 5 When the message from Rama was relayed to Earth from the tracking satellite system in 2241, it caused immediate consternation. Nicole's video was quickly classified top secret, of course, while the International Intelligence Agency, IIA, the security arm of the Council of Governments, COG, struggled to comprehend what it was all about. 
A dozen of the finest agents were soon assigned to the secure facility in Novozibirsk to analyze the signal that had been received from deep space and to develop a master plan for the COG response. Once it was ascertained that neither the Chinese nor the Brazilians could have decoded the signal, their technological capabilities were not yet on a par with the COG. The requested acknowledgement was transmitted in the direction of Rama, thereby precluding any future replays of Nicole's video. Then the superagents focused on the detailed contents of the message itself. They began by doing some historical research. It was widely accepted, despite some suggested, but discredited, evidence to the contrary, that the Rama II spacecraft had been destroyed by the barrage of nuclear missiles in April of 2200. Nicole Desjardins, the putative human being in the video, had been presumed dead before the Newton science ship had even left Rama. Certainly she, or what was left of her, must have been annihilated in the nuclear devastation. So the speaker could not actually be she. But if the person, or thing, speaking in the television segment, was a robot imitation or simulacrum of Madame Desjardins, it was vastly superior to any artificial intelligence designs on Earth. The preliminary conclusion, therefore, was that the Earth was again dealing with an advanced civilization of unbelievable capability, one that was consistent with the technological levels exhibited by the two Rama spacecraft. There was no question about the implied threat in the message either. About that, the superagents were unanimous. If there was indeed another Rama vehicle on its way to the solar system, although none had yet been detected by the pair of Excalibur stations, the Earth could certainly not ignore the message. Of course, there was some possibility that the entire thing was an elaborate hoax, concocted by the brilliant Chinese physicists. They were definitely the prime suspects. But until that was a confirmed fact, the COG needed to have a definitive plan. Fortunately, a multinational project had already been approved to establish a modest colony on Mars in the mid-2240s. During the two previous decades, a half-dozen exploration missions to Mars had rekindled interest in the great idea of terraforming the Red Planet and making it habitable for the human species. Already there were unmanned scientific laboratories on Mars that were conducting experiments that were either too dangerous or too controversial to be performed on Earth. The easiest way to meet the intent of the Nicole de Jardin video and not alarm the populace of the planet Earth would be to announce and fund a considerably larger colony on Mars. If the entire affair turned out subsequently to be a hoax, then the size of the colony could be scaled back to the original proposed size. One of the agents, an Indian named Ravi Srinivasan, carefully researched the massive ISA data archives from the year 2200 and became convinced that Rama II had not been destroyed by the nuclear phalanx. It is possible, Mr. Srinivasan said, that this video is legitimate and that the speaker is really the esteemed Madame de Jardin. But she would be seventy-seven years old today, another of the agents countered. There is nothing in the video that indicates when it was made, Mr. Srinivasan argued. And if you compare the photographs of Madame de Jardin taken during the mission with the pictures of the woman in the transmission we received, they are decidedly different. Her face is older, maybe by as much as ten years. If the speaker in the video is a hoax or a simulacrum, then it is an amazingly clever one. Mr. Srinivasan agreed, however, that the plan eventually developed by the IIA was the proper one, even if the video was indeed presenting the truth. So it was not that important that he convince everyone that his point of view was correct. What was absolutely necessary, the superagents all agreed, was that a bare minimum of people knew about the existence of the video. The forty years since the beginning of the twenty-third century had seen some marked changes on the planet Earth. Following the Great Chaos, the Council of Governments, COG, had emerged as a monolithic organization controlling, or at least manipulating, the politics of the planet. Only China, which had retreated into isolation after its devastating experience during the chaos, was outside the sphere of influence of the COG. But after 2200, there were signs that the unchallenged power of the COG was beginning to erode. First came the Korean elections of 2209, when the people of that nation, disgusted with successive regimes of corrupt politicians who had grown rich at the expense of the populace, actually voted to federate with the Chinese. Of the major countries of the world, only China had a significantly different kind of government from the regulated capitalism practiced by the wealthy nations of North America, Asia and Europe. 
The Chinese government was a kind of socialist democracy based on the humanist principles espoused by the canonized 22nd century Italian Catholic, St. Michael of Siena. The COG, and indeed the entire world, was dumbfounded by the stunning election results in Korea. By the time the IIA was able to foment a civil war, 2211 to 2212, the new Korean government and their Chinese allies had already captured the hearts and minds of the people. The rebellion was easily quashed, and Korea became a permanent part of the Chinese Federation. The Chinese openly acknowledged that they had no intention of exporting their form of government by military action, but the rest of the world did not accept their word. The COG military and intelligence budgets doubled between 2210 and 2220 as political tension returned to the world scene. Meanwhile, in 2218, the 350 million Brazilians elected a charismatic general, Juan Pereira, to head their nation. General Pereira believed that South America was mistreated and undervalued by the COG. He was not wrong, and he demanded changes in the COG character that would correct the problems. When the COG refused, Pereira galvanized South American regionalism by unilaterally abrogating the COG charter. Brazil seceded, in effect, from the Council of Governments, and over the next decade, most of the rest of the South American nations, encouraged by the massive military strength in Brazil that successfully opposed the COG peacekeeping forces, followed suit. What emerged was a third player in the world geopolitical scene, a kind of Brazilian empire, energetically led by General Pereira. At first, the embargoes by the COG threatened to return Brazil and the rest of South America to the destitution that had ravaged the region in the wake of the Great Chaos. But Pereira fought back. Since the advanced nations of North America, Asia and Europe would not buy his legal exports, he decided that he and his allies would export illegal products. Drugs became the primary trade of the Brazilian empire. It was an immensely successful policy. By 2240, there was a massive flow of all kinds and types of drugs from South America to the rest of the world. It was in this political environment that Nicole's video was received on Earth. Although some cracks had appeared in the COG control of the planet, the organization still represented almost 70% of the population and 90% of the Earth's material wealth. It was natural that the COG and its implementing space agency, the ISA, should take the responsibility for managing the response. Carefully following the security criteria defined by the IIA, a five-fold increase in the number of people going to Mars as part of the Lowell Colony was announced in February 2242. Earth departure was scheduled for the late summer or early autumn of 2245. The other four people in the room, all blonde and blue-eyed and members of the same family from Malmo, Sweden, filed out the door, leaving Kenji and Nai Watanabe alone. She continued to gaze down at the earth 35,000 kilometers below her. Kenji joined her in front of the huge observation window. I never fully realized, Nai said to her husband, just what it meant, just what it meant to be in geosynchronous orbit. The earth doesn't move from here. It looks suspended in space. Kenji laughed. Actually, we're both moving, and very fast. But since our orbital period and the Earth's rotation period are the same, the Earth always presents us with the same picture. It was different at that other space station, Nye said, shuffling away from the window in her slippers. There the Earth was majestic, dynamic, much more impressive. But we were only three hundred kilometers from the surface. Of course it was. Shit! They heard a voice shout from the other side of the observation lounge. A husky young man in a plaid shirt and blue jeans was flailing in the air, slightly more than a metre off the floor, and his frantic motion was causing him to tumble sideways. Kenji crossed over and helped the newcomer to stand upright on his feet. Thanks, the man said. I forgot to keep one foot on the floor at all times. This weightlessness is fucking weird for a farmer. He had a heavy southern accent. Oops, I'm sorry about the language, ma'am. I've lived among cows and pigs too long. He extended his hand to Kenji. I'm Max Puckett from De Queen, Arkansas. Kenji introduced himself and his wife. Max Puckett had an open face and a quick grin. You know, Max said, when I signed up to go to Mars, I never realized we would be weightless for the whole goddamn trip. What's going to happen to the poor hens? 
They'll probably never lay another egg. Max walked over to the window. It's almost noon at my home down there on that funny planet. My brother Clyde probably just opened a bottle of beer, and his wife Winona is making him a sandwich. He paused for several seconds and then turned to the Watanabes. What you two gonna do on Mars? I'm the colony historian, Kenji replied. Or at least one of them. My wife Nye is an English and French teacher. Shit, said Max Puckett. I was hoping you were one of the farming couples from Vietnam or Laos. I want to learn something about rice. Did I hear you say something about hens? Nye asked after a short silence. Are we going to have chickens on the Pinta? Ma'am, Max Puckett replied. There are 15,000 of Puckett's finest packed in cages in a cargo tug parked at the other end of this station. The ISA paid enough for those chickens that Clyde and Winona could rest for a whole damn year if they wanted. If those hens are not going with us, I'd like to know what the hell they're going to do with them. Passengers only occupy 20% of the space on the Pinta and the Santa Maria, Kenji reminded Nye. Supplies and other cargo elements take up the rest of the space. We will only have a total of 300 passengers on the Pinta, most of them ISA officials and other key personnel necessary to initialize the colony. Initialize the colony? Max interrupted. Shit, man, you talk like one of them robots. He grinned at Nye. After two years with one of those talking cultivators, I threw the son of bitch away and replaced him with one of those earlier silent versions. Kenji laughed easily. I guess I do use a lot of ISA jargon. I was one of the first civilians selected for New Law, and I managed the recruiting in the Orient. Max chuckled. Kenji and Nye laughed as well. He was a funny man. Speaking of whores, Max said with a twinkle, where's all those convict women I saw on television? Ooh -wee! Some of them were mighty fine. Damn sight better looking than my chickens and pigs. All the colonists who had been held in detention on Earth are traveling on the Santa Maria, Kenji said. We'll arrive about two months before them. You know an awful lot about this mission, Max said. And you don't speak garbled English like the Japs I've met in Little Rock and Texarkana. Are you somebody special? No, Kenji replied, unable to suppress another laugh. As I told you, I'm just the lead colony historian. Kenji was about to tell Max that he had lived in the United States for six years, which explained why his English was so good, when the door to the lounge opened and a dignified elderly gentleman in a grey suit and dark tie entered. Pardon me, he said to Max, who had again placed the unlighted cigarette in his mouth. Have I mistakenly ended up in the smoking room? Now, Pops, Max answered. This room is the observation lounge. It's much too nice to be the smoking area. Smoking is probably confined to a small room without windows near the bathrooms. My ISA interviewer told me. The elderly gentleman was staring at Max as if the man were a biologist and Max was a rare but unpleasant species. My name, young man, he interrupted, is not Pop. It's Peter. Peter Miskin, to be exact. Glad to know you, Peter, Max said, sticking out his hand. I'm Max. This couple here's the Wabanyabis. They're from Japan. Kenji Watanabe, Kenji said in correction. This is my wife, Nai, who is a citizen of Thailand. Mr. Max, Peter Mishkin said formally. My first name is Pieter, not Peter. It is bad enough that I must speak English for five years. Surely I can ask that my name at least retain its original Russian sound. Okay, Piotr, Max said, again grinning. What do you do, anyway? No, let me guess. You're the colony undertaker. For a fraction of a second, Kenji was afraid that Mr. Mishkin was going to explode in anger. Instead, however, the smallest of smiles began to form upon his face. It is apparent, Mr. Max, he said slowly, that you have a certain comic gift. I can see where that might be a virtue on a long and boring space trip. He paused for a moment. For your information... I am not the undertaker. I was trained in the law. Until two years ago, when I retired of my own volition to seek a new adventure, I was a member of the Soviet Supreme Court. Holy shit! Max Puckett exclaimed. Now I remember. 
I read about you in Time magazine. Hey, Judge Mishkin, I'm sorry. I didn't recognize you. Not at all, Judge Mishkin interrupted, an amused smile spreading across his face. It was fascinating to be unknown for a moment and to be taken for an undertaker. Probably the practiced judge's mien is very close to the proper dour expression of the funeral attendant. By the way, Mr. Puckett, sir. By the way, Mr. Puckett, Judge Mishkin continued, would you like to join me in the bar for a drink? A vodka would taste especially good right about now. So would some tequila, Max replied, walking toward the door with Judge Mishkin. Incidentally, I don't suppose you know what happens when you feed tequila to pigs, do you? I thought not. Well, me and my brother Clyde. They disappeared out the door, leaving Kenji and Nai Watanabe alone again. The couple glanced at each other and laughed. You don't think, Kenji said, that those two are going to be friends, do you? No chance, Nai replied with a smile. What a pair of characters. Mishkin is considered to be one of the finest jurists of our century. His opinions are required reading in all of the Soviet law schools. Puckett was president of the Southwest Arkansas Farmers Cooperative. He has incredible knowledge of farming techniques and farm animals as well. Do you know the background of all the people in New Lore? No, Kenji replied. But I have studied the files of everyone on the Pinta. Nai put her arms around her husband. Tell me about Nai Boatong Watanabe, she said. Thai school teacher? Fluent in English and French, IE equals 2.48, SC of 91. Nai interrupted Kenji with a kiss. You forgot the most important characteristic, she said. What's that? She kissed him again. Adoring new bride of Kenji Watanabe, colony historian. Chapter 6 Most of the world was watching on television, when the Pinta was formally dedicated several hours before it was scheduled to depart for Mars with its passengers and cargo. The second vice president of the COG, a Swiss real estate executive named Heinrich Jenser, was present at GO4 for the dedication ceremonies. He gave a short address to commemorate both the completion of the three large spacecraft and the opening of a new era of Martian colonization. When he was finished, Mr. Jenser introduced Mr. Ian Macmillan, the Scottish commander of the Pinta. Macmillan, a boring speaker who appeared to be the quintessential ISA bureaucrat, read a six-minute speech reminding the world of the fundamental objectives of the project. These three vehicles, he said early in his speech, will carry almost 2,000 people on a hundred million kilometer voyage to another planet, Mars, where this time a permanent human presence will be established. Most of our future Martian colonists will be transported in the second ship, the Nina, which will depart from here at GO4 three weeks from today. Our ship, the Pinta, and the final spacecraft, the Santa Maria, will each carry about 300 passengers, as well as the thousands of kilograms of supplies and equipment that will be necessary to sustain the colony. Carefully avoiding any mention of the demise of the first set of Martian outposts in the previous century, Commander Macmillan next tried to be poetic, comparing the forthcoming expedition to that of Christopher Columbus 750 years earlier. The language of the speech that had been written for him was excellent. But Macmillan's drab, monotonic delivery transformed words that would have been inspirational in the hands of an outstanding speaker into a dull and prosaic historical lecture. He ended his speech by characterizing the colonists as a group, citing statistics about their ages, occupations, and countries of origin. These men and women, then, Macmillan summarized, are a representative cross-section of the human species in almost every way. I say almost because there are at least two attributes common to this group that would not be found in a random collection of human beings of this size. First, the future residents of Lowell Colony are extremely intelligent. Their average IE is slightly above 1.86. Second, and this goes without saying, they must be courageous or they would not have applied for and then accepted a long and difficult assignment in a new and unknown environment. When he was finished, Commander Macmillan was handed a tiny bottle of champagne, which he broke across the one to one hundred scale model of the Pinta that was displayed behind him and the other dignitaries on the dais. 
Moments later, as the colonists filed out of the auditorium and prepared to board the Pinter, Macmillan and Yenza began the scheduled press conference. He's a jerk. He's a marginally competent bureaucrat. He's a fucking jerk. Max Parkett and Judge Mishkin were discussing Commander Macmillan in between bites of lunch. He has no goddamn sense of humour. He is simply unable to appreciate things that are out of the ordinary. Max was chafing. He had been censured by the Pinter command staff during an informal hearing earlier that morning. His friend Judge Mishkin had represented Max in the hearing and had prevented the proceedings from getting out of control. Those assholes are no right to pass judgment on my behaviour. You are most certainly correct, my friend, Judge Mishkin replied, in the general sense. But we have a set of unique conditions on this spacecraft. They are the authority here, at least until we arrive at Lowell Colony and establish our own government. At any rate, there's no real harm done. You are not inconvenienced in any way by their declaration that your actions were untenable. It could have been much worse. Two nights earlier, there had been a party celebrating the crossing of the halfway point in the Pinter's voyage from Earth to Mars. Max had flirted energetically for over an hour with lovely Angela Rendino, one of Macmillan's staff assistants. The bland Scotsman had then taken Max aside and strongly suggested that Max should leave Angela alone. Let her tell me that, Max had said sensibly. She's an inexperienced young woman, Macmillan had replied. And she's too gracious to tell you how repulsive your animal humour is. Max had been having a great time until then. What's your angle here, Commander? he had asked, after first quaffing another margarita. Is she your private punch or something? Ian Macmillan had flushed crimson. Mr. Puckett, the spacecraft officer had replied a few seconds later. If your behaviour does not improve, I will be forced to confine you to your living quarters. The confrontation with Macmillan had ruined Max's evening. He had been incensed by the commander's use of his official authority in what was clearly a personal situation. Max had returned to his room, which he shared with another American, a pensive forester from the state of Oregon named Dave Dennison, and quickly finished an entire bottle of tequila. In his drunken state, Max had been both homesick and depressed. He had then decided to go to the communications center to phone his brother Clyde back in Arkansas. By this time, it was very late. To reach the communications complex, it was necessary for Max to cross the entire ship, passing first the common lounge where the party had just ended, and then the officers' quarters. In the central wing, Max caught a fleeting glimpse of Ian McMillan and Angela Rendino, arm in arm, going into the commander's private apartment. That's the son of a bitch, Max said to himself. The drunken Max paced outside McMillan's door in the hall, growing angrier and angrier. After five minutes, he finally had an idea that he liked. Remembering his award-winning pig call from his days at the University of Arkansas, Max split the evening quiet with a horrendous noise. Zoo-ee! Pig, pig! Max hollered. He repeated the call another time and then disappeared in a flash, just before every door in the officer's wing, including Macmillan's, opened to see what the disturbance had been. Commander Macmillan was not at all happy that his entire crew saw him, along with Miss Rendino, in a state of undress. The cruise to Mars was a second honeymoon for Kenji and Nye. Neither of them had much work to do. The journey was relatively uneventful, at least from the point of view of a historian, and Nye's duties were minimal, since most of her high school students were on board the other two spaceships. The Watanabes spent many evenings socialising with Judge Mishkin and Max Puckett. They played cards often. Max was as good at poker as he was terrible at bridge. Talked about their hopes for Lowell Colony and discussed the lives they had left behind on Earth. When the Pinter was three weeks away from Mars, the staff announced a coming two-day communications outage and urged everyone to call home before the radio systems were temporarily out of commission. Since it was the year-end holiday period, it was the perfect time to phone. Max hated the time delay and the long one-way conversations. After listening to a disjointed discussion of Christmas plans in Arkansas, Max informed Clyde and Winona that he wasn't going to call any more because he disliked waiting fifteen minutes to find out if anyone has laughed at my jokes. It had snowed early in Kyoto. 
Genji's mother and father had prepared a video showing Ginkakuji and the Honen Inn under a soft blanket of snow. If Nai had not been with him, Kenji would have been unbearably homesick. In a brief call to Thailand, Nai congratulated one of her sisters on having won a scholarship to the university. Pieter Miskin didn't telephone anyone. The old Russian's wife was dead, and he had no children. I have wonderful memories, he told Max, but there's nothing personal left for me on earth. On the first day of the planned communications blackout, it was announced that an important program, required viewing for everybody, would be shown at two o'clock in the afternoon. Kenji and Nye invited Max and Judge Mishkin to their small apartment to watch. I wonder what stupid lecture this is going to be, said Max, opposed, as always, to official pronouncements, which he considered a waste of his time. When the video began, the president of the COG and the director of the ISA were shown sitting together at a large desk. The COG president underscored the importance of the message that they were about to receive from Werner Koch, the director of the ISA. Passengers on the Pinta, Dr. Koch began. Four years ago, our satellite tracking systems decoded a coherent signal that had apparently originated in deep space in the general direction of the star Epsilon Eridani. When properly processed, the signal contained an amazing video, one that you will see in its entirety in about five minutes. As you will hear, the video announces the return to our system of a Rama spacecraft. In 2130 and 2200, giant cylinders 50 kilometers long and 20 kilometers wide, created by an unknown alien intelligence for a purpose we still have not fathomed, visited our family of planets in orbit around the sun. The second intruder, usually referred to as Rama II, made a velocity correction while inside the orbit of Venus that put it on an impact course with the Earth. A fleet of nuclear missiles was dispatched to encounter the alien cylinder and destroy it before Rama came close enough to our planet to do any harm. The following video claims that another of these Rama spacecraft has now come to our neighborhood with the sole purpose of acquiring a representative sample of 2,000 human beings for observation. As bizarre as this claim may be, it is important to note that our radar has indeed confirmed that a Rama-class vehicle did enter orbit around Mars less than a month ago. Unfortunately, we must take this fantastic message from deep space seriously. Therefore, you colonists on the Pinta have been assigned to rendezvous with a new object in Mars orbit. We realize that this news will come as a severe shock to most of you, but we did not have many viable options. If, as we suspect, some misguided genius has planned and orchestrated an elaborate hoax then. After the brief detour, you will continue on with your colonization of Mars as originally conceived. If, however, the video you are about to see is actually telling the truth, then you and your associates on board the Nina and the Santa Maria will become the contingent of human beings that the Raman intelligence will observe. You can well imagine that your mission now has uppermost priority among all COG activities. You can also understand the need for secrecy. From this moment forward, until this Rama issue is resolved one way or the other, all communication between your vehicle and the Earth will be strictly controlled. The IIA will monitor all the voice loops. Your friends and families will be told that you are safe and eventually that you have landed on Mars, but that the Pinter communication systems have completely failed. You are being shown the following video now to give you three weeks to prepare for the encounter. A baseline plan and accompanying procedures for the rendezvous, worked out in great detail by the IIA in conjunction with ISA operations personnel, have already been transmitted to Commander Macmillan on the high-rate data stream. Each one of you will have a specific set of assignments. Each of you also has a personalized document packet that will provide you with the necessary background information for you to perform your duties. Of course, we wish you well. Most likely this Rama affair will turn out to be nothing in which case it will simply have delayed your initialization of Lao Colony. If, however, this video is on the level, then you must move quickly to develop careful plans for accommodating the arrival of the Nina and the Santa Maria. None of the colonists on those other two spacecraft will have been told anything at all about Rama or the change in assignment. There was a momentary silence in the Watanabe apartment as the video abruptly concluded and was replaced on the screen by a text message, Next video in two minutes. Well, I'll be goddamned, was Max Puckett's only comment. Chapter 7 
In the video, Nicole was sitting on an ordinary brown chair with a featureless wall behind her. She was dressed in one of the ISA flight suits that had been her regular apparel during the Newton mission. Nicole read the message from an electric notebook that she held in her hands. My fellow earthlings, she began, I am Newton cosmonaut Nicole Desjardins, speaking to you from billions of kilometers away. I am on board a Rama spacecraft, similar to the two great cylindrical spaceships that visited our solar system during the last two centuries. This third Rama vehicle is also heading toward our tiny region of the galaxy. Approximately four years after your first receipt of this video, Rama 3 will go into orbit around the planet Mars. Since I left the Earth, I have learned that the Rama-class vehicles were constructed by an advanced extraterrestrial intelligence as elements in a vast information-gathering system whose ultimate objective is acquiring and cataloguing data about life in the universe. It is as part of this goal that this third Rama craft is returning to the vicinity of our home planet. Inside Rama 3, an Earth-like habitat has been designed to accommodate 2,000 human beings, plus significant numbers of other animals and plants from our home planet. The exact biomass and other general specifications for these animals and plants are contained in the first appendix to this video. However, it should be stressed that the plants, especially those that are extremely efficient in the conversion of carbon dioxide to oxygen, are a key feature in the basic design of the Earth habitat on board Rama. Without the plants, life for the humans inside Rama will be seriously compromised. What is expected, as a result of this transmission, is that the Earth will send a representative group of its inhabitants, together with the ancillary supplies detailed in the second appendix, to make a rendezvous with Rama 3 in Mars orbit. The voyagers will be taken inside Rama and carefully observed while they are living in a habitat that reproduces the environmental conditions on the Earth. Because of the hostile response to Rama 2, which incidentally resulted in only minor damage to the alien spacecraft, the nominal mission plan for this Rama vehicle involves no approach to Earth closer than Mars orbit. This nominal plan assumes, of course, that the authorities on Earth will indeed comply with the requests contained in this transmission. If no human beings are sent to rendezvous with Rama 3 in Mars orbit, I have no knowledge of how the spacecraft has been programmed to respond. I can say, however, based on my own observations, that it is easily within the capabilities of the extraterrestrial intelligence to acquire its desired observational data by other, less benign methods. With respect to the human beings to be transported to Mars, it goes without saying that the selected individuals should represent a broad cross-section of humanity, including both sexes, all ages, and as many cultures as can be reasonably included. The large library of information about the Earth that is requested in the third video appendix will provide significant additional data that can be correlated with the observations taken inside Rama. I myself have no knowledge of how long the human beings will be inside Rama, or exactly where the spacecraft will take them, or even why the superior intelligence that created the Rama vehicles is gathering information about life in the universe. I can say, however, that the wonders I have witnessed since leaving our solar system have given me an entirely new sense of our place in the universe. The total time of the video, more than half of which was allocated to the detailed appendices, was just over ten minutes. Throughout the transmission, the basic scene did not change. Nicole's delivery was measured and deliberate, punctuated by short pauses when her eyes moved from the camera to the notebook in her hand. Although there was some modulation in her tone, Nicole's earnest facial expression was virtually constant. Only when she implied that the Ramans might have other, less benign methods of obtaining their data did any strong emotion flash in her dark eyes. Kenji Watanabe watched the first half of the video with intense concentration. During the appendices, however, his mind began to stray and to start asking questions. Who are these extraterrestrials? he wondered. Where did they come from? Why do they want to observe us? And why have they picked Nicole Desjardins as their spokesperson? Kenji laughed to himself, realizing that there was an endless stream of such infinite questions. He decided to focus on more tractable issues. If Nicole were still alive today, Kenji thought next, 
then she would be eighty-one years old. The woman on the television screen had some grey hair, and many more wrinkles than Cosmonaut Desjardins had had when the Newton was launched from the Earth, but her age in the video was certainly nowhere near eighty. Maybe fifty-two or fifty-three at the very most, Kenji said to himself. So did she make this video thirty years ago, he wondered, or has her ageing process been somehow retarded? It did not occur to him to question whether or not the speaker was really Nicole. Kenji had spent enough time in the Newton archives to recognize immediately Nicole's facial expressions and mannerisms. She should have made the video about four years ago, Kenji was thinking. But if so, he was still struggling with the entire situation when Nicole's transmission terminated and the director of the ISA appeared again on the monitor. Dr. Koch explained quickly that the video would be replayed twice in its entirety on all channels and then would be available to each of the passengers and crew at his leisure. What the hell is really going on here? Max Puckett demanded to know as soon as Nicole's face appeared on the monitor again. He directed his question at Kenji. If I've understood correctly, Kenji answered after watching for several seconds, we have been purposely misled by the ISA about one of the primary purposes of our endeavor. Apparently, this message was first received about four years ago, back when the funding for the Lowell Colony was still somewhat uncertain, and it was decided then, after all efforts to prove the video to be a hoax were unsuccessful, that the investigation of Rama III would be a secret objective of our project. Shit, said Max Puckett, shaking his head vigorously. Why the hell didn't they just tell us the truth? My mind balks at the idea of super-creatures sending such awesome technology just to gather data about us, Judge Mishkin commented after a short silence. On another level, however, at least now I understand some of the peculiarities in the personnel selection process. I was flabbergasted when that group of homeless American teenagers was added to the colony about eight months ago. Now I see that the selection criteria were based on satisfying the broad cross-section requested by Madame Desjardins. Whether or not a particular mix of individuals and skills would produce a sociologically viable colony on Mars must have always been a secondary consideration. I hate lies and liars, Max now said. He had stood up from his chair and was pacing around the room. All these politicians and government managers are the same. The bastards will lie without any conscience. But what could they have done, Max? Judge Mishkin replied. Almost certainly they didn't really take the video seriously. At least not until this new craft showed up in Mars' orbit. And if they had told the truth from the beginning, there would have been a worldwide panic. Look, Judge, Max said in a frustrated tone. I thought I was hired to be a fucking farmer on a colony on Mars. I don't know anything about E.T.'s, and quite frankly, I don't want to know anything. It's hard enough for me to deal with chickens, pigs, and people. Especially people, Judge Mishkin said quickly, smiling at his friend. Despite himself, Max chuckled. A few minutes later, Judge Mishkin and Max said goodbye and left Kenji and Nye alone. Soon after their guests were gone, the video phone rang in Kenji and Nye's apartment. What the nubby? they heard Ian McMillan say. Yes, sir, Kenji replied. Sorry to disturb you, Watanabe, the commander said, but you have the first assignment given to anyone other than my immediate staff. Your orders are to brief the entire Pinta crew on the Newton expedition, the Ramas and Cosmonaut Desjardins at 1900 tonight. I thought you might want to begin your preparations. All the media reported in 2200 that Rama II was completely destroyed, vaporized by the multiple nuclear bombs that exploded in its vicinity. The missing cosmonauts, Desjardins, O'Toole, Takagishi, and Wakefield, were of course all considered to be dead. Actually, according to both the official documents of the Newton mission and the very successful books and television series distributed by Hagenest and Schmidt, Nicole Desjardins presumably died somewhere in New York, the island city in the middle of the cylindrical sea, weeks before the science ship of the Newton ever left Rama and returned to the Earth. Kenji paused to look at his audience. Even though Commander Macmillan had explained to the Pinta passengers and crew that a videotape of Kenji's presentation would be immediately available, many of the listeners were taking notes. Kenji was enjoying his moment in the limelight. He glanced at Nye and smiled before continuing. Cosmonaut Francesca Sabatini, 
the most famous survivor of the ill-fated Newton expedition, postulated in her memoirs that Dr. Desjardins might have encountered a hostile biot, or had perhaps fallen somewhere in one of the blackout regions of New York. Since the two women had been together for most of the day, they were searching for the Japanese scientist Shigeru Takagishi, who had mysteriously disappeared from the Beta campsite the night before. Signora Sabatini was well aware of the amount of food and water that cosmonaut Desjardins was carrying. Even with her consummate knowledge of the human body, Sabatini wrote, Nicole could not possibly have survived more than a week. And if, in a delirious state, she had tried to obtain water from the ice of the poisonous cylindrical sea, she would have died even sooner. Of the half-dozen Newton cosmonauts who did not return from the encounter with Rama II, it is Nicole Desjardins who has always attracted the most interest. Even before the brilliant statistician Roberto Lopez correctly conjectured seven years ago, on the basis of European genome information stored in The Hague, that the late King Henry XI of England was the father of Nicole's daughter Genevieve, Dr. Desjardins' reputation had become legendary. Recently, the attendance at her memorial near her family villa in Beauvoir, France, has increased markedly, especially among young females. People flock there, not only to pay cosmonaut Desjardins homage and to view the many photographs and videos commemorating her outstanding life, but also to see the two superb bronze statues created by the Greek sculptor Theopapas. In one, the youthful Nicole is depicted in her track singlet and shorts with the Olympic gold medal around her neck. In the second, she is shown as a mature woman, wearing an ISA flight suit similar to the one you saw in the video. Kenji pointed to the back of the room in the small Pinta auditorium, and the lights were extinguished. Moments later, a slideshow began on one of the two screens behind him. These are the few photographs of Nicole Desjardins that were stored in our Pinta files. The reference database indicates that many more pictures, including historical film clips, are available in the reserve library stored out in the cargo bay. But those data are not accessible during cruise due to the limitations of the flight data network. The extra data are not needed, however, for it is clear from these photos that the individual who appeared in the transmission this afternoon is either Nicole Desjardins or an absolutely perfect copy of her. A close-up still from the afternoon video was frozen on the left screen and juxtaposed to a head photo taken of Nicole the night of the New Year's Eve party at the Villa Adriani outside Rome. There was no question about it. The two pictures were definitely of the same woman. An appreciative murmur rose from the audience as Kenji paused in his presentation. Nicole Desjardins was born, Kenji continued, in a slightly subdued tone. On January the 6th, 2164. Therefore, if the video we watched this afternoon was actually filmed about four years ago, she should have been 77 years old at the time. Now, we all know that Dr. Desjardins was in superb physical condition and that she exercised regularly, but if the woman we saw this afternoon was 77, then the ETs who built Rama must also have discovered the fountain of youth. Even though it was late at night and Kenji was very tired, he still could not sleep. The events of the day kept forcing themselves into his mind and exciting him again. Next to him in the small double bed, Nai Boatong Watanabe was very much aware that her husband was awake. You're absolutely certain that we were seeing the real Nicole Desjardins, aren't you, dear? Nai said softly, after Kenji had turned over for the umpteenth time. Yes, said Kenji, but Macmillan isn't. He demanded that I make that statement about the possibility of a perfect copy. He thinks everything in the video is a fake. After our discussion this afternoon, Nai said following a short pause, I was able to recall all the brouhaha about Nicole and King Henry from seven years ago. It was in most of the personality magazines. But I've forgotten something. How was it established for certain that Henry was Genevieve's father? Wasn't the king already dead? And doesn't the royal family in England keep its genome information private and secret? Lopez used the genomes belonging to the parents and siblings of people who had married into the royal family. Then, employing a data correlation technique that he himself had invented, Dr. Lopez showed that Henry, who was still the Prince of Wales during the 2184 Olympics, was more than three times as likely as any other person present in Los Angeles at the time to have been the father of Nicole's baby. After Darren Higgins admitted on his deathbed that Henry and Nicole had spent one night together during the Olympics, 
The royal family allowed a genetic specialist access to their genome database. The expert concluded, beyond any reasonable doubt, that Henry was Genevieve's father. What an amazing woman, I said. She was indeed, Kenji replied. But what prompted you to make that comment right now? As a woman, I said, I admire her protecting her secret and raising her princess herself as much or more than any of her other accomplishments. Chapter 8 Eponine located Kimberly in the corner of the smoky room and sat down beside her. She accepted the cigarette her friend offered, lit it, and inhaled deeply. What pleasure, Eponine said softly, as she expelled the smoke in small circles and watched it rise slowly toward the ventilators. As much as you love tobacco and nicotine, Kimberly said in a whisper from beside her, I know that you would absolutely adore Kokomo. The American girl took a drag from her cigarette. I know that you don't believe me, Eponine, but it's actually better than sex. Not for me, mon ami, Eponine replied in a warm, friendly tone. I have enough vices, and I could never, never control something that was truly better than sex. Kimberly Henderson laughed heartily, her long blonde locks bouncing on her shoulders. She was twenty-four, a year younger than her French colleague. The two of them were sitting in the smoking lounge attached to the women's shower. It was a tiny square room, no more than four metres on a side, in which a dozen women were currently standing or sitting, all smoking cigarettes. This room reminds me of the back room at Willie's in Evergreen, just outside Denver, Kimberly said, while a hundred or more cowboys and rednecks would be dancing and drinking in the main bar. Eight or ten of us would retreat into Willie's sacred office, as he called it, and fuck ourselves completely up with Kokomo. Eponine stared through the haze at Kimberly. At least in this lounge we aren't harassed by the men. They're absolutely impossible, even worse than the guys in the detention village at Bourges. These characters must think about nothing but sex all day long. That's understandable, Kimberly replied with another laugh. They're not being closely watched for the first time in years. When Toshio's men sabotaged all the hidden monitors, everybody was suddenly free. She glanced over at Eponine, but there's a grim side as well. There were two more rapes today, one right in the co-ed recreation area. Kimberly finished one cigarette and immediately lit another. You need someone to protect you, she continued, and I know Walter would love the job. Because of Toshio, the cons have mostly stopped trying to hit on me. My main concern now is the ISA guards. They think they're hot shit. Only that gorgeous Italian hunk, Marcello or something or other, interests me at all. He told me yesterday that he would make me moan with pleasure if I would just join him in his room. I was sorely tempted until I saw one of Toshio's thugs watching the conversation. Eponine also lit another cigarette. She knew it was ridiculous to smoke them one after another, but the passengers on the Santa Maria were only allowed three half-hour breaks each day, and smoking was not permitted in the cramped living quarters. While Kimberly was momentarily sidetracked by a question from a burly woman in her early forties, Eponine thought about the first few days after they had left the earth. Our third day out, she recalled, Nakamura sent his go-between to see me. I must have been his first choice. The huge Japanese man, a sumo wrestler before he became a bill collector for a notorious gambling ring, had bowed formally when he had approached her in the co-ed lounge. This Eponine, he had said in heavily accented English. My friend Nakamura-san has asked me to tell you that he finds you very beautiful. He offers you complete protection in exchange for your companionship and an occasional favor of pleasure. The offer was attractive in some ways, Eponine remembered, and not unlike what most of the decent-looking women on the Santa Maria have eventually accepted. I knew at the time that Nakamura would be very powerful, but I didn't like his coldness, and I mistakenly thought that I could remain free. Ready? Kimberly repeated. Eponine snapped out of her reverie. She stubbed out her cigarette and walked with her friend into the dressing room. While they were taking off their clothes and preparing to shower, at least a dozen eyes feasted on their magnificent bodies. "'Doesn't it bother you?' Eponine asked when they were standing side by side in the shower. "'To have these dykes devouring you with their eyes?' 
Nope, Kimberly replied. In a way, I enjoy it. It's certainly flattering. There are not many women here who look like we do. It arouses me to have them stare so hungrily at me. Eponine rinsed the soapy lather off her full, firm breasts and leaned over to Kimberly. Then you have had sex with another woman? she asked. Of course, Kimberly replied with another deep laugh. Haven't you? Without waiting for a response, the American woman launched into one of her stories. My first dealer in Denver was a dyke. I was only eighteen and absolutely perfect from head to toe. When Loretta first saw me naked, she thought she'd died and gone to heaven. I had just entered nursing school and couldn't afford much dope, so I made a deal with Loretta. She could fuck me, but only if she kept me supplied with cocaine. Our affair lasted almost six months. By then I was dealing on my own, and besides, I had fallen in love with the magician. Poor Loretta, Kimberly continued, as she and Eponine dried each other's backs in the lavatory that adjoined the shower. She was broken-hearted. She offered me everything, including her client list. Eventually she became a nuisance, so I undercut her and had the magician force her out of Denver. Kimberly saw a fleeting look of disapproval on Eponine's face. Jesus, she said, there you go again, turning moral on me. You're the softest goddamn murderer I have ever met. Sometimes you remind me of all the goody two-shoes in my high school graduating class. As they were about to leave the shower area, a tiny black girl with her hair in braids came up behind them. You Kimberly Henderson? she said. Yes, Kimberly nodded, turning around. But why? Is your man the King Jap Nakamura? the girl interrupted. Kimberly did not reply. If so, I need your help, the black girl continued. What do you want? Kimberly asked in a non-committal tone. The girl suddenly broke into tears. My man Reuben didn't mean nothing. He was drunk on that shit the guards sell. He didn't know he was talking to the King Jap. Kimberly waited for the girl to dry her tears. What have you got? she whispered. Three knives and two joints of dynamite Kokomo, the black girl replied in the same soft whisper. Bring him to me, Kimberly said with a smile, and I'll arrange time for your Reuben to apologize to Mr. Nakamura. You don't like Kimberly, do you? Eponine said to Walter Brackeen. He was a huge American negro with soft eyes and absolutely magical fingers on a keyboard. He was playing a light jazz medley and staring at his beautiful lady while his three roommates were out, by agreement, in the common areas. No, I don't, Walter replied slowly. She's not like us. She can be very funny, but underneath I think she's truly bad. What do you mean? Walter changed to a soft ballad with an easier melody and played for almost a full minute before speaking. I guess in the eyes of the law we're all equal, all murderers, but not in my eyes. I squashed the life out of a man who sodomized my baby brother. You killed a crazy bastard who was ruining your life. Walter paused for a moment and rolled his eyes. But that friend of yours, Kimberly, she and her boyfriend are free people they didn't even know just for drugs and money. She was stoned at the time. No matter, Walter said. Each of us is always responsible for his behavior. If I put shit in me that makes me awful, that's my mistake. But I can't cop out of the responsibility for my actions. She had a perfect record in the detention center. Every one of the doctors who worked with her said she was an excellent nurse. Walter stopped playing his keyboard and stared at Eponine for several seconds. Let's not talk about Kimberly any more, he said. We have little enough time together. Have you thought about my proposition? Eponine sighed. Yes, I have, Walter. And although I like you and enjoy making love with you, the arrangement you suggested sounds too much like a commitment. Besides, I think this is mostly for your ego. Unless I miss my guess... You prefer Malcolm? Malcolm has nothing to do with us, Walter interrupted. He's been my close friend for years, since the very first days I entered the Georgia detention compound. We play music together. We share sex when we're both lonely. We're soulmates. Uh, I know, I know. Malcolm's not really the central issue. It's more the principle of the thing that bothers me. 
I do like you, Walter, you know that. But... Her voice trailed off as Eponine struggled with her mixed feelings. We're three weeks away from Earth, Walter said, and we have six more weeks before we reach Mars. I am the largest man on the Santa Maria. If I say that you're my girl, nobody will bother you for those six weeks. Eponine recalled an unpleasant scene just that morning, where two German inmates had discussed how easily it would be to commit rape in the convict quarters. They had known that she was within earshot, but had made no effort to lower their voices. At length, she put herself in Walter's huge arms. All right, she said softly, but don't expect too much. I'm sort of a difficult woman. I think Walter may have a heart problem, Eponine said in a whisper. It was the middle of the night, and their other two roommates were asleep. Kimberly, in the bunk below Eponine, was still stoned on the Kokomo she had smoked two hours earlier. Sleep would be impossible for her for several more hours. The rules on this ship are fucking stupid, Kimberly said. Christ, even in the Pueblo detention complex there were fewer regulations. Why the hell can't we stay in the common areas after midnight? What harm are we doing? He has occasional chest pains, and if we have vigorous sex, he often complains afterwards of shortness of breath. Do you think you could take a look at him? And how about that Marcello, huh? What a stupid ass. He tells me I can stay up all night if I want to come to his room. While I'm sitting there with Toshio, what does he think he's doing? I mean, not even the guards can mess with the King Jap. What did you say, Eponine? Eponine raised herself on an elbow and leaned over the side of the bed. Walter Barkin, Kim, she said. I'm talking about Walter Barkin. Can you slow yourself down enough to pay attention to what I'm saying? All right, all right. What about your Walter? What does he want? Everybody wants something from the King Jap. I guess that makes me the queen, at least in a way. I think Walter has a bad heart, the exasperated Eponine repeated in a loud voice. I would like for you to look at him. Shh, Kimberly replied. They'll come bust us, like they did that crazy Swedish girl. Shit, Ep, I'm no doctor. I can tell when a heartbeat is irregular, but that's all. You ought to take Walter to that con doctor who's really a cardiologist. What's his name? The super quiet one who stays to himself when he's not examining somebody. Dr. Robert Turner, Eponine interrupted. That's the one. Very professional, aloof, distant, never speaks except in Dr. E's. Hard to believe he blew the heads off two men in a courtroom with a shotgun. Just doesn't figure. How do you know that? Eponine said. Marcello told me. I was curious. We were laughing. He was teasing me, saying things like, Does that Jap make you moan? And how about that quiet heart doctor? Can he make you moan? Christ, Kim, Eponine said, now alarmed. Have you been going to bed with Marcello too? Her roommate laughed. Only twice. He talks better than he fucks. And what an ego. At least the King Jap is appreciative. Does Nakamura know? Do you think I'm crazy? Kimberly replied. I don't want to die. But he may be suspicious. I won't do it again. But if that Dr. Turner were to so much as whisper in my ear, I would cream all over myself. Kimberly continued her rambling chatter. Eponine thought briefly about Dr. Robert Turner. He had examined Eponine soon after launch, when she had been having some peculiar spotting. He never even noticed my body, she remembered. It was a thoroughly professional examination. Eponine tuned Kimberly out of her mind and focused on an image of the handsome doctor. She was surprised to discover that she was feeling a spark of romantic interest. There was something definitely mysterious about the doctor, for there was nothing in his manner or personality that was the least bit consistent with a double murder. There must be an interesting story, she thought. Eponine was dreaming. It was the same nightmare that she had had a hundred times since the murder. Professor Moreau was lying with his eyes closed on the floor of his studio, blood streaming out of his chest. Eponine walked over to the basin, cleaned the large carving knife, and placed it back on the counter. As she stepped over the body, those hated eyes opened. She saw the wild insanity in his eyes. He reached out for her with his arms. Nurse Henderson! Nurse Henderson! The knocking on the door was louder. Eponine awakened from her dream and rubbed her eyes. Kimberly and another of their roommates reached the door almost simultaneously. 
Walter's friend, Malcolm Peabody, a diminutive, effete white man in his early forties, was standing at the door. He was frantic. Dr. Turner sent me for a nurse. Come quickly. Walter's had a heart attack. As Kimberly began to dress, Eponine glided down from her bunk. How is he, Malcolm? she asked, pulling on her robe. Is he dead? Malcolm was momentarily confused. Oh, hi, Eponine, he said meekly. I had forgotten that you and Nurse Henderson... When I left, he was still breathing, but... Being careful to keep one foot on the floor at all times, Eponine hurried out the door, down the corridor, into the central common area, and then into the men's living quarters. Alarms sounded as the main monitors followed her progress. When she reached the entrance to Walter's wing, Eponine paused for a moment to catch her breath. A crowd of people were standing in the corridor outside of Walter's room. His door was open wide, and the bottom third of his body was lying outside, in the hallway. Eponine pushed her way through the crowd and into the room. Dr. Robert Turner was kneeling beside his patient, holding electronic prods against Walter's naked chest. The big man's body recoiled with each jolt, and then rose slightly off the floor before the doctor pushed it down again against the surface. Dr. Turner glanced up when Eponine arrived. "'Are you the nurse?' he asked brusquely. For a fleeting moment, Eponine was speechless and embarrassed. Here, her friend was dying or dead, and all she could think about was Dr. Turner's practically perfect blue eyes. No, she said at length, definitely flustered. I'm the girlfriend. Nurse Henderson is my roommate. She should be here any minute. Kimberly and two ISA guard escorts arrived at that moment. His heart stopped completely forty-five seconds ago, Dr. Turner said to Kimberly. It's too late to move him to the infirmary. I'm going to open him up and try to use the Komori stimulator. Did you bring your gloves? While Kimberly pulled on her gloves, Dr. Turner ordered the crowd away from his patient. Eponine didn't move. When the guards grabbed her by the arms, the doctor mumbled something and the guards released her. Dr. Turner handed Kimberly his set of surgical tools and then, working with both incredible speed and skill, cut a deep incision into Walter's chest. He laid back the folds of the skin, exposing the heart and rib cage. Have you been through this procedure before, Nurse Henderson? he asked. No, Kimberly replied. The Komori stimulator is an electrochemical device that attaches to the heart, forcing it to beat and continue to pump blood. If the pathology is temporary, like a blood clot or a spastic valve, then sometimes the problem can be fixed and the patient's heart will start functioning again. Dr. Turner inserted the stamp size Komori stimulator behind the left ventricle of the heart and applied the power from the portable control system on the floor beside him. Walter's heart began to beat slowly three or four seconds later. We have about eight minutes now to find the problem, the doctor said to himself. He finished his analysis of the organ's primary subsystems in less than a minute. No clots, he mumbled, and no bad vessels or valves. So why did it stop beating? Dr. Turner gingerly lifted up the throbbing heart and inspected the muscles underneath. The muscular tissue around the right auricle was discoloured and soft. He touched it very lightly with the end of one of his pointed instruments, and portions of the tissue flaked off. My God, the doctor said. What in the world is this? While Dr. Turner was holding the heart up, Walter Bracken's heart contracted again, and one of the long fibre structures in the middle of the discoloured muscular tissue started to unravel. What the? Turner blinked twice and put his right hand on his cheek. Look at this, Nurse Henderson, he said quietly. It's absolutely amazing. The muscles here have atrophied completely. I've never seen anything like it. We cannot help this man. Eponine's eyes filled with tears as Dr. Turner withdrew the Komori stimulator and Walter's heart stopped beating again. Kimberly started to remove the clamps holding back the skin and tissue around the heart, but the doctor stopped her. Not yet, he said. Let's take him over to the infirmary so I can perform a full autopsy. I want to learn whatever I can. The guards and two of Walter's roommates eased the large man onto a gurney, and the body was removed from the living quarters. Malcolm Peabody sobbed quietly on Walter's bunk. Eponine walked over to him. They shared a silent hug and then sat together, holding hands, for most of the rest of the night. Chapter 9 You'll be in charge here while I'm inside, Commander McMillan said to his deputy, 
a handsome young Russian engineer named Dmitry Ulanov. Under all circumstances, your primary responsibility is the safety of the passengers and crew. If you hear or see anything threatening or even suspicious, blow the pyros and move the Pinter away from Rama. It was the morning of the first reconnaissance mission from the Pinter into the interior of Rama. The spacecraft from Earth had docked the previous day on one of the circular ends of the huge cylindrical spacecraft. The Pinter had been parked right beside the external seal, in the same general location as the earlier Raman expeditions in 2130 and 2200. As part of the preparations for the initial sortie, Kenji Watanabe had briefed the scouting party the night before on the geography of the first two Ramas. When he had finished with his comments, he had been approached by his friend Max Puckett. Do you think our Rama will look like all those pictures you showed us? Max had asked. Not exactly, Kenji had replied. I expect some changes. Remember that the video said that an Earth habitat had been constructed somewhere inside Rama. Nevertheless, since the exterior of this spacecraft is identical to the other two, I don't think everything inside will be changed. Max had looked perplexed. This is all way beyond me, he had said, shaking his head. By the way, he had added a few seconds later, you're sure you're not responsible for me being in the scouting party? As I told you this afternoon, Kenji replied, none of us on board the Pinta had anything to do with the scouting selections. All sixteen members were chosen by the ISA and IIA back on Earth. But why have I been equipped with this goddamn arsenal? I have a state-of-the-art laser machine gun, self-guided grenades, even a set of mass-sensitive mines. I have more firepower now than I had during the peacekeeping invasion of Belize. Kenji had smiled. Commander Macmillan, as well as many members of the military staff at COG headquarters, still believes this whole affair is a trap of some kind. Your designator in this scouting operation is Soldier. My personal belief is that none of your weapons will be necessary. Max was still grumbling the next morning when Macmillan left Dmitri Ulanov in charge of the Pinta and personally led the scouting party into Rama. Although he was weightless, the military equipment that Max was carrying on the outside of his spacesuit was unwieldy and severely restricted his freedom of movement. This is ridiculous he mumbled to himself. I'm a farmer, not a goddamn commando. The initial surprise came only minutes after the scouts from the Pinta had moved inside the external seal. Following a short walk down a broad corridor, the group came to a circular room, from which three tunnels led deeper into the interior of the alien spaceship. Two of the tunnels were blocked with multiple metal gates. Commander Macmillan called Kenji in for consultation. This is a completely different design. Kenji said in response to the commander's questions. We may as well throw out our maps. Then I presume we should proceed down the unblocked tunnel? Macmillan asked. That's your call, Kenji replied. But I don't see any other option, except to return to the Pinta. The sixteen men trudged slowly down the open tunnel in their spacesuits. Every few minutes they would launch flares into the darkness ahead of them, so that they could see where they were going. When they were about five hundred metres into Rama, two small figures suddenly appeared at the other end of the tunnel. Each of the four soldiers, plus Commander Macmillan, quickly pulled out his binoculars. "'They're coming towards us,' said one of the soldier scouts excitedly. "'Well, I'll be damned,' said Max Puckett, a shiver going down his spine. "'It's Abraham Lincoln.' "'And a woman,' said another, "'in some kind of uniform.' "'Prepare to fire,' ordered Ian Macmillan. The four soldier scouts scurried to the head of the party and knelt down. Their guns pointed down the tunnel. Halt! shouted Macmillan, as the two strange figures drew within two hundred metres of the scouting party. Abraham Lincoln and Benita Garcia stopped. State your purpose! they heard the commander shout. We are here to welcome you, Abraham Lincoln said in a loud, deep voice. And to take you to New Eden, Benita Garcia added. Commander Macmillan was thoroughly confused. He did not know what to do next. While he hesitated, the others in the scouting party talked among themselves. It's Abraham Lincoln, come back as a ghost, the American Terry Snyder said. The other one is Benita Garcia. I saw her statue in Mexico City once. Let's get the hell out of here. This place gives me the creeps, another scout said. What would ghosts be doing in orbit around Mars? Excuse me, Commander. 
Kenji said at length to the befuddled Macmillan. What do you intend to do now? The Scotsman turned to face his Japanese Rama expert. It's difficult to decide on exactly the proper action pattern, of course, he said. I mean, I mean, those two certainly look harmless enough, but remember the Trojan horse. Huh. Well, Watanabe, what do you suggest? Why don't I go forward, perhaps alone, or maybe even with one of the soldiers, to talk to them? Then we'll know. That's certainly brave of you, Watanabe, but unnecessary. No, I think we'll all go forward. Cautiously, of course. Leaving a couple of men at the rear to report in case we're zapped by a ray gun or something. The commander turned on his radio. Deputy Ulanov, Macmillan here. We've encountered two beings of some kind. They're either human or in human disguise. One looks like Abraham Lincoln, and the other like that famous Mexican cosmonaut. What's that, Dimitri? Yes, you copy correctly. Lincoln and Garcia. We've encountered Lincoln and Garcia in a tunnel inside Rama. You may report that to the others. Now, I'm leaving Schneider and Finzi here while the rest of us advance towards the strangers. The two figures did not move as the fourteen explorers from the Pinta approached. The soldiers were spread out in front of the group, ready to fire at the first sign of trouble. Welcome to Rama, Abraham Lincoln said when the first scout was only twenty metres away. We are here to escort you to your new homes. Commander Macmillan did not respond immediately. It was the irrepressible Max Puckett who broke the silence. Are you a ghost? he shouted. I mean, are you really Abraham Lincoln? Of course not, the Lincoln replied matter-of-factly. Both Benita Garcia and I are human biots. You will find five categories of human biots in New Eden each designed with specific capabilities to free humans from tedious, repetitive tasks. My areas of speciality are clerical and legal work, accounting, bookkeeping and housekeeping, home and office management, and other organizational tasks. Max was dumbfounded. Ignoring his commander's order to stand back, Max walked up to within several centimeters of the Lincoln. This is some fucking robot, he muttered to himself. Oblivious to any possible danger, Max next reached out and put his fingers on the Lincoln's face, first touching the skin around the nose and then feeling the whiskers in the long black beard. Incredible, he said out loud. Absolutely incredible. We have been manufactured with very careful attention to detail, the Lincoln now said. Our skin is chemically similar to yours, and our eyes operate on the same basic optical principles as yours. But we are not dynamic, constantly renewing creatures like you. Our subsystems must be maintained, and sometimes even replaced, by technicians. Max's bold move had diffused all the tension. By this time the entire scouting party, including Commander Macmillan, were poking and probing the two biots. Throughout the examination, both the Lincoln and the Garcia answered questions about their design and implementation. At one point, Kenji realized that Max Puckett had withdrawn from the rest of the scouting party and was sitting by himself against one of the walls of the tunnel. Kenji walked over to his friend. What's the matter, Max? he asked. Max shook his head. What kind of genius could produce something like these two? It's positively scary. He was silent for several seconds. Maybe I'm strange, but those two biots frighten me much more than this huge cylinder. The Lincoln and the Garcia walked with the scouting party to what appeared to be the end of the tunnel. Within seconds, a door opened in the wall, and the Biots motioned for the humans to go inside. Under questioning from Macmillan, the Biots explained that the humans were about to enter a transportation device that would carry them to the outskirts of the Earth habitat. Macmillan communicated what the Biots had said to Dmitri Ulanov on the Pinta and told his Russian deputy to blast off if he didn't hear anything from them within forty-eight hours. The tube ride was astonishing. It reminded Max Puckett of the giant roller coaster at the State Fair in Dallas, Texas. The bullet-shaped vehicle sped along an enclosed helical track that dropped all the way from the bowl-shaped northern end of Rama to the central plain below. Outside the tube, which was encased in a heavy transparent plastic of some kind, Kenji and the others glimpsed the vast network of ladders and stairways that traversed the same territory as their ride. 
but they did not see the incomparable vistas reported by the previous Rama explorers. Their view to the south was blocked by an extremely tall wall of metallic grey. The ride took less than five minutes. It deposited them in an enclosed annulus that completely circumscribed the earth habitat. When the Pinter scouts exited from the tube, the weightlessness in which they had been living since they had departed from earth had vanished. The gravity was close to normal. The atmosphere in this corridor, like the atmosphere in New Eden, is just like your home planet, the Lincoln Biot said. But that is not the case in the region on our right, outside the walls protecting your habitat. The annulus surrounding New Eden was dimly lit, so the colonists were not prepared for the bright sunlight that greeted them when the huge door opened and they entered their new world. On the short walk to the nearby train station, they carried their space helmets in their hands. The men passed empty buildings on both sides of the path, small structures that could be houses or shops, as well as a larger one. That will be an elementary school, the Benita Garcia informed them, right opposite the station itself. A train was waiting for them when they arrived. The sleek subway car with soft, comfortable seats and a constantly updating electronic status board raced quickly toward the centre of New Eden, where they were to have a comprehensive briefing, according to the Lincoln Biot. The train ran first along the side of a beautiful crystalline lake. Lake Shakespeare, the Benita Garcia said, and then turned to the left, heading away from the light grey walls that enclosed the colony. During the last part of the ride, a large, barren mountain dominated the landscape on the right-hand side of the train. Throughout the ride, the entire contingent from the Pinta was very quiet. In truth, they were all completely overwhelmed. Not even in the creative imagination of Kenji Watanabe had anything like what they were seeing ever been envisioned. It was all much too large, much more magnificent than they had pictured. The central city, where all the major buildings had been located by the designers of New Eden, was the final stunner. The members of the party stood silently and gawked at the array of large and impressive structures that formed the heart of the colony. That the buildings were still empty only added to the mystical quality of the entire experience. Kenji Watanabe and Max Puckett were the last two men to enter the edifice where the briefing was to occur. What do you think? Kenji asked Max as the two of them stood on the top of the stairs of the administration building and surveyed the astonishing complex around them. "'I cannot think,' answered Max, the awe in his tone quite obvious. "'This whole place defies thought. It is heaven, Alice's Wonderland, and all the fairy tales of my boyhood wrapped up in one package. I keep pinching myself to make sure that I'm not dreaming.' "'On the screen in front of you,' the Lincoln Biot said, is an overview map of New Eden. Each of you will be given a full packet of maps, including all the roads and structures in the colony. We are here, in Central City, which was designed to be the administrative center of New Eden. Residences have been built, along with shops, small offices, and schools, in the four corners of the rectangle that is enclosed by the outside wall. Because the naming of these four towns will be left to the inhabitants, we will refer to them today as the Northeast, Northwest, Southeast, and Southwest villages. In doing this, we are following the convention, adopted by earlier Raman explorers from the Earth, of referring to the end of Rama where your spacecraft docked as the North End. Each of the four sides of New Eden has an allocated geographic function. The freshwater lake along the south edge of the colony, as you have already been informed, is called Lake Shakespeare. Most of the fish and water life that you have brought with you will live there, although some of the specimens may be perfect for emplacement in the two rivers that empty into Lake Shakespeare from Mount Olympus, here on the east side of the colony, and Sherwood Forest on the west side. At present, both the slopes of Mount Olympus and all the regions of Sherwood Forest, as well as the village parks and green belts throughout the colony, are covered with a fine lattice of gas exchange devices, or GEDs, as we call them. These tiny mechanisms serve but one function. They convert carbon dioxide into oxygen. In a very true sense, they are mechanical plants. They are to be replaced by all the real plants that you have brought from the earth. 
The north side of the colony between the villages is reserved for farming. Farm buildings have been constructed here along the road that connects the two northern towns. You will grow most of your food in this area. Between the food supplies that you have brought with you and the synthetic food stored in the tall silos three hundred meters north of this building, you shall be able to feed two thousand humans for at least a year, maybe eighteen months if waste is kept at a minimum. After that, you are on your own. It goes without saying that farming, including the aquaculture that has been allocated to the eastern shores of Lake Shakespeare, will be an important component in your life in New Eden. To Kenji, the briefing experience was like drinking out of a fire hose. The Lincoln Biot kept the information rate exceedingly high for ninety minutes, dismissing all questions either by saying, That's outside my knowledge base, or by referring to the page and paragraph numbers in the basic guidebook to New Eden that he had handed out. Finally, there was a break in the briefing, and everyone moved to an adjacent room, where a drink that tasted like Coca-Cola was served. Phew, said Terry Snyder, as he wiped his brow. Am I the only one who is saturated? Shit, Snyder, replied Max Puckett, with an impish grin. Are you saying you're inferior to that goddamn robot? He sure as hell ain't tired. I bet he could lecture all day. Maybe even all week, mused Kenji Watanabe. I wonder how often these biots need to be serviced. My father's company makes robots, some of them exceedingly complex, but nothing like this. The information content in that Lincoln must be astronomical. The briefing will recommence in five minutes, the Lincoln announced. Please be prompt. In the second half of the briefing, the various kinds of biots in New Eden were introduced and explained. Based on their recent studies of the previous Raman expeditions, the colonists were prepared for the bulldozer and other construction biots. The five categories of human biots, however, elicited a more emotional response. Our designers decided, the Lincoln told them, to limit the physical appearance of the human biots so that there could be no question of someone mistaking one of us for one of you. I have already listed my basic functions. All the other Lincolns, three of whom are now joining us, have been identically programmed, at least originally. We are, however, capable of some low level of learning that will allow our databases to be different as our specific uses evolve. How can we tell one Lincoln from another? asked one bewildered member of the scouting party as the three new Lincolns circulated around the room. We each have an identification number, engraved both here on the shoulder and again here on the left buttock. This same system is employed for the other categories of human biots, I, for example, am Lincoln 004. The three that just entered are 009, 024, and 071. When the Lincoln Biots left the briefing room, they were replaced by five Benita Garcias. One of the Garcias outlined the specialities of her category, police and fire protection, farming, sanitation, transportation, mail handling, and then answered a few questions before they all departed. The Einstein Biots were next. The scouts erupted with laughter when four of the Einsteins, each a wild, unkempt, white-haired replica of the twentieth-century scientific genius, walked into the room together. The Einsteins explained that they were the engineers and scientists of the colony. Their primary function, a vital one encompassing many duties, was to ensure the satisfactory working of the colony infrastructure, including, of course, the army of biots. A group of tall, jet-black female biots introduced themselves as the Tiassos, specialising in health care. They would be the doctors, the nurses, the health officials, the ones who would provide child care when the parents were not available. Just as the Tiasso portion of the briefing was ending, a slight oriental biot with intense eyes walked into the room. He was carrying a lyre and an electronic easel. He introduced himself as a Yasunari Kawabata before playing a beautiful short piece on the lyre. We Kawabatas are creative artists, he said simply. We are musicians, actors, painters, sculptors, writers, and sometimes photographers and cinematographers. We are few in number, but very important for the quality of life in New Eden. When the official briefing was finally over, the scouting party was served an excellent dinner in the large hall. About twenty of the biots joined the humans at the gathering, although, of course, they did not eat anything. The simulated roast duck was staggeringly authentic, and even the wines could have passed the inspection of all but the most learned enologists on earth. 
Later in the evening, when the humans had grown more comfortable with their biot companions and were peppering them with questions, a solitary female figure appeared in the open doorway. At first she was unnoticed, but the room quieted quickly after Kenji Watanabe jumped up from his seat and approached the newcomer with an outstretched hand. Dr. Desjardins, I presume, he said with a smile. Chapter 10 Despite Nicole's assurances that everything in New Eden was completely consistent with her earlier remarks on the video, Commander Macmillan refused to allow the Pinta passengers and crew to enter Rama and occupy their new homes until he was certain there was no danger. After returning to the Pinta, he conferred at length with ISA personnel on Earth and then sent a small contingent headed by Dmitry Ulanov into Rama to obtain additional information. The chief medical officer of the Pinta, a Dur Dutchman named Dahl von Roos, was the most important member of Ulanov's team. Kenji Watanabe and two soldiers from the first scouting party also accompanied the Russian engineer. The doctor's instructions were straightforward. He was to examine the wakefields, all of them, and certify that they were indeed humans. His second assignment was to analyze the biots and categorize their non-biological features. Everything was accomplished without incident, although Katie Wakefield was uncooperative and sarcastic during the examination. At Richard's suggestion, an Einstein biot took apart one of the Lincolns and demonstrated, at a functional level, how the most sophisticated subsystems worked. Deputy Ulanov was duly impressed. Two days later, the voyagers from the Pinta began moving their possessions into Rama. A large cadre of biots helped with the unloading of the spacecraft and the movement of all the supplies into New Eden. The process took almost three days to complete. But where would everyone settle? In a decision that would later have significant consequences for the colony, almost all of the three hundred travellers on the Pinta elected to live in South East Village, where the Wakefields had made their home. Only Max Puckett and a handful of farmers, who moved directly into the farming region along the northern perimeter of New Eden, decided to live elsewhere in the colony. The Watanabes moved into a small house just down the lane from Richard and Nicole. From the very beginning, Kenji and Nicole had had a natural rapport, and their initial friendship had grown with each subsequent interaction. On the first evening that Kenji and Nye spent in their new home, they were invited to share a family dinner with the Wakefields. Why don't we go into the living room? It's more comfortable there, Nicole said when the meal was completed. The Lincoln will clear the table and take care of the dishes. The Watanabes rose from their chairs and followed Richard through the entryway at the end of the dining room. The younger Wakefields politely waited for Kenji and Nye to go first, and then joined their parents and guests in the cosy living room at the front of the house. It had been five days since the Pinta scouting party had entered Rama for the first time. Five amazing days, Kenji was thinking, as he sat down in the Wakefield living room. His mind quickly scanned the kaleidoscope of jumbled impressions that were as yet unordered by his brain. And in many ways, this dinner was the most amazing of all. What this family had been through is incredible. The stories you have told us, Nye said to Richard and Nicole when everyone was seated, are absolutely astonishing. There are so many questions I want to ask. I don't know where to start. I'm especially fascinated by this creature you call the eagle. Was he one of the E.T.s who built the node and Rama in the first place? No, said Nicole. The eagle was a biot also. At least, that's what he told us, and we have no reason not to believe him. He was created by the governing intelligence of the node to give us a specific physical interface. But then, who did build the node? That's definitely a level three question, Richard said with a smile. Kenji and Nye laughed. Nicole and Richard had explained the eagle's informational hierarchy to them during the long stories at dinner. I wonder if it is even possible, Kenji mused, for us to conceive of being so advanced that their machines can create other machines smarter than we are. I wonder if it is even possible, Katie now interrupted, for us to discuss some more trivial issues. For example, where are all the young people my age? So far I don't think I have seen more than two colonists between twelve and twenty-five. Most of the youngest that are on board the Nina, Kenji responded. It should arrive here in about three weeks with the bulk of the colony population. 
The passengers on the Pinta were hand-picked for the task of checking out the veracity of the video we received. What's veracity? Katie asked. Truth and accuracy, Nicole said, more or less. It was one of your grandfather's favorite words. And speaking of your grandfather, he was also a great believer that young people should always be permitted to listen to adult conversation, but not to interrupt it. We have many things to discuss tonight with the Watanabes. The four of you don't have to stay. I want to go out and see the lights, Benji said. Will you come with me, please, Ellie? Ellie Wakefield stood up and took Benji by the hand. The two of them said good night politely and were followed out the door by Katie and Patrick. We're going to see if we can find anything exciting to do, Katie said as they departed. Good night, Mr. and Mrs. Watanabe. Mother will be back in a couple of hours or so. Nicole shook her head as the last of her children left the house. Katie has been so frenetic since the Pinta arrived, she said in explanation. She is barely even sleeping at night. She wants to meet and talk to everybody. The Lincoln Biot, who had now finished cleaning the kitchen, was standing unobtrusively by the door behind Benji's chair. Would you like something to drink? Nicole asked Kenji and I, motioning in the direction of the Biot. We don't have anything as delicious as the fresh fruit drinks that you brought from Earth, but Link can whip up some interesting synthetic concoctions. I'm fine, Kenji said, shaking his head. But I just realized we have spent the entire evening talking about your incredible odyssey. Certainly you must have questions for us. After all, forty-five years have passed on Earth since the Newton was launched. Forty-five years, Nicole suddenly thought. Is that possible? Can Genevieve really be almost sixty years old? Nicole remembered clearly the last time she had seen her father and daughter on Earth. Pierre and Genevieve had accompanied her to the airport in Paris. Her daughter had hugged Nicole fiercely until the last call for boarding, and then looked up at her mother with intense love and pride. The girl's eyes had been full of tears. Genevieve had been unable to say anything. And during that forty-five years my father has died. Genevieve has become an older woman, a grandmother even, Kenji said, while I have been wandering in time and space, in a wonderland. The memories were too powerful for Nicole. She took a deep breath and steadied herself. There was still quiet in the Wakefield living room as she returned to the present. Is everything all right? Kenji asked, sensitively. Nicole nodded and stared at the soft, open eyes of her new friend. She imagined for a brief moment that she was talking to her fellow Newton cosmonaut, Shigeru Takakishi. This man is full of curiosity, as Shig was. I can trust him. And he has talked to Genevieve only a few years ago. Most of the general Earth history has been explained to us in bits and snippets during our many conversations with other passengers from the Pinta, Nicole said, after a protracted silence. But we know absolutely nothing about our families, except what you told us briefly that first night. Both Richard and I would like to know if you've remembered any additional details that might have been omitted in our first conversations. As a matter of fact, Kenji said, I went back through my journals this afternoon and read again the entries I made when I was doing the preliminary research for my book on the Newton. The most important thing that I neglected to mention in our earlier discussion was how much your Genevieve looks like her father, at least from the lips down. King Henry's face was striking, as I'm certain you remember. As an adult, Genevieve's face lengthened and began to resemble his quite markedly. Here, look at these. I managed to find a couple of photographs from my three days at Beauvoir, stored in my database. Seeing the pictures of Genevieve overwhelmed Nicole. Tears rushed immediately into her eyes and overflowed onto her cheeks. Her hands trembled as she held the two photographs of Genevieve and her husband, Louis Gaston. Oh, Genevieve, she cried to herself, how I have missed you. How I would love to hold you in my arms for just a moment. Richard leaned over her shoulder to see the pictures. As he did so, he caressed Nicole gently. She does look something like the prince, he commented softly. But I think she looks much more like her mother. Genevieve was also extremely courteous, Kenji added, which surprised me considering how much she had suffered during all the media uproar in 2238. She answered my questions very patiently. I had intended to make her one of the centerpieces of the Newton book until my editor dissuaded me from the project altogether. 
How many of the Newton cosmonauts are still alive? Richard asked, keeping the conversation going while Nicole continued to gaze at the two photographs. Only Sabatini, Tabori, and Yamanaka, Kenji replied. Dr. David Brown had a massive stroke and then died six months later under somewhat unusual circumstances. I believe that was in 2208. Admiral Heilman died of cancer in 2214 or so. Irina Turgenev suffered a complete mental breakdown, a victim of Return to Earth Syndrome, identified among some of the 21st century cosmonauts, and eventually committed suicide in 2211. Nicole was still struggling with her emotions. Until three nights ago, she said to the Watanabes when the room was again silent. I had never even told Richard or the children that Henry was Genevieve's father. While I was living on Earth, only my father knew the truth. Henry may have suspected, but he didn't know for certain. Then, when you told me about Genevieve, I realized that I should be the one to tell my family. I... Nicole's voice trailed off, and more tears appeared in her eyes. She wiped her face with one of the tissues Nye handed her. I'm sorry, Nicole said. I'm never like this. It's just such a shock to see a picture and to recall so many things. When we were living in Rama too, and then at the Node, Richard said, Nicole was a model of stability. She was a rock. No matter what we encountered, no matter how bizarre, she was unflappable. The children and Michael O'Toole and I all depended on her. It's very rare to see her. Enough, Nicole exclaimed after wiping her face. She put the photographs aside. Let's go on to other subjects. Let's talk about the Newton cosmonauts, Francesca Sabatini in particular. Did she get what she wanted? Fame and riches beyond compare? Pretty much, Kenji said. I wasn't alive during her heyday in the first decade of the century, but even now she is still very famous. She was one of the people interviewed on television recently about the significance of recolonizing Mars. Nicole leaned forward in her chair. I didn't tell you this during dinner, but I'm certain Francesca and Brown drugged Botsov, causing his appendicitis symptoms, and she purposely left me at the bottom of that pit in New York. The woman was totally without scruples. Kenji was silent for several seconds. Back in 2208, just before Dr. Brown died, he had occasional lucid periods in his generally incoherent state. During one such period he gave a fantastic interview to a magazine reporter, in which he confessed partial responsibility for Botsov's death and implicated Francesca in your disappearance. Signora Sabatini said the entire story was poppycock, the crazy outpourings of a diseased brain, sued the magazine for a hundred million marks, and then settled comfortably out of court. The magazine fired the reporter and formally apologized to her. Francesca always wins in the end, Nicole remarked. I almost resurrected the whole story three years ago. Kenji continued. When I was doing the research for my book, since it had been more than twenty-five years, all the data from the Newton mission was in the public domain, and therefore available to anyone who asked for it, I found the contents of your personal computer, including the data cube that must have come from Henry, scattered throughout the trickle telemetry. I became convinced that Dr. Brown's interview had indeed contained some truth. So what happened? I went to interview Francesca at her palace in Sorrento. Soon thereafter, I stopped working on the book. Kenji hesitated for an instant. Should I say more, he wondered. He glanced over at his loving wife. No, he said to himself, this is not the time or the place. I'm sorry, Richard. He was almost asleep when he heard his wife's soft voice in the bedroom. Huh? he said. Did you say something, dear? I'm sorry, Nicole repeated. She rolled over next to him and found his hand with hers underneath the covers. I should have told you about Henry years ago. Are you still angry? I was never angry, Richard said. Surprised, yes. Maybe even flabbergasted. But not angry. You had your reasons for keeping it secret. He squeezed her hand. Besides, it was back on earth. In another life. If you had told me when we first met, it might have mattered. I might have been jealous, and almost certainly would have felt inadequate, but not now. Nicole leaned over and gave him a kiss. I love you, 
Richard Wakefield, she said. And I love you too, he responded. Kenji and Nye made love for the first time since they had left the Pinta, and she fell asleep immediately. Kenji was still surprisingly alert. He lay awake in bed, thinking about the evening with the Wakefields. For some reason, an image of Francesca Sabatini came into his mind. The most beautiful seventy-year-old woman I have ever seen was his first thought, and what a fantastic life. Kenji remembered clearly the summer afternoon when his train had pulled into the station at Sorrento. The driver of the electric cab had recognized the address immediately. Capisco, he had said, waving his hands and then heading in the direction of Il Palazzo Sabatini. Francesca lived in a converted hotel overlooking the Bay of Naples. It was a twenty-room structure that had once belonged to a seventeenth-century prince. From the office where Kenji waited for Signora Sabatini to appear, he could see a funicular carrying swimmers down a steep precipice to the dark blue bay below. La Signora was half an hour late, and then quickly became impatient for the interview to be over. Twice Francesca informed Kenji that she had only agreed to talk to him at all because her publisher had told her he was an outstanding young writer. Frankly, she said in her excellent English, at this stage I find all discussion of the Newton extremely boring. Her interest in the conversation picked up considerably when Kenji told her about his new data, the files from Nicole's personal computer that had been telemetered down to earth in the trickle mode during the final few weeks of the mission. Francesca became quiet, even pensive, as Kenji compared the internal notes that Nicole had made with the confession given by Dr. David Brown to the magazine reporter in 2208. I underestimated you, Francesca said with a smile, when Kenji asked if she didn't think it was a remarkable coincidence that Nicole's Newton diary and David Brown's confession had so many points of agreement. She never answered his questions directly. Instead, she stood up in the office, insisted that he stay for the evening, and told Kenji that she would talk to him later. Near dusk, a note came to Kenji's room in Francesca's palace, telling him that dinner would be at 8.30 and that he should wear a coat and a tie. A robot arrived at the appointed time and led him into a magnificent dining room with walls covered in murals and tapestries, glittering chandeliers hanging from the high ceilings, and delicate carvings on all the mouldings. The table was set for ten. Francesca was already there, standing near a small robot server off to one side of the enormous room. Konbanwa Watanabe-san, Francesca said in Japanese as she offered him a glass of champagne. I'm renovating the main sitting areas, so I'm afraid we're having our cocktails here. It's all very gauche, as the French would say, but it will have to do. Francesca looked magnificent. Her blonde hair was only slightly tinged by grey. It was stacked on top of her head, held by a large carved comb. A choker of diamonds was around her throat, and an immense solitary sapphire dangled from an understated diamond necklace. Her strapless gown was white, with folds and pleats that accentuated the curves of her still youthful body. Kenji could not believe that she was seventy years old. She took him by the hand, after explaining that she had quickly put together a dinner party in his honour, and led him over to the tapestries against the far wall. "'Do you know Abusan at all?' she asked. When he shook his head, Francesca launched into a discussion of the history of European tapestries. Half an hour later, Francesca took her seat at the head of the table. A music professor from Naples and his wife, supposedly an actress, two handsome, swarthy professional soccer players, the curator of the Pompeii ruins, a man in his early fifties, a middle-aged Italian poetess, and two young women in their twenties, each stunningly attractive, occupied the other places. After some consultation with Francesca, one of the two women sat opposite Kenji and the other beside him. At first, the armchair opposite Francesca, at the far end of the table, was empty. Francesca whispered something to her head waiter, however, and five minutes later a very old man, bald and almost blind, was led into the room. Kenji recognized him immediately. It was Janos Tabori. The meal was wonderful, the conversation lively. The food was all served by waiters, not by the robots used in all but the most fashionable restaurants, and each course was enhanced by a different Italian wine. And what a remarkable group. Everyone, even the soccer players, spoke passable English. They were also both interested in and knowledgeable of space history. The young woman opposite Kenji had even read his most popular book on the early exploration of Mars. 
As the evening wore on, Kenji, who was a bachelor of thirty at the time, became less inhibited. He was aroused by everything, the women, the wine, the discussions of history and poetry and music. Only once during the two hours at the table was there any mention of the afternoon interview. During a lull in the conversation after dessert and before the cognac, Francesca nearly shouted at Janos, This young Japanese man, he's very brilliant, you know, thinks he has found evidence from Nicole's personal computer that corroborates those awful lies David told before he died. Janos did not comment. His facial expression did not change. But after the meal, he handed Kenji a note and then disappeared. You know nothing but the truth and have no tenderness, the note said. Thus you judge unjustly. Aglaya Panchin to Prince Mishkin. The Idiot by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Kenji had only been in his room for five or ten minutes when there was a knock on his door. When he opened it, he saw the young Italian woman who had been sitting opposite him at dinner. She was wearing a tiny bikini that revealed most of her exceptional body. She was also holding a man's bathing suit in her hand. Mr. Watanabe, she said with a sexy smile, please join us for a swim. This suit ought to fit you. Kenji felt an immediate and enormous surge of lust that did not quickly abate. Slightly embarrassed, he waited a minute or two after dressing before he joined the woman in the hall. Three years later, even lying in his bed now in New Eden next to the woman he loved, it was impossible for Kenji not to recall with sexual longing the night he spent in Francesca's palace. Six of them had taken the funicular down to the bay and swum in the moonlight. At the cabana next to the water, they had drunk and danced and laughed together. It had been a dream night. Within an hour, Kenji remembered, we were all happily naked. The game plan was clear. The two soccer players were for Francesca, the two Madonnas for me. Kenji squirmed in his bed, recalling both the intensity of his pleasure and Francesca's free laughter when she found him entwined with the two young women at dawn, in one of the oversized chaise longues beside the bay. When I reached New York four days later, my editor told me that he thought I should abandon the Newton project. I didn't argue with him. I probably would have suggested it myself. Chapter 11 Ellie was fascinated by the porcelain figures. She picked one up, a little girl dressed in a light blue ballet gown, and turned it over in her hands. Look at this, Benji, she said to her brother. Someone made this all by himself. That one is actually a copy, the Spanish shopkeeper said. But an artist did make the original from which the computer imprint was taken. The reproduction process is now so accurate that even the experts have a hard time telling which ones are the copies. And you collected all these back on earth? Ellie waved her hand at the hundred or so figures on the table and in the small glass cases. Yes. Mr. Murillo said proudly. Although I was a civil servant in Seville, building permits and that sort of thing, my wife and I also owned a small shop. We fell in love with porcelain art about ten years ago and have been avid collectors ever since. Mrs. Murillo, also in her late forties, came out of a back room where she was still unpacking merchandise. We decided, she said, long before we learned that we had actually been selected as colonists by the ISA, that no matter how restrictive our baggage requirements were for the voyage on the Niña, we would bring our entire collection of porcelain with us. Benji was holding the dancing girl only a few centimetres from his face. Beautiful, he said with a broad smile. Thank you, Mr. Murillo said. We had hoped to start a collector's society in Lowell Colony, he added. Three or four of the other passengers on the Niña brought several pieces as well. May we look at them? Ellie asked. We'll be very careful. Help yourself, Mrs. Murillo said. Eventually, once everything settles down, we will sell or barter some of the objects, certainly the duplicates. Right now they're just on display to be appreciated. While Ellie and Benji were examining the porcelain creations, several other people entered the shop. The Murillos had opened for business only a few days before. They sold candles, fancy napkins, and other small household adornments. You certainly didn't waste any time, Carlos, a burly American said to Mr. Murillo several minutes later. From this initial greeting, it was obvious that he had been a fellow passenger on the Nina. It was easy for us, Travis, 
Mr. Murillo said. We had no family and needed only a small place to live. We haven't even settled into a house yet, Travis complained. We're definitely going to live in this village, but Chelsea and the kids cannot find a house they all like. Chelsea is still spooked by the whole arrangement. She doesn't believe the ISA is telling us the truth even now. I admit that it is extremely difficult to accept that this space station was built by aliens just so they can observe us and it would certainly be easier to believe the ISA story if there were pictures from that node place. But why would they lie to us? They have lied before. Nobody even mentioned this place until a day before the rendezvous. Chelsea believes that we are part of an ISA space colony experiment. She says that we will stay here for a while and then be transferred to the surface of Mars so that the two types of colonies can be compared. Mr. Murillo laughed. I see Chelsea hasn't changed since we left the Nina. It became more serious. You know, Juanita and I have had our doubts too, especially after the first week passed and nobody had seen any sign of the aliens. We spent two full days wandering around, talking to other people. We essentially conducted our own investigation. We finally concluded that the ISA story must be true. First of all, it's just too preposterous to be a lie. Second, that Wakefield woman was very convincing. In her open meeting, she answered questions for almost two hours, and neither Juanita nor I detected a single inconsistency. It's hard for me to imagine anyone sleeping for twelve years, Travis said, shaking his head. Of course, it was for us too. But we actually inspected that somnarium where the Wakefield family supposedly slept. Everything was exactly as Nicole had described it in the meeting. The overall building, incidentally, is immense. There are enough berths and rooms to house everyone in the colony, if necessary. It certainly doesn't make sense that the ISA would have built such a huge facility to support a lie. Maybe you're right. Anyway, we've decided to make the best of it, at least for the time being. And we certainly can't complain about our living conditions. All the housing is first-rate. Juanita and I even have our own Lincoln robot to give us a hand both at home and around the store. Ellie was following the discussion very closely. She remembered what her mother had told her the night before, when she had asked if she and Benji could go for a walk in the village. I guess so, darling, Nicole had said. But if anyone recognizes you as a Wakefield and starts to question you, don't talk to them. Be polite, and then come home as quickly as you can. Mr. Macmillan does not want us talking to any non-ISA personnel about our experiences just yet. While Ellie was admiring the porcelain figures and listening intently to the conversation between Mr. Murillo and the man named Travis, Benji wandered off on his own. When Ellie realized he was not beside her, she started to panic. What are you staring at, buddy? Ellie heard a harsh male voice say on the other side of the shop. Her hair is very pretty, Benji replied. He was blocking the aisle, preventing the man and his wife from moving forward. He smiled and reached out his hand toward the woman's magnificent long blonde hair. May I touch it? he asked. Are you crazy? Of course not. Now get out of... Jason, I think he's retarded, the woman said quietly, catching her husband's arm before he pushed Benji. At that moment, Ellie walked up beside her brother. She realized that the man was angry, but she did not know what to do. She nudged Benji gently on the shoulder. Look, Ellie, he exclaimed, slurring his words in excitement. Look at her pretty yellow hair. Is this goon a friend of yours? the tall man asked Ellie. Benji is my brother, Ellie answered with difficulty. Well, get him out of here. He's bothering my wife. Sir, Ellie said after summoning her courage, my brother doesn't mean any harm. He's never seen long blonde hair up close before. The man's face wrinkled in anger and puzzlement. What? he said. He glanced at his wife. What's with these two? One's a dummy and the other... Aren't you two of the Wakefield children? A pleasant female voice behind Ellie interrupted. The distraught Ellie turned around. Mrs. Murillo stepped between the teenagers and the couple. She and her husband had crossed the shop as soon as they had heard the raised voices. Yes, ma'am, Ellie said softly. Yes, we are. You mean these are two of the children who came from outer space? The man named Jason asked. Ellie managed to pull Benji quickly over to the door of the shop. We're very sorry, Ellie said before she and Benji departed. We didn't mean to cause any trouble. 
Freaks, Ellie heard somebody say as the door closed behind her. It had been another exhausting day. Nicole was very tired. She stood in front of the mirror and finished washing her face. Ellie and Benji had some kind of unpleasant experience down in the village, Richard said from the bedroom. They wouldn't tell me much about it. Nicole had spent thirteen long hours that day helping to process the Nina passengers. No matter how hard she and Kenji Watanabe and the others had worked, it seemed as if nobody was ever satisfied, and there were always more tasks that needed to be done. Many of the new colonists had been downright petulant when Nicole had tried to explain to them the procedures that the ISA had established for the allocation of food, living quarters, and working areas. She had been too many days without enough sleep. Nicole looked at the bags under her eyes. But we must finish with this group before the Santa Maria arrives, she said to herself. They will be far more difficult. Nicole wiped her face with a towel and crossed into the bedroom, where Richard was sitting up in his pyjamas. How was your day? she asked. Not bad. Fairly interesting, in fact. Slowly but surely the human engineers are becoming more comfortable with the Einsteins. He paused. Did you hear what I said about Ellie and Benji? Nicole sighed. From the tone in Richard's voice, she understood his real message. Despite her fatigue, she exited from the bedroom and headed down the hall. Ellie was already asleep, but Benji was still awake in the room he shared with Patrick. Nicole sat down beside Benji and took his hand. Hello, Mama, the boy said. Uncle Richard mentioned that you and Ellie went into the village this afternoon, Nicole said to her eldest son. An expression of pain creased the boy's face for a few seconds and then disappeared. Yes, Mama, he said. Ellie told me that they were recognized and that one of the new colonists called them some names, Patrick said from the opposite side of the room. Is that right, darling? Nicole asked Benji, still holding and stroking his hands. The boy made a barely perceptible affirmative motion with his head and then stared silently at his mother. What a goon, Mama, he said suddenly, his eyes filling with tears. Nicole put her arms around Benji. Did someone call you a goon today? she asked softly. Benji nodded. The word doesn't have a specific meaning, Nicole answered. Anyone who is different, or perhaps objectionable, might be called a goon. She caressed Benji again. People use words like that when they aren't thinking. Whoever called you a goon was probably confused or upset by other events in his life, and he just lashed out at you because he didn't understand you. Did you do anything to bother him? No, Mamma. I just told him that I liked the woman's yellow hair. It took several minutes, but Nicole eventually learned the gist of what had occurred in the porcelain shop. When she thought that Benji was all right, Nicole walked across the room to kiss Patrick goodnight. And how about you? she said. Was your day all right? Mostly, Patrick said. I only had one disaster. Down at the park. He tried to smile. Some of the new boys were playing basketball and invited me to join them. I was absolutely terrible. A couple of them laughed at me. Nicole gave Patrick a long and tender hug. Patrick is strong, Nicole said to herself when she was out in the hall, heading back to her bedroom. But even he needs support. She took a deep breath. Am I doing the right thing, she asked herself for the umpteenth time since she had become deeply involved in all aspects of the planning for the colony. I feel so responsible for everything here. I want New Eden to begin properly, but my children still need more of my time. Will I ever achieve the right balance? Richard was still awake when Nicole snuggled in beside him. She shared Benji's story with her husband. I'm sorry I wasn't able to help him, Richard said. There are just some things that only a mother. Nicole was so exhausted that she was falling asleep before Richard even finished his sentence. He touched her firmly on the arm. Nicole, he said, there is something else we must talk about. Unfortunately, it can't wait. We may not have any private time in the morning. She rolled over and looked at Richard quizzically. It's about Katie, he said. I really need your help. There's another of those youth get acquainted dances tomorrow night. You remember we told Katie last week she could go. 
but only if Patrick went with her and she came home at a reasonable hour. Well, tonight I just happened to see her standing in front of her mirror in a new dress. It was short and very revealing. When I asked her about the dress and then told her that it didn't seem like an appropriate outfit for a casual dance, she flew into a rage. She insisted that I was spying on her and then informed me that I was hopelessly ignorant about fashion. What did you say? I reprimanded her. She glared at me coldly and said nothing. Several minutes later she left the house without saying a word. The rest of the children and I ate dinner without her. Katie came home only thirty minutes or so before you did. She smelled of tobacco and beer. When I tried to talk to her, she just said, Don't bother me, and then went to her room and slammed the door. I've been afraid of this, Nicole thought, as she lay next to Richard in silence. All the signs have been there since she was a little girl. Katie is brilliant, but she is also selfish and impetuous. I was going to tell Katie that she could not go to the dance tomorrow night, Richard was saying. But then I realized that by any normal definition she is an adult. After all, her registry card at the administration office gives her age as twenty-four. We really can't treat her like a child. But she's maybe fourteen emotionally, Nicole thought, squirming as Richard began reciting all the difficulties they had had with Katie since the first other humans had entered Rama. Nothing matters to her but adventure and excitement. Nicole remembered the day she had spent with Katie at the hospital. It had been a week before the colonists from the Nina had arrived. Katie had been fascinated by all the sophisticated medical equipment and genuinely interested in how it worked. However, when Nicole had suggested that Katie might want to work at the hospital until the university opened, the young woman had laughed. "'Are you kidding?' her daughter had said. "'I can't imagine anything more boring, especially when there will be hundreds of new people to meet.' "'There's not much either Richard or I can do,' Nicole said to herself with a sigh. We can ache for Katie and offer her our love, but she has already decided that all our knowledge and experience is irrelevant. There was silence in the bedroom. Nicole reached over and kissed Richard. I will talk to Katie tomorrow about the dress, she said, but I doubt if it will do much good. Patrick was sitting by himself in a folding chair against the wall of the school gymnasium. He took a sip from his soda and glanced at his watch as the slow music ended and a dozen couples dancing on the large floor slowed to a stop. Katie and Olaf Larsen, a tall Swede whose father was a member of Commander Macmillan's staff, shared a brief kiss before walking arm in arm in Patrick's direction. Olaf and I are going outside for a cigarette and another shot of whiskey, Katie said when the pair reached Patrick. Why don't you come with us? We're already late, Katie, Patrick replied. We said we would be home by twelve-thirty. The Swede gave Patrick a condescending pat on the back. Come on, boy, he said. Loosen up. Your sister and I are having a good time. Olaf was already drunk. His fair face was flushed from the drinking and dancing. He pointed across the room. Do you see that girl with the red hair, white dress and big boobs? Her name is Beth, and she's a hot number. She's been waiting all night for you to ask her to dance. Would you like for me to introduce you? Patrick shook his head. Look, Katie, he said, I want to go. I've been sitting here patiently. Half an hour more, baby brother, Katie interrupted. I'll go outside for a little while, then come back for a couple of dances. After that we'll leave, OK? She kissed Patrick on the cheek and moved toward the door with Olaf. A fast dance began playing on the gymnasium sound system. Patrick watched in fascination as the young couples moved in tune with the heavy beat of the music. "'You don't dance?' a young man who was walking around the perimeter of the dance floor asked him. "'No,' said Patrick. "'I've never tried.' The young man gave Patrick a strange look. Then he stopped and smiled. "'Of course,' he said. "'You're one of the Wakefields. Hi. My name is Brian Walsh. I'm from Wisconsin, in the middle of the United States.' My parents are the ones who are supposed to be organizing the university. Patrick had not exchanged more than a couple of words with anyone except Katie since they had arrived at the dance several hours earlier. He gladly shook hands with Brian Walsh, and the two of them chatted amiably for a few minutes. Brian, who had been half finished with his undergraduate degree in computer engineering when his family had been selected for Lowell Colony, was twenty and an only child. He was also extremely curious about his companion's experiences. 
Tell me, he said to Patrick, when they had become more comfortable with each other. Does this place called the Node really exist? Or is it part of some cockamamie story dreamed up by the ISA? No, said Patrick, forgetting that he was not supposed to discuss such things. The Node is definitely there. My father says it's an extraterrestrial processing station. Brian laughed easily. So somewhere out near Sirius is a gigantic triangle built by an unknown superspecies? And its purpose is to help them study other creatures who travel in space. Wow. That's the most fantastic tale I have ever heard. In fact, almost everything your mother told us at that open meeting was unbelievable. I will, however, admit that both the existence of this space station and the technological level of the robots do make her story more plausible. Everything my mother said was true, Patrick said, and some of the most incredible stories were purposely left out. For example, my mother had a conversation with a caped eel who talked in bubbles. Also, Patrick stopped himself, remembering Nicole's admonitions. Brian was fascinated. A caped eel, he said. How did she know what it was saying? Patrick looked at his watch. Excuse me, Brian, he said abruptly, but I'm here with my sister and I'm supposed to meet her in a few minutes. Is she the one with the little red dress, cut really low? Patrick nodded. Brian put his arm around his new friend's shoulder. Let me give you some advice, he said. Somebody needs to talk to your sister. The way she acts around all the guys makes people think she's an easy lay. That's just Katie, Patrick said defensively. She's never been around anyone except the family. Sorry, Brian said with a shrug. It's none of my business anyway. Say, why don't you give me a call sometime? I've enjoyed our conversation very much. Patrick said goodbye to Brian and started walking toward the door. Where was Katie? Why had she not come back inside the gymnasium? He heard her loud laugh within seconds after he was outside. Katie was standing on the playground with three men, one of whom was Olaf Larsen. They were all smoking and laughing and drinking from a bottle that was being passed around. So, what position do you like best? A dark young man with a moustache asked. Oh, I prefer to be on top, Katie said with a laugh. She took a gulp from the bottle. That way I'm in control. Sounds good to me, the man, whose name was Andrew, replied. He chuckled and placed his hand suggestively on her bottom. Katie pushed it away, still laughing. Seconds later, she saw Patrick approaching. Come over here, baby brother, Katie shouted. This shit we're drinking is dynamite. The three men, who had been drawn in close around Katie, moved slightly away from her as Patrick walked towards them. Although he was still quite skinny and undeveloped, his height made him an imposing figure in the dim light. I'm going home now, Katie, Patrick said, refusing the bottle when he was beside her, and I think you should go with me. Andrew laughed. Some party girl you have here, Larson, he said sarcastically with a teenage brother as a chaperone. Katie's eyes flared with anger. She took another swig from the bottle and handed it to Olaf. Then she grabbed Andrew and kissed him wildly on the lips, pressing her body tightly against his. Patrick was embarrassed. Olaf and the third man cheered and whistled as Andrew returned Katie's kiss. After almost a minute, Katie pulled away. Let's go now, Patrick, she said with a smile, her eyes still fixed on the man she had kissed. I think that's enough for one night. Chapter 12 Eponine stared out the second-story window at the gently rolling slope. The GEDs covered the hillside, their fine gridwork pattern almost obscuring the brown soil underneath. So, yep, what you think? Kimberly asked. It's certainly nice enough. Once the forest is planted, we'll have trees and grass and maybe even a squirrel or two outside our window. That's definitely a plus. I don't know, a distracted Eponine replied after a few seconds. It's a little smaller than the one I liked yesterday in Positano. And I have a few misgivings about living here in Hakone. I haven't known that many Orientals. Look, Rumi, we can't wait forever. I told you yesterday that we should have made backup choices. There were seven pairs that wanted the apartment in Positano, not surprising since there were only four units left in the whole village, and we just weren't lucky. All that's left now, except for those tiny flats over the shops on the main street in Beauvoir, and I don't want to live there because there's absolutely no privacy, is either here or in San Miguel, and all the blacks and browns living in San Miguel. 
Eponine sat down in one of the chairs. They were in the living room of the small two-bedroom apartment. It was furnished modestly, but adequately, with two chairs and a large sofa that were the same brown colour as the rectangular coffee table. Altogether, the apartment, which had a single large bathroom and a small kitchen in addition to the living room and two bedrooms, was slightly more than one hundred square metres. Kimberly Henderson paced around the room impatiently. Kim, Eponine said slowly, I'm sorry, but I'm having a hard time concentrating on selecting an apartment when so much is happening to us. What is this place? Where are we? Why are we here? Her mind flashed back quickly to the incredible briefing three days earlier, when Commander Macmillan had informed them that they were inside a spaceship built and equipped by extraterrestrials for the purpose of observing earthlings. Kimberly Henderson lit a cigarette and expelled the smoke forcefully into the air. She shrugged. Shit, Eponine, she said. I don't know the answers to any of those questions. But I do know that if we don't pick an apartment, we'll be left with whatever nobody else has wanted. Eponine looked at her friend for several seconds and then sighed. I don't think this process has been very fair, she complained. The passengers from the Pinta and the Nina were all able to pick their homes before we even arrived. We are being forced to choose among the rejects. What did you expect? Kimberly replied quickly. Our ship was carrying convicts. Of course we got the dregs. But at least we are finally free. So, I guess you want to live in this apartment, Eponine said at length. Yes, replied Kimberly. And I also want to put in a bid on the other two apartments we saw this morning. Near the Hakone Market, in case we are aced out of this one. If we don't have a definite home after the drawing tonight, I'm afraid we'll really be in bad shape. This was a mistake, Eponine was thinking, as she watched Kimberly walking around the room. I should never have agreed to be her roommate, but what choice did I have? The living accommodations that are left for single people are abysmal. Eponine was not accustomed to rapid changes in her life. Unlike Kimberly Henderson, who had had an enormous variety of experiences before she was convicted of murder at the age of nineteen, Eponine had lived a relatively sheltered childhood and adolescence. She had grown up in an orphanage outside Limoges, France and until Professor Moreau took her to Paris to see the great museums when Eponine was seventeen, she had never even been outside her native province. It had been a very difficult decision for her to sign up for the Lowell colony in the first place. But Eponine was facing a lifetime of detention in Bourges, and she was offered a chance for freedom on Mars. After a long deliberation, she had courageously decided to submit her application to the ISA. Eponine had been selected as a colonist because she had an outstanding academic record, especially in all the arts, was fluent in English, and had been a perfect prisoner. Her dossier in the ISA files had identified her most likely placement in the Lowell Colony as drama and or art teacher in the secondary schools. Despite the difficulties associated with the cruise phase of the mission after leaving the Earth, Eponine had felt a palpable rush of adrenaline and excitement when Mars had first appeared in the observation window of the Santa Maria. It would be a new life on a new world. Two days before the scheduled encounter, however, the ISA guards had announced that the spacecraft was not going to deploy its landing shuttles as planned. Instead, they had told the convict passengers the Santa Maria was going to take a temporary detour to rendezvous with a space station orbiting Mars. Eponine had been both confused and concerned by the announcement. Unlike most of her associates, she had read carefully all the ISA material for the colonists, and she had never seen any mention of an orbiting space station around Mars. It had not been until the Santa Maria was completely unloaded and all the people and supplies were inside New Eden that anyone had really told Eponine and the other convicts what was happening. And, even after the Macmillan briefing, very few of the convicts believed they were being told the truth. Come on now, Willis Meeker had said. Does he really think we're that stupid? A bunch of E.T.'s built this place and all those crazy robots. This whole thing is a setup. We're just testing some new kind of prison concept. But Willis, Malcolm Peabody had replied, what about all the others? The ones who came on the Pinta and the Nina? I've talked to some of them. They're normal people. I mean, they aren't convicts. If your theory is right, what are they doing here? How the hell should I know, fag? I'm no genius. I just know that Macmillan dude is not giving us the straight shit. 
Eponine did not let her uncertainties about the Macmillan briefing deter her from going with Kimberley to Central City to submit requests for the three apartments in Hakone. They were fortunate in the drawing this time and were allocated their first choice. The two women spent a day moving into the apartment on the edge of Sherwood Forest and then reported to the employment office in the administrative complex for processing. Because the other two spacecraft had arrived well before the Santa Maria, the procedures to integrate the convicts into the life in New Eden were quite carefully defined. It took virtually no time to assign Kimberley, who really did have an outstanding nursing record, to the central hospital. Eponine interviewed with the school superintendent and four other teachers before accepting an assignment at Central High School. Her new job required a short commute by train, whereas she could have walked each day if she had decided to teach at Hackney Middle School. But Eponine thought it would be worth the trouble. She very much liked the principal and staff members who were teaching at the high school. At first, the other seven doctors working at the hospital were leery of the two convict physicians especially Dr. Robert Turner, whose dossier cryptically mentioned his brutal murders without detailing any of the extenuating circumstances. But after a week or so, during which time his extraordinary skill, knowledge and professionalism became apparent to everyone, the staff unanimously selected him to be the director of the hospital. Dr. Turner was quite astonished by his selection and pledged, in a brief acceptance speech, to dedicate himself completely to the welfare of the colony. His first official act was to propose to the provisional government that a full physical examination be given to every citizen of New Eden so that all the personal medical files could be updated. When his proposal was accepted, Dr. Turner deployed the Tiassos throughout the colony as paramedics. The Biots performed all the routine examinations and gathered data for the doctors to analyse. Simultaneously, remembering the excellent data network that had existed among all the hospitals in the Dallas metropolitan area, the indefatigable Dr. Turner began working with several of the Einsteins to design a fully computerized system for tracking the health of the colonists. One evening, during the third full week after the Santa Maria had docked with Rama, Eponine was home alone, as usual. Kimberly Henderson's daily pattern had already become established. She was almost never in the apartment. If she wasn't at work at the hospital, then she was out with Toshio Nakamura and his cronies. When her video phone sounded, it was Malcolm Peabody's face that appeared on the monitor. Eponine, he said shyly, I have a favour to ask. What is it, Malcolm? I received a call from a Dr. Turner at the hospital about five minutes ago. He says there were some irregularities in my health data taken by one of those robots last week. He wants me to come in for a more detailed examination. Eponine waited patiently for several seconds. I'm not following you, she said at length. What's the favour? Malcolm took a deep breath. It must be serious, Eponine. He wants to see me now. Will you come with me? Now, said Eponine, glancing at her watch. It's almost eleven o'clock at night. In a flash, he remembered Kimberly Henderson complaining that Dr. Turner was a workaholic as bad as those black robot nurses. Eponine also recalled the amazing blue of his eyes. All right, she said to Malcolm. I'll meet you at the station in ten minutes. Eponine had not been out much at night. Since her teaching appointment, she had spent most of her evenings working on her lesson plans. On one Saturday night, she had gone out with Kimberly, Toshio Nakamura, and several other people to a Japanese restaurant that had just opened. But the food was strange, the company mostly oriental, and several of the men, after drinking too much, made pathetic passes at her. Kimberly chided her for being picky and standoffish, but Eponine refused her roommate's later invitations to socialise. Eponine reached the station before Malcolm. While she was waiting for him to arrive, she marvelled at how completely the village had been transformed by the presence of humans. Let's see, she was thinking. The Pinta arrived here four months ago, the Nina five weeks after that. Already there are shops everywhere, both around the station and in the village itself. The accoutrements of human existence. If we stay here a year or two, this colony will be indistinguishable from Earth. Malcolm was quite nervous and talkative during the short train ride. I know it's my heart, Eponine, he said. I've been having sharp pains here ever since Walter died. At first I thought it was all in my mind. Don't worry, Eponine responded, comforting her friend. I bet it's nothing really serious. Eponine was having difficulty keeping her eyes open. 
It was after three o'clock in the morning. Malcolm was asleep on the bench beside her. What's that doctor doing, she wondered. He said he wouldn't be long. Soon after their arrival, Dr. Turner had examined Malcolm with a computerized stethoscope, and then, telling him he needed more comprehensive tests, had taken him into a separate part of the hospital. Eponine herself had seen the doctor only briefly when he had admitted Malcolm to his office at the beginning of the examination. Are you Mr. Peabody's friend? a voice suddenly said. Eponine must have been dozing. When her vision was in focus, the beautiful blue eyes were staring at her from only a meter away. The doctor looked tired and upset. Yes, Eponine said softly, trying not to disturb the man sleeping on her shoulder. He's going to die very soon, Dr. Turner said. Possibly in the next two weeks. Eponine felt her blood surge through her body. Am I hearing correctly, she thought. Did he say Malcolm was going to die in the next two weeks? Eponine was stunned. He will need a lot of support, the doctor was saying. He paused for a moment, staring at Eponine. Was he trying to remember where he had seen her before? Will you be able to help him? Dr. Turner asked. I... I hope so, Eponine answered. Malcolm began to stir. We must wake him up now, the doctor said. There was no emotion detectable in Dr. Turner's eyes. He had delivered his diagnosis, no, his assertion, without a hint of feeling. Kim is right. Eponine thought. He's as much an automaton as those Tiasso robots. At the doctor's suggestion, Eponine accompanied Malcolm down a corridor and into a room filled with medical instruments. Someone intelligent, Dr. Turner said to Malcolm, chose the equipment that was brought here from Earth. Although we are limited in staff, our diagnostic apparatus is first rate. The three of them walked over to a transparent cube about one meter on a side. This amazing device, Dr. Turner said, is called an organ projector. It can reconstruct with detailed fidelity almost all the major organs of the human body. What we are seeing now, when we look inside, is a computer graphic representation of your heart, Mr. Peabody, just as it appeared ninety minutes ago when I injected the tracer material into your blood vessels. Dr. Turner pointed at an adjacent room, where Malcolm had apparently undergone the tests. While you were sitting on that table, he continued, you were scanned a million times a second by the machine with the big lens. From the location of the tracer material and those billions of instantaneous scans, an extremely accurate three-dimensional image of your heart was constructed. That is what you are seeing inside the cube. Dr. Turner stopped a moment, looked away quickly, and then fixed his eyes on Malcolm. I'm not trying to make it harder on you, Mr. Peabody, he said quietly, but I wanted to explain how I am able to know what's wrong with you so that you will understand there has been no mistake. Malcolm's eyes were wild with fright. The doctor took him by the hand and led him to a specific position beside the cube. Look right there, on the back of the heart, near the top. Do you see the strange webbing and striation in the tissues? Those are your heart muscles, and they have undergone irreparable decay. Malcolm stared inside the cube for what seemed like an eternity, and then lowered his head. Am I going to die, doctor? he asked, meekly. Robert Turner took his patient's other hand. Yes, you are, Malcolm. On earth, we could possibly wait for a heart transplant. Here, however, it is out of the question, since we have neither the right equipment nor a proper donor. If you would like, I can open you up and take a first-hand look at your heart, but it's extremely unlikely that I would see anything that would change the prognosis. Malcolm shook his head. Tears began to run down his cheeks. Eponine put her arms around the little man and began to weep as well. I'm sorry it took me so long to complete my diagnosis, Dr. Turner said, but in a case this serious, I needed to be absolutely certain. A few moments later, Malcolm and Eponine walked toward the door. Malcolm turned around. What do I do now? he asked the doctor. Whatever you enjoy, Dr. Turner replied. When they were gone, Dr. Turner returned to his office, where hard-copy printouts of Malcolm Peabody's charts and files lay strewn across his desk. The doctor was deeply worried. He was virtually certain 
He could not know definitely until he had completed the autopsy that Peabody's heart was suffering from the same kind of malady that had killed Walter Brookeen on the Santa Maria. The two of them had been close friends for several years, going all the way back to the beginning of their detention terms in Georgia. It was unlikely that they had both coincidentally contracted the same heart disease. But if it was not a coincidence, then the pathogen must be communicable. Robert Turner shook his head. Any disease that struck the heart was alarming, but one that could be passed from one person to another. The spectre was terrifying. He was very tired. Before putting his head down on his desk, Dr. Turner made a list of the references on heart viruses that he wanted to obtain from the database. Then he fell quickly asleep. Fifteen minutes later, the phone aroused him suddenly. A Tiasso was on the other end, calling from the emergency room. Two Garcias have found a human body out in Sherwood Forest, it said, and are underway here now. From the images they have transmitted, I can tell that this case will require your personal involvement. Dr. Turner scrubbed his hands, put on his gown again, and reached the emergency room just before the two Garcias arrived with the body. As experienced as he was, Dr. Turner had to turn away from the horribly mutilated corpse. The head had been almost completely severed from the body. It was hanging by only a thin strand of muscle, and the face had been hacked and disfigured beyond recognition. In addition, in the genital area of the trousers there was a bloody, gaping hole. The pair of Tiassos immediately went to work, cleaning up the blood and preparing the body for autopsy. Dr. Turner sat on a chair, away from the scene, and filled out the first death report in New Eden. What was his name? he asked the Biots. One of the Tiassos rustled through what was left of the dead man's clothing and found his ISA identification card. Danny, the Biot replied. Marcello Danny. Epithalamian Chapter 1 The train from Positano was full. It stopped at the small station on the shores of Lake Shakespeare, halfway to Beauvoir, and disgorged its mixture of humans and biots. Many were carrying baskets of food and blankets and folding chairs. Some of the smaller children raced from the station out onto the thick, freshly mown grass surrounding the lake. They laughed and tumbled down the gentle slope that covered the hundred and fifty metres between the station and the edge of the water. For those who did not want to sit on the grass, wooden stands had been erected just opposite the narrow pier that extended fifty metres into the water before spreading out into a rectangular platform. A microphone, rostrum, and several chairs were set up on the platform. It was there that Governor Watanabe would deliver the settlement day address after the fireworks were finished. Forty metres to the left of the stands, the Wakefields and the Watanabes had placed a long table covered with a blue and white cloth. Finger foods were tastefully arranged on the table. Coolers underneath were filled with drinks. Their families and friends had gathered in the immediate area and were either eating, playing some kind of game, or engaged in animated conversation. Two Lincoln Biots were moving around the group, offering drinks and canapes to those who were too far away from the table and the coolers. It was a hot afternoon. Too hot, in fact, the third exceptionally warm day in a row. But as the artificial sun completed its mini-arc in the dome far above their heads, and the light began to slowly dim, the expectant crowd on the banks of Lake Shakespeare forgot about the heat. A final train arrived only minutes before the light disappeared completely. This one came from the central city station to the north, bringing colonists who lived in Hakone or San Miguel. There were not many latecomers. Most of the people had arrived early to set up their picnics on the grass. Eponine was on the last train. She had originally planned not to attend the celebration at all, but had changed her mind at the last minute. Eponine was confused when she stepped onto the grass from the station platform. There were so many people. All of New Eden must be here, she thought. For a moment she wished that she had not come. Everyone was with friends and family, and she was all alone. Ellie Wakefield was playing horseshoes with Benji when Eponine stepped off the train. She quickly recognised her teacher, even from the distance, because of her bright red armband. "'It's Eponine, mother,' Ellie said, running over to Nicole. "'May I ask her to join us?' "'Of course,' Nicole replied. A voice on the public address system interrupted the music being played by a small band to announce that the fireworks would begin in ten minutes. 
There was scattered applause. Eponine, Ellie shouted. Over here. Ellie waved her arms. Eponine heard her name being called, but could not see very clearly in the dim light. After several seconds, she started in Ellie's direction. Along the way, she inadvertently bumped into a toddler who was roaming by himself in the grass. Kevin, a mother shrieked, stay away from her! In an instant, a burly blonde man grabbed the little boy and held him away from Eponine. You shouldn't be here, the man said, not with decent people. I'm so glad to see you, Ellie said when she reached her teacher. Will you come have something to eat? Eponine nodded. I'm sorry for all these people, Ellie said in a voice loud enough for everyone around her to hear. It's a shame they are so ignorant. Ellie led Eponine back to the big table and made a general introduction. Hey, everybody, for those of you who don't know her, this is my teacher and friend Eponine. She has no last name, so don't ask her what it is. Eponine and Nicole had met several times before. They exchanged pleasantries now while a Lincoln offered Eponine some vegetable sticks and a soda. Nai Watanabe pointedly brought her twin sons, Kepler and Galileo, who had just had their second birthday the week before, over to meet the new arrival. A large nearby group of colonists from Positano was staring as Eponine lifted Kepler in her arms. Pretty, the little boy said, pointing at Eponine's face. It must be very difficult, Nicole said in French, her head nodding in the direction of the gawking bystanders. Oui, Eponine replied. Difficult, she thought. That's the understatement of the year. How about absolutely impossible? It's not bad enough that I have some horrible disease that will probably kill me. No, I must also wear an armband so that others can avoid me if they choose. Max Puckett glanced up from the chessboard and noticed Eponine. Hello, hello, he said. You must be the teacher I've heard so much about. That's Max, Ellie said, bringing Eponine over in his direction. He's a flirt, but he's harmless. And the older man who is ignoring us is Judge Pyotr Miskin. Did I say it correctly, Judge? Yes, of course, young lady, Judge Miskin replied, his eyes not leaving the chessboard. Damn it, Puckett. What in the world are you trying to do with that night? As usual, your play is either stupid or brilliant, and I can't decide which. The judge eventually looked up, saw Eponine's red armband, and scrambled to his feet. I'm sorry, miss. Truly sorry, he said. You are forced to endure enough without having to bear slights from this selfish old codger. A minute or two before the fireworks began, a large yacht could be seen approaching the picnic area from the western side of the lake. Brightly coloured lights and pretty girls decorated its long deck. The name Nakimura was emblazoned on the side of the boat. Above the main deck, Eponine recognised Kimberly Henderson, standing beside Toshio Nakamura at the helm. The party on the yacht waved at the people on the shore. Patrick Wakefield ran excitedly over to the table. Look, mother, he said, there's Katie on the boat. Nicole put on her glasses for a better look. It was indeed her daughter, in a bikini bathing suit, waving from the deck of the yacht. That's just what we need, Nicole mumbled to herself, as the first of the fireworks exploded above them, filling the dark sky with colour and light. Three years ago today, Kenji Watanabe began his speech, a scouting party from the Pinta first set foot in this new world. None of us knew what to expect. All of us wondered, especially during the two long months that we spent eight hours each day in the Somnarium, if anything resembling a normal life would ever be possible here in New Eden. Our early fears have not materialized. Our alien hosts, whoever they might be, have never once interfered with our lives. It may be true, as Nicole Wakefield and others have suggested, that they are continually observing us, but we do not feel their presence in any way. Outside our colony, the Rama spacecraft is rushing toward the star we call Tau Seti at an unbelievable speed. Inside, our daily activities are barely influenced by these remarkable external conditions of our existence. Before the days in the Somnarium, while we were still voyagers inside the planetary system that revolves around our home star, the Sun, many of us thought our observation period would be short. We believed that after a few months or so we would be returned to Earth, or maybe even our original destination, Mars, and that this third Rama spacecraft would disappear in the distant reaches of space, like its two predecessors. 
As I stand before you today, however, our navigators tell me that we are still moving away from our sun, as we have been for more than two and a half years, at approximately half the speed of light. If, indeed, it will be our good fortune some day to return to our own solar system, that day will be at least several years in the future. These factors dictate the primary theme of this, my last settlement day address. The theme is simple. Fellow colonists, we must take full responsibility for our own destiny. We cannot expect the awesome powers that created our worldlet in the beginning to save us from our mistakes. We must manage New Eden as if we and our children will be here forever. It is up to us to ensure the quality of life here, both now and for our future generations. At present there are a number of challenges facing the colony. Notice that I call them challenges, not problems. If we work together, we can meet these challenges. If we carefully weigh the long-term consequences of our actions, we will make the right decisions. But if we are unable to understand the concepts of delayed gratification and for the good of all, then the future of New Eden will be bleak. Let me take an example to illustrate my point. Richard Wakefield has explained, both on television and in public fora, how the master scheme that controls our weather is based on certain assumptions about the atmospheric conditions inside our habitat. Specifically, our weather control algorithm assumes that both the carbon dioxide levels and the concentration of smoke particles are less than a given magnitude. Without understanding exactly how the mathematics works, you can appreciate that the computations governing the external inputs to our habitat will not be correct if the underlying assumptions are not accurate. It is not my intent today to give a scientific lecture about a very complex subject. What I really want to talk about is policy. Since most of our scientists believe that our unusual weather the last four months is a result of unduly high levels of carbon dioxide and smoke particles in the atmosphere, my government has made specific proposals to deal with these issues. All of our recommendations have been rejected by the Senate. And why? Our proposal to impose a gradual ban on fireplaces which are totally unnecessary in New Eden in the first place, was called a restriction on personal freedom. Our carefully detailed recommendation to reconstitute part of the GED network, so that the loss of plant cover resulting from the development of portions of Sherwood Forest and the northern grasslands could be offset, was voted down as well. The reason? The opposition argued that the colony cannot afford the task and, in addition, that the power consumed by the new segments of the GED network would result in painfully stringent electricity conservation measures. Ladies and gentlemen, it is ridiculous for us to bury our heads in the sand and hope that these environmental problems will go away. Each time that we postpone taking positive action means greater hardships for the colony in the future. I cannot believe that so many of you accept the opposition's wishful thinking that somehow we will be able to figure out how the alien weather algorithms actually work and tune them to perform properly under conditions with higher levels of carbon dioxide and smoke particles. What colossal hubris! Nicole and Nye were both watching the reaction to Kenji's speech very carefully. Several of his supporters had urged Kenji to give a light, optimistic talk without any discussion of the crucial issues. The governor, however, had been firm in his determination to make a meaningful speech. He's lost them, Nye leaned over to whisper to Nicole. He's being too pedantic. There was definitely a restiveness in the stands, where approximately half the audience was now sitting. The Nakamura yacht, which had been anchored just offshore during the fireworks, had pointedly departed soon after Governor Watanabe began to speak. Kenji switched topics from the environment to the retrovirus RV-41. Since this was an issue that aroused strong passions in the colony, the audience's attention increased markedly. The governor explained how the new Eden medical staff, under the leadership of Dr. Robert Turner, had made heroic strides in understanding the disease, but still needed to perform more extensive research to determine how to treat it. He then decried the hysteria that had forced the passage of a bill, even over his veto, requiring all those colonists with RV-41 antibodies in their system to wear red armbands at all times. Boo! shouted a large group of mostly oriental picnickers on the other side of the stands from Nicole and Nye. These poor, unfortunate people face enough anguish, Kenji was saying. They're whores and fags! 
a man cried from behind the Wakefield Watanabe party. The people around him laughed and applauded. Dr. Turner has repeatedly affirmed that this disease, like most retroviruses, cannot be transmitted except by blood and semen. The crowd was becoming unruly. Nicole hoped that Kenji was paying attention and would cut his comments short. He had intended to discuss also the wisdom, or lack thereof, of expanding the exploration of Rama outside of New Eden, but he could tell that he had lost his audience. Governor Watanabe paused a second, and then issued an ear-splitting whistle into the microphone. That temporarily quieted all the listeners. I have only a few more remarks, he said, and they should not offend anyone. As you know, my wife Nye and I have twin sons. We feel that we are richly blessed. On this settlement day, I ask each of you to think about your children and envision another settlement day, a hundred or maybe even a thousand years into the future. Imagine that you are face to face with those whom you have begotten, your children's children's children. As you talk to them and hold them in your arms, will you be able to say that you did everything reasonably possible to leave them a world in which they had a good chance of finding happiness? Patrick was excited again. Just as the picnic was ending, Max had invited him to spend the night and the next day at the Puckett farm. The new term at the university doesn't start until Wednesday, the young man told his mother. May I go? Please. Nicole was still disturbed by the crowd's reaction to Kenji's speech and did not understand at first what her son was asking. After asking him to repeat his request, she glanced at Max. You take good care of my son? Max Puckett grinned and nodded his head. Max and Patrick waited until the Biots had finished cleaning up all the trash from the picnic and then headed for the train station together. Half an hour later, they were in the central city station, waiting for the infrequent train that served the farming region directly. Across the platform from them, a group of Patrick's college classmates were entering the train to Hakone. "'You should come!' one of the young men yelled to Patrick. "'Free drinks for everybody all night long!' Max watched Patrick's eyes follow his friends onto the train. "'Have you ever been to Vegas?' Max asked. "'No, sir,' he answered. "'My mother and father... Would you like to go? Patrick's hesitation was all Max needed. A few seconds later, they boarded the train to Hakone with all the merrymakers. I'm not terribly fond of the place myself, Max commented as they were riding. It seems too false, too superficial, but it's certainly worth seeing, and it's not a bad place to go for amusement when you're all alone. Slightly more than two and a half years earlier, very soon after the daily accelerations ended, Toshio Nakamura had correctly calculated that the colonists were likely to stay in New Eden and Rama for a long time, before even the first meeting of the Constitutional Committee and its selection of Nicole Desjardins Wakefield as provisional governor, Nakamura had decided that he was going to be the richest and most powerful person in the colony. Building on the convict support base he had established during the cruise from Earth to Mars on the Santa Maria, he expanded his personal contacts and was able, as soon as banks and currency had been created in the colony, to begin building his empire. Nakamura was convinced that the best products to sell in New Eden were those that provided pleasure and excitement. His first venture, a small gambling casino, was an immediate success. Next, he bought some of the farmland on the east side of Hakone and built the colony's initial hotel, along with a second, larger casino just off the lobby. He added a small, intimate club with female hostesses trained in the Japanese manner, and then a more raucous, girly club. Everything he did was successful. Parlaying his investments shrewdly, Nakamura was in a position, soon after Kenji Watanabe was elected governor, to offer to buy one-fifth of Sherwood Forest from the government. His offer allowed the Senate to forestall higher taxes that would otherwise have been required to pay for the initial RV-41 research. Part of the burgeoning forest was cleared and replaced with Nakamura's personal palace as well as a new, glittering hotel casino, an entertainment arena, a restaurant complex and several clubs. Consolidating his monopoly, Nakamura lobbied intensely and successfully for legislation that would limit gambling to the region around Hakone. His thugs then convinced all prospective entrepreneurs that nobody really wanted to enter the gambling business in competition with the King Jap. When his power was beyond attack, 
Nakamura permitted his associates to branch out into prostitution and drugs, neither of which were illegal in the New Eden society. Toward the end of the Watanabe term, when government policies began to conflict increasingly with his personal agenda, Nakamura decided he should control the government also. But he didn't want to be saddled with the boring job himself. He needed a dupe. So he recruited Ian Macmillan, the hapless ex-commander of the Pinta, who had been an also-ran in the first gubernatorial election, won by Kenji Watanabe. Nakamura offered Macmillan the governorship in exchange for the Scotsman's fealty. There was nothing even remotely like Vegas anywhere else in the colony. The basic New Eden architecture designed by the Wakefields and the Eagle had all been spare, functional in the extreme, with simple geometries and plain facades. Vegas was overdone, garish, inconsistent, a mishmash of architectural styles. But it was interesting, and young Patrick O'Toole was visibly impressed when he and Max Puckett entered the outside gates of the compound. Wow, he said, staring at the huge blinking sign above the portal. I don't want to diminish your appreciation any, my boy, Max said, lighting a cigarette. But the power required to operate that one sign would drive almost a square kilometre of GEDs. You sound like my mother and father, Patrick replied. Before entering the casino or any of the clubs, each person had to sign the master register. Nakamura missed no bets. He had a complete file on what every Vegas visitor had done every time he had come inside. That way, Nakamura knew which portions of his business should be expanded and, more importantly, the special and favoured vice, or vices, of each of his customers. Max and Patrick went into the casino. While they were standing by one of the two crap tables, Max tried to explain to the young man how the game worked. Patrick, however, could not keep his eyes off the cocktail waitresses in their scanty outfits. Ever been laid, boy? Max asked. Excuse me, sir? Patrick replied. Have you ever had sex? You know, in a course with a woman? No, sir, the young man answered. A voice inside Max's head told him that it was not his responsibility to usher the young man into the world of pleasure. The same voice also reminded Max that this was New Eden and not Arkansas, or otherwise he would have taken Patrick over to the Xanadu and treated him to his first sex. There were more than a hundred people in the casino, a huge crowd considering the size of the colony, and everyone seemed to be having fun. The waitresses were indeed dispensing free drinks just as fast as they could. Max grabbed a margarita and handed one to Patrick. I don't see any buyouts, Patrick commented. There aren't any in the casino, Max replied. Not even working the tables, where they would be more efficient than humans. The King Jab believes their presence inhibits the gambling instinct, but he uses them exclusively in all the restaurants. Max Puckett, well, I do declare. Max and Patrick turned around. A beautiful young woman in a soft pink dress was approaching them. I haven't seen you in months, she said. Hello, Samantha, Max said after being uncharacteristically tongue-tied for several seconds. And who is this handsome young man? Samantha said, batting her long eyelashes at Patrick. This is Patrick O'Toole, Max answered. He is... Oh, my goodness, Samantha exclaimed. I've never met one of the original colonists before. She studied Patrick for a few seconds before continuing. Tell me, Mr. O'Toole, she said. Is it really true that you went to sleep for years? Patrick nodded shyly. My friend Goldie says that the whole story is bullshit, that you and your family are really all agents for the IIA. She doesn't even believe that we have ever left Mars orbit. Goldie says all that dreary time in the tanks was also part of the hoax. I assure you, ma'am, Patrick politely responded, that my family did indeed sleep for years. I was only six years old when my parents put me in a berth. I looked almost like I do now the next time I woke up. Well, I find it fascinating, even if I don't know what to make of it all. So, Max, what are you up to? And by the way, are you going to officially introduce me? Oh, I'm sorry, Patrick. This is Miss Samantha Porter from the great state of Mississippi. She works at the Xanadu. I'm a prostitute, Mr. O'Toole, one of the very best. Have you ever met a prostitute before? Patrick blushed. No, ma'am, he said. Samantha put a finger under his chin. He's cute, she said to Max. Bring him over. 
if he's a virgin, I might do him for free. She gave Patrick a small kiss on the lips and then turned around and departed. Max couldn't think of anything appropriate to say after Samantha left. He thought about apologising but decided it wasn't necessary. Max put his arm around Patrick and the two of them walked toward the back of the casino, where the higher stakes tables were cordoned off. All right now, yo, cried a young woman with her back toward them. Five and six makes a yo. Patrick glanced over at Max with surprise. That's Katie, he said, hastening his step in her direction. Katie was completely absorbed in the game. She took a quick drag from a cigarette, belted down the drink she was handed by the swarthy man on her right, and then held the dice high above her head. All the numbers, she said, handing chips to the croupier. Here's twenty-six, plus five marks and the hard eight. Now, be there forty-four, she said, flinging the dice against the opposite end of the table with a flick of her wrist. Forty-four, the crowd around the table shouted in unison. Katie jumped up and down in her place, gave her date a hug, quaffed another drink, and took a long, languorous pull from her cigarette. Katie, Patrick said, just as she was about to throw the dice again. She stopped in mid-throw and turned around with a quizzical look on her face. Well, I'll be damned, she said. It's my baby brother. Katie stumbled over to greet him as the croupiers and other players at the table yelled for her to continue the game. You're drunk, Katie. Patrick said quietly, while he was holding her in his arms. No, Patrick, Katie replied, jerking herself backward toward the table. I am flying. I am on my own personal shuttle to the stars. She turned back to the craps table and raised her right arm high. All right now, yo. Are you in there, yo? She shouted. Chapter Two Again the dreams came in the early morning hours. Nicole woke up and tried to remember what she had been dreaming, but all she could recall was an isolated image here and there. Omer's disembodied face had been in one of her dreams. Her Sanufo great-grandfather had been warning her about something, but Nicole had not been able to understand what he was saying. In another dream, Nicole had watched Richard walk into a quiet ocean just before a devastating wave came rushing toward the shore. Nicole rubbed her eyes and glanced at the clock. It was just before four o'clock, almost the same time every morning this week, she thought. What do they mean? She stood up and crossed into the bathroom. Moments later, she was in the kitchen, dressed in her exercise clothes. She drank a glass of water. An Abraham Lincoln Biot, who had been resting immobile against the wall at the end of the kitchen counter, activated and approached Nicole. Would you like some coffee, Mrs. Wakefield? he asked, taking the empty water glass from her. No, Link, she answered. I'm going out now. If anyone wakes up, tell them I'll be back before six. Nicole walked down the hallway toward the door. Before leaving the house, she passed the study on the right-hand side of the corridor. Papers were strewn all over Richard's desk, both beside and on top of the new computer he had designed and constructed himself. Richard was extremely proud of his new computer, which Nicole had urged him to build, even though it was unlikely that it would ever completely replace his favourite electronic toy, the standard ISA pocket computer. Richard had religiously carried the little portable since before the launch of the Newton. Nicole recognised Richard's writing on some of the paper sheets, but could not read any of his symbolic computer language. He has spent many long hours in here recently, Nicole thought, feeling a pang of guilt, even though he believes that what he's doing is wrong. At first, Richard had refused to participate in the effort to decode the algorithm that governed the weather in New Eden. Nicole recalled their discussions clearly. We have agreed to participate in this democracy, she had argued. If you and I choose to ignore its laws, then we set a dangerous example for the others. This is not a law, Richard had interrupted her. It's only a resolution, and you know as well as I do that it's an incredibly dumb idea. You and Kenji both fought against it, and besides, aren't you the one who told me once that we have a duty to protest majority stupidity? Please, Richard, Nicole had replied. You may, of course, explain to everyone why you think the resolution is wrong, but this algorithm effort has now become a campaign issue. All the colonists know that we are close to the Watanabes. If you ignore the resolution, it will look as if Kenji is purposely trying to undermine... While Nicole was remembering her earlier conversation with her husband... Her eyes roamed idly around the study. She was somewhat surprised when her mind again focused on the present, 
to find that she was staring at three little figures on an open shelf above Richard's desk. Prince Hal, Falstaff, TV, she thought. How long has it been since Richard entertained us with you? Nicole thought back to the long and monotonous weeks after her family had awakened from their years of sleep. While they were waiting for the arrival of the other colonists, Richard's robots had been their primary source of amusement. In her memory, Nicole could still hear the children's mirthful laughter and see her husband smiling with delight. Those were simpler, easier times, she said to herself. She closed the door to the study and continued down the hall, before life became too complicated for play. Now your little friends just sit silently on the shelf. Out in the lane, underneath the streetlight, Nicole stopped for a moment beside the bicycle rack. She hesitated, looking at her bicycle, and then turned around and headed for the backyard. A minute later she had crossed the grassy area behind the house and was on the path that wound up Mount Olympus. Nicole walked briskly. She was very deep in thought. For a long time she paid no attention to her surroundings. Her mind jumped around from subject to subject, from the problems besetting New Eden to her strange dream patterns to her anxieties about her children, especially Katie. She arrived at a fork in the path. A small, tasteful sign explained that the path to the left led to the cable car station, eighty metres away, where one could ride to the top of Mount Olympus. Nicole's presence at the fork was electronically detected and prompted a Garcia buyout to approach from the direction of the cable car. Don't bother, Nicole shouted. I'm going to walk. The view became more and more spectacular as the switchbacks wound up the side of the mountain that faced the rest of the colony. Nicole paused at one of the viewpoints, five hundred metres in altitude and just under three kilometres walking distance from the Wakefield home, and looked out across New Eden. It had been a clear night, with little or no moisture in the air. No rain today, Nicole thought, noting that the mornings were always damp with water vapour on the days that showers fell. Just below her was the village of Beauvoir. The lights from the new furniture factory allowed her to identify most of the familiar buildings of her region, even from this distance. To the north, the village of San Miguel was hidden behind the bulky mountain. But out across the colony, far on the other side of a darkened central city, Nicole could discern the splashes of light that marked Nakamura's Vegas. She was instantly plunged into a bad mood. That damn place stays open all night long, she grumbled silently, using critical power resources and offering unsavoury amusements. It was impossible for Nicole not to think of Katie when she looked at Vegas. Such natural talent, Nicole remarked to herself, a dull heartache accompanying the image of her daughter. She could not help wondering if Katie was still awake in the glittering fantasy life on the other side of the colony. And such a colossal waste, Nicole thought, shaking her head. Richard and she had discussed Katie often. There were only two subjects about which they fought, Katie and New Eden politics. And it wasn't entirely accurate to say they fought about politics, Richard basically felt that all politicians, except Nicole and maybe Kenji Watanabe, were essentially without principles. His method of discussion was to make sweeping pronouncements about the insipid goings-on in the Senate, or even in Nicole's own courtroom, and then to refuse to consider the subject any more. Katie was another issue. Richard always argued that Nicole was much too hard on Katie. He also blames me, Nicole thought, as she gazed at the faraway lights, for not spending enough time with her. He contends my jumping into colony politics left the children with only a part-time mother at the most critical period of their lives. Katie was almost never at home anymore. She still had a room in the Wakefield house, but she spent most of her nights in one of the fancy apartments that Nakamura had built inside the Vegas compound. How do you pay the rent? Nicole had asked her daughter one night, just before the usual unpleasantness. How do you think, mother? Katie had answered belligerently. I work! I have plenty of time. I'm only taking three courses at the university. What kind of work do you do? Nicole had asked. I'm a hostess, an entertainer. You know, whatever is needed, Katie had answered vaguely. Nicole turned away from the lights of Vegas. Of course, she said to herself. It is entirely understandable that Katie is confused. She never had any adolescence. But still, she doesn't seem to be getting any better. Nicole started walking briskly up the mountain again, trying to dispel her mounting gloom. Between five hundred and a thousand metres in altitude, 
The mountain was covered with thick trees that were already five meters high. Here the path to the summit ran between the mountain and the outside wall of the colony in an extremely dark stretch that lasted for more than a kilometer. There was one break in the blackness, near the end, at a lookout point facing north. Nicole had reached the highest point in her ascent. She stopped at the lookout and stared across at San Miguel. There is the proof, she thought, shaking her head, that we have failed here in New Eden. Despite everything, there is poverty and despair in paradise. She had seen the problem coming, had even accurately predicted it toward the end of her one-year term as provisional governor. Ironically, the process that had produced San Miguel, where the standard of living was only half what it was in the other three New Eden villages, had begun soon after the arrival of the Pinta. That first group of colonists had mostly settled in the southeast village, which would later become Beauvoir, setting a precedent that was accentuated after the Nina reached Rama. As the free settlement plan was implemented, almost all the Orientals decided to live together in Hakone. The Europeans, white Americans and Middle Asians chose either Positano or what was left of Beauvoir. The Mexicans, other Hispanics, black Americans and Africans all gravitated towards San Miguel. As governor, Nicole had tried to resolve the de facto segregation in the colony with a utopian resettlement plan that would have allocated to each of the four villages racial percentages that mirrored the colony as a whole. Her proposal might have been accepted very early in the colony's history, especially right after the days in the Somnarium, where most of the other citizens viewed Nicole as a goddess, but it was too late after more than a year. Free enterprise had already created gaps in both personal wealth and real estate values. Even Nicole's most loyal followers realized the impracticality of her resettlement concept at that point. After Nicole's term as governor was completed, the Senate had resoundingly approved Kenji's appointment of Nicole as one of New Eden's five permanent judges. Nevertheless, her image in the colony suffered considerably when the remarks she had made in defense of the aborted resettlement plan became widely circulated. Nicole had argued that it was essential for the colonists to live in small, integrated neighborhoods to develop any real appreciation of racial and cultural differences. Her critics had thought that her views were hopelessly naive. Nicole stared at the twinkling lights of San Miguel for several more minutes as she warmed down from her strenuous climb up the mountain. Just before she turned around and headed back toward her home in Beauvoir, she suddenly recalled another set of twinkling lights from the town of Davos in Switzerland, back on the planet Earth. During Nicole's last ski vacation, she and her daughter Genevieve had had dinner on the mountain above Davos and, after eating, had held hands in the bracing cold out on the restaurant balcony. The lights of Davos had shone like tiny jewels many kilometres below them. Tears came into Nicole's eyes as she thought of the grace and humour of her first daughter, whom she had not seen for so many years. Thank you again, Kenji, she mumbled as she began to walk, recalling the photographs her new friend had brought from Earth, for sharing with me your visit with Genevieve. It was again black all around her, as Nicole wound back down the side of the mountain. The outer wall of the colony was now on her left. She continued to think about life in New Eden. We need special courage now, she said to herself. Courage and values and vision. But in her heart she feared the worst was still ahead for the colonists. Unfortunately, she reflected gloomily, Richard and I, and even the children, have remained outsiders, despite everything we have tried to do. It is unlikely that we will be able to change anything very much. Richard checked to ensure that the three Einstein biots had all properly copied the procedures and data that had been on the several monitors in his study. As the four of them were leaving the house, Nicole gave him a kiss. You are a wonderful man, Richard Wakefield, she said. You're the only one who thinks so, he replied, forcing a smile. I'm also the only one who knows, Nicole said. She paused for a moment. Seriously, darling, she continued, I appreciate what you're doing. I know. I won't be very late, he interrupted. The three AIs and I have only two basic ideas left to try. If we aren't successful today, we're giving up. With the three Einsteins following close behind him, Richard hurried down to the Beauvoir station and caught the train for Positano. The train stopped momentarily by the big park on Lake Shakespeare, where the settlement day picnic had been two months earlier. 
Richard and his supporting Biot cast disembarked several minutes later at Positano and walked through the village to the southwest corner of the colony. There, after having their identification checked by one human and two Garcias, they were allowed to pass through the colony exit into the annulus that circumscribed New Eden. There was one more brief electronic inspection before they reached the only door that had been cut in the thick external wall surrounding the habitat. It swung open, and Richard let the Biots into Rama itself. Richard had had misgivings when, eighteen months earlier, the Senate had voted to develop and deploy a penetrating probe to test the environmental conditions in Rama just outside their module. Richard had served on the committee that had reviewed the engineering design of the probe. He had been afraid that the external environment might be overwhelmingly hostile and that the design of the probe might not properly protect the integrity of their habitat. Much time and money had been spent guaranteeing that the boundaries of New Eden were hermetically sealed during the entire procedure, even while the probe was inching its way through the wall. Richard had lost credibility in the colony when the environment in Rama had turned out to be not significantly different from that in New Eden. Outside there was permanent darkness, and some small periodic variations in both atmospheric pressure and constituents, but the ambient Raman environment was so similar to the one in the colony that the human explorers did not even need their spacesuits. Two weeks after the first probe revealed the benign atmosphere in Rama, the colonists had completed the mapping of the area of the central plain that was now accessible to them. New Eden, and a second, almost identical rectangular construct to the south, which Richard and Nicole both believed to be a habitat for a second life form, were enclosed together in a larger, also rectangular region, whose extremely tall, metallic grey barriers separated it from the rest of Rama. The barriers on the north and south sides of this larger region were extensions of the walls of the habitats themselves. On both the east and west side of the two enclosed habitats, however, there were about two kilometres of open space. At the four corners of this outer rectangle were massive cylindrical structures. Richard and the other technological personnel in the colony were convinced that the impenetrable corner cylinders contained the fluids and pumping mechanisms whereby the environmental conditions inside the habitats were maintained. The new outer region, which had no ceiling except for the opposite side of Rama itself, covered most of the northern hemicylinder of the spacecraft. A large metal hut, shaped like an igloo, was the only building in the central plain between the two habitats. This hut was the control centre for New Eden, and was located approximately two kilometres south of the colony wall. When they exited from New Eden, Richard and the three Einsteins were headed for the control centre, where they had been working together for almost two weeks in an attempt to break into the master control logic governing the weather inside New Eden. Despite Kenji Watanabe's objection, the Senate had earlier appropriated funds for an all-out effort by the colony's best engineers to alter the alien weather algorithm. They had promulgated this legislation after hearing testimony from a group of Japanese scientists who had suggested that stable weather conditions could indeed be maintained inside New Eden, even with the higher levels of carbon dioxide and smoke in the atmosphere. It was an appealing conclusion for the politicians. If, perhaps, neither barring wood burning nor deploying a reconstituted GED network were truly required, and it was only necessary to adjust a few parameters in the alien algorithm that had, after all, been initially designed with some assumptions that were no longer valid, well then. Richard hated that kind of thinking. Avoid the issue as long as possible, he called it. Nevertheless, both because of Nicole's pleas and the total failure of the other colony engineers to understand any facet of the weather control process, Richard had agreed to tackle the task. He had insisted, however, that he work essentially alone, with only the Einsteins helping him. On the day that Richard planned to make his last attempt to decode the new Eden weather algorithm, he and his biots stopped first near a site one kilometre away from the colony exit. Under the large lights, Richard could see a group of architects and engineers working at a very long table. The canal will not be difficult to build. The soil is very soft. But what about sewage? Should we dig cesspools or haul the waste material back to New Eden for processing? The power requirement for this settlement will be substantial, not only the lighting because of the ambient darkness, but also all the appliances. In addition, we are far enough away from New Eden that we must account for non-trivial losses on the lines. Our best superconducting materials are too critical for this usage. 
Richard felt a mixture of disgust and anger as he listened to the conversations. The architects and engineers were conducting a feasibility study for an external village that could house the RV-41 carriers. The project, whose name was Avalon, was the result of a delicate political compromise between Governor Watanabe and his opposition. Kenji had permitted the study to be funded to show that he was open-minded on the issue of how to deal with the RV-41 problem. Richard and the three Einsteins continued down the path in a southerly direction. Just north of the control centre, they caught up with a group of humans and biots headed toward the second habitat probe site with some impressive equipment. Hi, Richard, said Marilyn Blackstone, the fellow Brit whom Richard had recommended to head the probe effort. Marilyn was from Taunton in Somerset. She had received her engineering degree from Cambridge in 2232 and was extremely competent. How's the work coming? Richard asked. If you have a minute, come take a look, Marilyn suggested. Richard left the three Einsteins at the control centre and accompanied Marilyn and her team across the central plain to the second habitat. As he was walking, he remembered his conversation with Kenji Watanabe and Dmitri Ulanov in the governor's office one afternoon before the probe project was officially approved. I want it understood, Richard had said, that I am categorically against any and all efforts to intrude upon the sanctity of that other habitat. Nicole and I are virtually positive that it harbours another kind of life. There is no argument for penetration that is compelling. Suppose it's empty, Dmitri had replied. Suppose the habitat has been placed there for us, assuming we are clever enough to figure out how to use it. Dmitri, Richard had almost shouted, have you listened to anything that Nicole and I have been telling you all these months? You are still clinging to an absurd, homocentric notion about our place in the universe. Because we are the dominant species on the planet Earth, you assume we are superior beings. We are not. There must be hundreds. Richard, Kenji had interrupted him in a soft voice. We know your opinion on this subject, but the colonists of New Eden do not agree with you. They have never seen the eagle, the octo spiders, or any of the other wonderful creatures that you talk about. They want to know if we have room to expand. Kenji was already afraid then. Richard was thinking, as he and the exploration team neared the second habitat. He's still terrified that Macmillan will beat Ulanov in the election and turn the colony over to Nakamura. Two Einstein biots began working as soon as the team arrived at the probe site. They carefully installed the compact laser drill in the spot where a hole in the wall had already been created. Within five minutes the drill was slowly expanding the hole in the metal. How far have you penetrated? Richard asked. Only about thirty-five centimetres so far, Marilyn replied. We're taking it very slowly. If the wall has the same thickness as ours, it will be another three or four weeks before we are all the way through. Incidentally, the spectrographic analysis of the wall parts indicates it's the same material as our wall. And once you've penetrated into the interior, Marilyn laughed. Don't worry, Richard. We're following all the procedures you recommended. We will have a minimum of two weeks of passive observation before we continue to the next phase. We'll give them a chance to respond, if they are indeed inside. The scepticism in her voice was obvious. Not you too, Marilyn, Richard said. What's the matter with everybody? Do you think Nicole and the children and I just made up all those stories? Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, she replied. Richard shook his head. He started to argue with Marilyn but he realised he had more important things to do. After a few minutes of polite engineering conversation, he walked back toward the control centre where his Einsteins were waiting. The great thing about working with the Einstein biots was that Richard could try many ideas at once. Whenever he had a particular approach in mind, he could outline it to one of the biots and have complete confidence that it would be implemented properly. The Einsteins never suggested a new method themselves, However, they were perfect memory devices and often reminded Richard when one of his ideas was similar to an earlier technique that had failed. All the other colony engineers attempting to modify the weather algorithm had tried first to understand the inner workings of the alien supercomputer that was located in the middle of the control centre. That had been their fundamental mistake. Richard, knowing a priori that the supercomputer's internal operation would be indistinguishable from magic to him, concentrated on isolating and identifying the output signals that emanated from the huge processor. After all, he reasoned, the basic structure of the process must be straightforward. Some set of measurements defines the conditions inside New Eden at any given time. 
The alien algorithms must use this measurement data to compute commands that are somehow passed to the huge cylindrical structures where the actual physical activity takes place that leads to modifications in the atmosphere inside the habitat. It did not take Richard long to draw a functional block diagram of the process. Because there were no direct electrical contacts between the control centre and the cylindrical structures, it was obvious that there was some kind of electromagnetic communication between the two entities. But what kind? When Richard scanned the spectrum to see at what wavelengths the communication was taking place, he found many potential signals. Analyzing and interpreting those signals was a little like looking for a needle in a haystack. With the Einstein biots helping him, Richard eventually determined that the most frequent transmissions were in the microwave bandwidth. For a week, he and the Einsteins catalogued the microwave exchanges, reviewing the weather conditions in New Eden both before and after, and trying to zero in on the specific parameter set, modulating the strength of the response on the cylinder side of the interface. During that week, Richard also tested and validated a portable microwave transmitter that he and the Biots had constructed together. His goal was to create a command signal that would look as if it had come from the control centre. His first serious attempt on the final day was a complete failure. Guessing that the accuracy of the timing of his transmission might be the problem, he and the Einsteins next developed a sequencing control routine that would enable them to issue a signal with femtosecond precision so that the cylinders would receive the command within an extremely tiny time slice. An instant after Richard had sent what he thought was a new set of parameters to the cylinders, a loud alarm sounded in the control centre. Within seconds, a wraith-like image of the eagle appeared in the air above Richard and the biots. Human beings, the holographic eagle said, be very careful. Great care and knowledge were used to design the delicate balance of your habitat. Do not change these critical algorithms unless there is a genuine emergency. Even though he was shocked, Richard acted immediately, ordering the Einsteins to record what they were seeing. The eagle repeated his warning a second time and then vanished, but the entire scene was stored in the video recording subsystems of the Biots. Chapter 3 Are you going to be depressed forever? Nicole asked, looking across the breakfast table at her husband. Besides, thus far nothing terrible has happened. The weather has been fine. I think it's better than before, Uncle Richard, Patrick offered. You're a hero at the university, even if some of the kids do think you're part alien. Richard managed a smile. The government is not following my recommendations, he said quietly, and is paying no heed whatsoever to the eagle's warning. There are even some people in the engineering office who are saying I created the hologram of the eagle myself. Can you imagine that? Kenji believes what you told him, darling. Then why is he letting those weather people continually increase the strength of the commanded response? They can't possibly predict the long-term effects. What is it you're worried about, father? Ellie asked a moment later. Managing such a large volume of gas is a very complicated process, Ellie and I have a great respect for the ETs who designed the new Eden infrastructure in the first place. They were the ones who insisted the carbon dioxide and particulate concentrations must be maintained below specified levels. They must have known something. Patrick and Ellie finished their breakfasts and excused themselves. Several minutes later, after the children had left the house, Nicole walked around the table and put her hands on Richard's shoulders. Do you remember the night we discussed Albert Einstein with Patrick and Ellie? Richard looked at Nicole with a furrowed brow. Later on that night, when we were in bed, I commented that Einstein's discovery of the relationship between matter and energy was horrible, because it led to the existence of nuclear weapons. Do you remember your response? Richard shook his head. You told me that Einstein was a scientist, whose life work was searching for knowledge and truth. There is no knowledge that is horrible, you said. Only what other human beings do with that knowledge can be called horrible. Richard smiled. Are you trying to absolve me of responsibility on this weather issue? Maybe, Nicole replied. She reached down and kissed him on the lips. I know that you are one of the smartest, most creative human beings who ever lived, and I don't like to see you carrying all the burdens of this colony on your shoulders. Richard kissed her back with considerable vigor. Do you think we can finish before Benji wakes up? Do you think we can finish before Benji wakes up? 
he whispered. He doesn't have school today, and he stayed up very late last night. Maybe, Nicole answered with a coquettish grin. We can at least try. My first case is not until ten o'clock. Eponine's senior class at Central High School, called simply Art and Literature, encompassed many aspects of the culture that the colonists had at least temporarily left behind. In her basic curriculum, Eponine covered a multicultural, eclectic set of sources, encouraging the students to pursue independent study in any specific areas they found stimulating. Although she always used lesson plans and a syllabus in her teaching, Eponine was the kind of instructor who tailored each of her classes to the interests of the students. Eponine herself thought Les Miserables by Victor Hugo was the greatest novel ever written, and the 19th-century Impressionist painter Pierre-Auguste Renoir, from her home city of Limoges, the finest painter who had ever lived. She included the works of both of her countrymen in the class, but carefully structured the rest of the source material to give fair representation to other nations and cultures. Since the Kawabata Bayots helped her each year with the class play, it was natural to use the real Kawabata's novels, A Thousand Cranes and Snow Country, as examples of Japanese literature. The three weeks on poetry ranged from Frost to Rilke to Omar Khayyam. However, the principal poetic focus was Benita Garcia, not only because of the presence of the Garcia Bayots all over New Eden, but also because Benita's poetry and life were both fascinating to young people. There were only eleven students in Eponine's senior class the year she was required to wear the red armband for having tested positive for RV-41 antibodies. The results of her test had presented the school administration with a difficult dilemma. Although the superintendent had courageously resisted the efforts of a strident group of parents, mostly from Hakone, who had demanded that Eponine be dismissed from the high school, he and his staff had nevertheless bowed somewhat to the hysteria in the colony by making Eponine's senior course optional. As a result, her class was much smaller than it had been in the previous two years. Ellie Wakefield was Eponine's favourite student. Despite the great gaps in the young woman's knowledge due to her years asleep on the trip back to the solar system from the node, her natural intelligence and hunger for learning made her a joy in the classroom. Eponine often asked Ellie to perform special tasks. On the morning that the class began its study of Benita Garcia, which was incidentally the same morning that Richard Wakefield had discussed with his daughter his worries about the weather control activities in the colony, Ellie had been asked to memorize one of the poems from Benita Garcia's first book, Dreams of a Mexican Girl, written when the Mexican woman was still a teenager. Before Ellie's recitation, however, Eponine tried to fire the imaginations of the young people with a short lecture on Benita's life. The real Benita Garcia was one of the most amazing women who ever lived, Eponine said, nodding at the expressionless Garcia bot in the corner, who helped her with all the routine chores of teaching. Poet, cosmonaut, political leader, mystic. Her life was both a reflection of the history of her time and an inspiration for everyone. Her father was a large landowner in the Mexican state of Yucatan, far from the artistic and political heart of the nation. Benita was an only child, the daughter of a Mayan mother and a much older father. She spent most of her childhood alone on the family plantation that touched the marvellous Puak Mayan ruins at Uxmal. As a small girl, Benita often played among the pyramids and buildings of that thousand-year-old ceremonial centre. She was a gifted student from the beginning, but it was her imagination and elan that truly separated her from the others in her class. Benita wrote her first poem when she was nine, and by the age of fifteen, at which time she was in a Catholic boarding school in the Yucatecan capital of Merida, two of her poems had been published on the prestigious Diario de Mexico. After finishing secondary school, Benita surprised her teachers and her family by announcing that she wanted to be a cosmonaut. In 2129, she was the first Mexican woman ever admitted to the Space Academy in Colorado. When she graduated four years later, the deep cutbacks in space had already begun. Following the crash of 2134, the world plunged into the depression known as the Great Chaos, and virtually all space exploration was stopped. Benita was laid off by the ISA in 2137 and thought that was her space career over. In 2144, one of the last interplanetary transport cruisers, the James Martin, limped home from Mars to Earth, carrying mostly women and children from the Martian colonies. The spacecraft was barely able to make it into Earth orbit, and it appeared as if all the passengers would die. 
Benita Garcia and three of her friends from the Cosmonaut Corps, Jerry rigged a rescue vehicle and managed to save 24 of the voyagers in the most spectacular space mission of all times. Ellie's mind floated free from Eponine's narrative and imagined how exhilarating it must have been on Benita's rescue mission. Benita had flown her space vehicle manually, without a lifeline to mission operations on the Earth, and risked her life to save others. Could there be any greater commitment to one's fellow members of the species? As she thought about Benita Garcia's selflessness, an image of her mother came into Ellie's mind. A montage of pictures of Nicole rapidly followed. First, Ellie saw her mother in her judge's robes, speaking articulately before the Senate. Next, Nicole was rubbing Ellie's father's neck in the study late at night, patiently teaching Benji to read day after day, riding off beside Patrick on a bicycle for a game of tennis in the park, or telling Link what to prepare for dinner. In the last image, Nicole was sitting on Ellie's bed late at night, answering questions about life and love. My mother is my hero, Ellie suddenly realized. She is as unselfish as Benita Garcia. Imagine, if you will, a young Mexican girl of sixteen, home from boarding school for vacation, climbing slowly up the steep steps of the Pyramid of the Magician in Uxmal. Below her, in the already warm spring morning, iguanas play among the rocks and the ruins. Eponine nodded at Ellie. It was time for her poem. She stood at her seat and recited. You have seen it all, old lizard. Seen our joys, our tears, our hearts full of dreams and terrible desires. And does it never change? Did my Indian mother's mother sit here on these steps one thousand years ago and tell to you the passions she would not, could not, share? At night I look unto the stars, and dare to see myself among them. My heart soars above these pyramids, flying free into the everything can be. Yes, Benita, the iguanas tell me, yes, to you and your mother's mother, whose yearning dreams years ago will now become fulfilled in you. When Ellie had finished, her cheeks were glistening from the silent tears that had fallen. Her teacher and the other students probably thought that she had been deeply moved by the poem and by the lecture on Benita Garcia. They couldn't have understood that Ellie had just experienced an emotional epiphany, that she had just discovered the true depth of her love and respect for her mother. It was the last week of rehearsals for the school play. Eponine had picked an old work, Waiting for Godot, by the twentieth-century Nobel laureate Samuel Beckett because its theme was so germane to life in New Eden. The two main characters, both dressed in rags throughout, were played by Ellie Wakefield and Pedro Martinez, a handsome nineteen-year-old who had been one of the troubled teenagers added to the colony contingent during the last months before launch. Eponine could not have produced the play without the Kawabatas. The Biots designed and created the sets and the costumes, controlled the lights, and even conducted rehearsals when she could not be present. The school had four Kawabatas altogether, and three of them were under Eponine's jurisdiction during the six weeks immediately preceding the play. "'Good work,' Eponine called out, approaching her students on the stage. "'Let's call it quits for today.' "'Miss Wakefield,' Kawabata number 052 said, "'there were three places where your words were not exactly correct. In your speech beginning—' "'Tell her tomorrow,' Eponine interrupted, gently waving the buyout away. "'It will mean more to her then.' She turned to face the small cast. Are there any questions? I know we've been through this before, Miss Eponine, Pedro Martinez said hesitantly. But it would help me if we could discuss it again. You told us that Godot was not a person, that he or it was actually a concept or a fantasy? That we were all waiting for something. I'm sorry, but it's difficult for me to understand exactly what. The whole play is basically a commentary on the absurdity of life, Eponine replied after a few seconds. We laugh because we see ourselves in those bums on the stage. We hear our words when they speak. What Beckett has captured is the essential longing of the human spirit. Whoever he is, Godot will make everything all right. He will somehow transform our lives and make us happy. Couldn't Godot be God? Pedro asked. Absolutely. Eponine said. 
or even the super-advanced extraterrestrials who built the Rama spacecraft and oversaw the node where Ellie and her family stayed. Any power or force or being that is a panacea for the woes of the world could be Godo. That's why the play is universal. Pedro! a demanding voice shouted from the back of the small auditorium. Are you almost finished? Just a minute, Mariko, the young man answered. We're having an interesting discussion. Why don't you come join us? The Japanese girl remained in the doorway. No, she said rudely. I don't want to. Let's go now. Eponine dismissed the cast, and Pedro jumped down from the stage. Ellie came over beside her teacher as the young man hurried toward the door. Why does he let her act that way? Ellie mused out loud. Don't ask me, Eponine replied with a shrug. I'm certainly no expert when it comes to relationships. That Kobayashi girl is trouble, Eponine thought, remembering how Mariko had treated both Ellie and her as if they were insects one night after rehearsal. Men are so stupid sometimes. Eponine, Ellie asked, do you have any objections if my parents come to the dress rehearsal? Beckett is one of my father's favorite playwrights, and that would be fine, Eponine replied. Your parents are welcome any time. Besides, I want to thank them. Miss Eponine, a young male voice shouted from across the room. It was Derek Brewer, one of Eponine's students who had a schoolboy crush on her. Derek ran a few steps toward her and then shouted again. Have you heard the news? Eponine shook her head. Derek was obviously very excited. Judge Mishkin has ruled the armbands unconstitutional. It took a few seconds for Eponine to absorb the information. By then Derek was at her side, delighted to be the one giving her the news. Are you certain? Eponine asked. We just heard it on the radio in the office. Eponine reached for her arm and the hated red band. She glanced at Derek and Ellie and with one swift movement pulled the band off her arm and tossed it into the air. As she watched it arc towards the floor, her eyes filled with tears. Thank you, Derek, she said. Within moments, Eponine felt four young arms embracing her. Congratulations, Ellie said softly. Chapter 4 The hamburger stand in Central City was completely run by Biots. Two Lincolns managed the busy restaurant, and four Garcias filled the customer orders. The food preparation was done by a pair of Einsteins, and the entire eating area was kept spotless by a single tiasso. The stand generated an enormous profit for its owner, because there were no costs except the initial building conversion and the raw materials. Ellie always ate there on the Thursday nights, when she worked at the hospital as a volunteer. On the day of what became known as the Mishkin Proclamation, Ellie was joined at the hamburger stand by her now bandless teacher, Eponine. I wonder why I've never seen you at the hospital, Eponine said as she took a bite of a French fried potato. What do you do there anyway? Mostly I talk to the sick children, Ellie replied. There are four or five with serious illnesses, one little boy even with RV-41, and they appreciate visits from humans. The Tiasso Biots are very efficient at operating the hospital and performing all the procedures, but they are not that sympathetic. If you don't mind my asking... Eponine said after chewing and swallowing a bite of her hamburger. Why do you do it? You are young, beautiful, healthy. There must be a thousand things you'd rather do. Not really, Ellie answered. My mother has a very strong sense of community, as you know, and I feel worthwhile after I talk to the kids. She hesitated a moment. Besides, I'm socially awkward. I'm physically nineteen or twenty, which is old for high school, but I have almost no social experience. Ellie blushed. One of my girlfriends in school told me that the boys are convinced I'm an extraterrestrial. Eponine smiled at her protégé. Even being an alien would be better than having RV-41, she thought. But the young men are really missing something if they're passing you by. The two women finished their dinner and left the small restaurant. They walked out into the central city square. In the middle of the square was a monument, appropriately cylindrical in shape that had been dedicated in the ceremonies associated with the first Settlement Day celebration. The monument was two and a half metres tall altogether. Suspended in the cylinder at eye level was a transparent sphere with a diameter of fifty centimetres. The small light at the centre of the sphere represented the sun, 
The plane parallel to the ground was the elliptic plane that contained the Earth and the other planets of the solar system, and the lights scattered throughout the sphere showed the correct relative positions of all the stars within a twenty light-year radius of the Sun. A line of illumination connected the Sun and Sirius, indicating the path that the Wakefields had taken on their odyssey to and from the node. Another tiny line of light extended from the solar system along the trajectory that had been followed by Rama III, since it had acquired the human colonists in Mars' orbit. The host spacecraft, which was represented by a large blinking red light, was currently in a position about one-third of the way between the sun and the star Tau Ceti. I understand the idea for this monument originally came from your father, Eponine said as the two women stood beside the celestial sphere. Yes, said Ellie. Father is really extremely creative where science and electronics are concerned. Eponine stared at the blinking red light. Does it bother him at all that we are going in a different direction? Not towards Sirius or the Node at all? Ellie shrugged. I don't think so, she said. We don't talk about it very much. He told me one time that none of us was capable of understanding what the extraterrestrials were doing anyway. Eponine glanced around her in the square. Look at all the people, hurrying here and there. Most of them never even stop to see where we are. I check our location at least once a week. She was suddenly very serious. Ever since I was diagnosed with RV-41, I have had a compulsive need to know exactly where I am in the universe. I wonder if that's part of my fear of dying. After a long silence, Eponine put her arm on Ellie's shoulder. Did you ever ask the eagle about death? she said. No. Ellie replied softly. But I was only four years old when I left the node. I certainly had no concept of death. When I was a child, I thought like a child. Eponine said to herself. She laughed. What did you talk to the eagle about? I don't recall exactly, Ellie said. Patrick told me that the eagle especially liked to watch us play with our toys. Really? Eponine said. That's a surprise. From your mother's description, I would have imagined the eagle was much too serious to be interested in play. I can still see him clearly in my mind's eye, Ellie said, even though I was so young. But I can't remember what he sounded like. Have you ever dreamed about him? Eponine asked a few seconds later. Oh, yes, many times. Once he was standing on top of a huge tree, looking down at me from the clouds. Eponine laughed again. Then she quickly checked her watch. Oh, my, she said. I'm late for my appointment. What time are you due at the hospital? Seven o'clock, Ellie said. Then we'd better be on our way. When Eponine reported to Dr. Turner's office for her bi-weekly checkup, the Tiasso in charge took her to the laboratory, obtained blood and urine specimens, and then asked her to take a seat. The buyer informed Eponine that the doctor was running behind. A dark black man with sharp eyes and a friendly smile was also sitting in the waiting room. Hello, he said when their eyes met. My name is Amando Diaba. I'm a pharmacist. Eponine introduced herself, thinking that she had seen the man before. Great day, huh? the man asked after a brief silence. What a relief to take off that cursed armband. Eponine now remembered Amadou. She had seen him once or twice in group meetings for the RV-41 sufferers. Someone had told Eponine that Armadou had contracted the retrovirus through a blood transfusion in the early days of the colony. How many of us are there altogether? Eponine thought. Ninety-three? Or is it ninety-four? Five of whom caught the disease through a transfusion. It seems that big news always happens in pairs, Amadou was saying. The Mishkin proclamation was announced only hours before the leggy things were seen for the first time. Eponine looked at him quizzically. What are you talking about? she asked. You haven't heard about the leggies yet? Amandu said, laughing slightly. Where in the world have you been? Amadou waited a few seconds before launching into an explanation. The exploration team over at the other habitat has been in the process of widening their penetration site for the last few days. Today they were suddenly confronted by six strange creatures who crawled out of the hole that had been made in the wall. These leggies, as the television reporter called them, apparently live in the other habitat. 
They look like hairy golf balls attached to six giant jointed legs, and they move very, very quickly. They crawled all over the men, the biots, and the equipment for about an hour. Then they disappeared back into the penetration site. Eponine was about to ask some questions about the leggies when Dr. Turner came out of his office. Mr. Diaba and Miss Eponine, he said, I have a detailed report for each of you. Who wants to be first? The doctor still had the most magnificent blue eyes. Mr. Diaba was here before me, Eponine replied. So, ladies always go first, Amadou interrupted, even in New Eden. Eponine went into Dr. Turner's inner office. So far, so good, the doctor told her when they were alone. You definitely have the virus in your system, but there's no sign of any heart muscle deterioration. I don't know why for certain, but the disease definitely progresses more rapidly in some than others. How can it be, my handsome doctor, Eponine thought, that you follow all my health data so closely, but never once have noticed the looks I've been giving you all this time? We'll keep you on the regular immune system medication. It has no serious side effects, and it may be partially responsible for our not seeing any evidence of the virus's destructive activities. Are you feeling all right otherwise? They walked back out to the waiting room together. Dr. Turner reviewed for Eponine the symptoms that would indicate the virus had moved to another stage in its development. While they were talking, the door opened and Ellie Wakefield came into the room. At first, Dr. Turner ignored her presence, but moments later he did an obvious double take. May I help you, young lady? he said to Ellie. I've come to ask Eponine a question, Ellie replied deferentially. If I'm disturbing you, I can wait outside. Dr. Turner shook his head and then was surprisingly disorganized in his final comments to Eponine. At first she did not understand what had happened. But when Eponine started to leave with Ellie, she saw the doctor staring at her student. For three years, Eponine thought, I have yearned to see a look like that in his eyes. I didn't think he was capable of it, and Ellie, bless her heart, missed it altogether. It had been a long day. Eponine was extremely tired by the time she walked from the station to her apartment in Hackney. The emotional release she had felt after removing her armband had passed. She was now a little depressed. Eponine was also fighting feelings of jealousy toward Ellie Wakefield. She stopped in front of her apartment. The broad red stripe on her door reminded everyone that an RV-41 carrier lived inside. Thanking Judge Mishkin again, Eponine carefully pulled off the stripe. It left an outline on the door. I'll paint it tomorrow, Eponine thought. Once in her apartment, she plopped down in her soft chair and reached for a cigarette. Eponine felt the surge of anticipatory pleasure as she put the cigarette in her mouth. I never smoke at school in front of my students, she rationalized. I do not set a bad example for them. I smoke only here, at home, when I'm lonely. Eponine hardly ever went out at night. The villagers in Hakone had made it very clear to her that they didn't want her in their midst. Two separate delegations had asked her to leave the village, and there had been several nasty notes on her apartment door. But Eponine had stubbornly refused to move. Since Kimberly Henderson was never there, Eponine had much more living space than she would have been able to afford under normal circumstances. She also knew that an RV-41 carrier would not be welcomed in any neighborhood in the colony. Eponine had fallen asleep in her chair and was dreaming of fields of yellow flowers. She almost didn't hear the knock, even though it was very loud. She glanced at her watch. It was eleven o'clock. When Eponine opened the door, Kimberly Henderson entered the apartment. Oh, Ep, she said, I'm so glad you're here. I need to talk to someone desperately, someone I can trust. Kimberly lit a cigarette with a jerky motion and immediately burst into a rambling monologue. Yes, yes, I know, Kimberly said, seeing the disapproval in Eponine's eyes. You're right, I'm stoned, but I needed it. Good old Kokomo. Artificial feelings of self-confidence are at least better than thinking of yourself as a piece of shit. She took a frantic drag and exhaled the smoke in short, choppy bursts. The asshole has really done it this time, Ep. He's pushed me over the brink cocky son of a bitch. Thinks he can do whatever he wants. I tolerated his affairs and even let some of the younger girls join me sometimes. The threesomes relieved the boredom. But I was always Ichiban, numero uno, or at least I thought I was. Kimberly stubbed out her cigarette and began to wring her hands. She was close to tears. So tonight he tells me I'm moving. 
What? I say. What you mean? You're moving, he says. No smile, no discussion. Pack your things, he says. There's an apartment for you over behind Xanadu. That's where the whores live, I answer. He smiles a little and says nothing. That's it. I'm dismissed, I say. I flew into a rage. You can't do this, I said. I tried to hit him, but he grabbed my hand and smacked me hard on the face. You'll do as I order, he says. I will not, you motherfucker. I picked up a vase and threw it. It smashed into a table and shattered. In seconds, two men had pinned my arms behind me. Take her away, the King Jap said. They took me to my new apartment. It was very nice. In the dressing room was a large box of rolled Kokomo. I smoked an entire number and was flying. Hey, I said to myself, this is not so bad. At least I don't have to cater to Toshio's bizarre sexual desires. I went over to the casino and was having fun. Higher than a kite. Until I saw them. Out in public in front of everybody else. I went wild, hollering, screaming, cursing. I even attacked her. Somebody hit me in the head. I was down on the casino floor with Toshio bending over me. If you ever do anything like that again, he hissed, you'll be buried beside my cello Danny. Kimberly put her face in her hands and started to sob. Oh, Ep, she said seconds later. I feel so helpless. I have nowhere to turn. What can I do? Before Eponine could say anything, Kimberly was talking again. I know, I know, she said. I could go back to work at the hospital. They still need nurses, real ones. By the way, where's your Lincoln? Eponine smiled and pointed to the closet. Good for you, Kimberly laughed. Keep the robot in the dark. Bring him out to clean the bathroom, wash the dishes, cook the meals, then whoosh, back in the closet. She chuckled. Their dicks don't work, you know. I mean, they have one, or sort of, anectabically perfect and all, but they don't get hard. One night when I was stoned and alone, I had one mount me, but he didn't know what I meant when I said thrust. As bad as some men I've known. Kimberly jumped up and paced around the room. I'm not really sure why I came, she said, lighting another cigarette. I thought maybe you and I, I mean, we were friends for a while. Her voice trailed off. I'm coming down now, starting to feel depressed. It's awful, terrible. I can't stand it. I don't know what I expected, but you have your own life. I'd better be going. Kimberly crossed the room and gave Eponine a perfunctory hug. Take care now, okay? Kimberly said. Don't worry about me. I'll be all right. It was only after the door closed and Kimberly left that Eponine realized she had not uttered one word while her ex-friend was in the room. Eponine was certain that she would never see Kimberly again. Chapter 5 It was an open meeting of the Senate, and anyone in the colony could attend. The gallery had only three hundred seats, and they were all filled. Another hundred people were standing along the walls and sitting in the aisles. On the main floor, the twenty-four members of the New Eden legislative body were called to attention by their presiding officer, Governor Kenji Watanabe. Our budget hearings continue today. Kenji said after striking the gavel several times to quiet the onlookers. With a presentation by the director of the New Eden Hospital, Dr. Robert Turner. He will summarize what was accomplished with the health budget last year and present his requests for the coming year. Dr. Turner walked to the rostrum and motioned to the two Tiassos who had been sitting beside him. The Biots quickly set up a projector and a suspended cube screen for the visual material that would support Dr. Turner's talk. We have made great strides in the last year, Dr. Turner began, both in building a solid medical environment for the colony and in understanding our nemesis, the RV-41 retrovirus that continues to plague our populace. During the last 12 months, not only have we completely determined the life cycle of this complex organism, but also we have developed screening tests that allow us to identify accurately any and all persons who carry the disease. Everyone in New Eden was tested during a three-week period that ended seven months ago. Ninety-six individuals in the colony were identified as being infected with the retrovirus at that time. Since the completion of the testing, only one new carrier has been found. There have been three deaths from RV-41 during the interim, so our current infected population is 94. RV-41 is a deadly retrovirus that attacks the muscles of the heart, causing them to atrophy irreversibly. 
Ultimately, the human carrier dies. There is no known cure. We are experimenting with a variety of techniques for remitting the progression of the disease and have recently had some sporadic but inconclusive success. At this moment, until we score a significant breakthrough in our work, we must reluctantly assume that all individuals afflicted by the retrovirus will eventually succumb to its virulence. The chart I'm placing on the projection cube shows the various stages of the disease. The retrovirus is passed between individuals during a sharing of bodily fluids involving any combination of semen and blood. There is no indication that there is any other method of transfer. I repeat, Dr. Turner said, now shouting to be heard above the hubbub of the gallery. We have verified passage only where semen or blood is involved. We cannot categorically declare that other bodily fluids such as sweat, mucus, tears, saliva, and urine cannot be agents in the transfer, but our data thus far strongly suggests that RV-41 cannot be passed in these fluids. The talking in the gallery was now widespread. Governor Watanabe struck his gavel several times to quiet the room. Robert Turner cleared his throat and then continued. This particular retrovirus is very clever, if I can use that word, and especially well adapted to its human host. As you can see from the diagram on the cube, it is relatively benign in its first two stages, when it essentially just resides, without harm, inside the blood and semen cells. It may be that during this time it has already begun its attack on the immune system. We cannot say for certain, because during this stage, all diagnostic data shows that the immune system is healthy. We do not know what triggers the decline of the immune system. Some inexplicable process in our complex bodies, and here is an area where we need to do more intensive research, suddenly signals to the RV-41 virus that the immune system is vulnerable, and a mighty attack begins. The virus density in the blood and semen suddenly rises by several orders of magnitude. This is when the disease is the most contagious, and also when the immune system is overwhelmed. Dr. Turner paused. He shuffled the papers from which he was reading before continuing. It is curious that the immune system never survives this attack. Somehow, RV-41 knows when it can win, and never multiplies until that particular condition of vulnerability has been reached. Once the immune system is destroyed, the atrophy of the heart muscles begins, and a predictable death follows. In the latest stages of the disease, the RV-41 retrovirus disappears completely from the semen and the blood. As you can well imagine, this vanishing wreaks havoc with the diagnostic process. Where does it go? Does it hide in some way, become something else we have not yet identified? Is it supervising the gradual destruction of the heart muscles, or is the atrophy simply a side effect of the earlier attack on the immune system? All these questions we cannot answer at the present time. The doctor stopped momentarily for a drink of water. Part of our charter last year, he then said, was to investigate the origin of this disease. There have been rumors that RV-41 was somehow indigenous to New Eden, perhaps placed here as some kind of diabolical extraterrestrial experiment. That kind of talk is complete nonsense. We definitely brought this retrovirus here from the Earth. Two passengers on the Santa Maria died from RV-41 within three months of each other. The first during the cruise from Earth to Mars. We can be certain, although this is hardly encouraging, that our friends and colleagues back on Earth are struggling with this devil as well. As for the origin of RV-41, here I can only speculate. If the medical database that we had brought along from Earth had been an order of magnitude larger, then perhaps I would be able to identify its origin without any guessing. Nevertheless, I will point out that the genome of this RV-41 retrovirus is astonishingly similar to a pathogen genetically engineered by humans as part of the vaccine envelope testing performed in the early years of the 22nd century. Let me explain in more detail. After the successful development of preventative vaccines for the AIDS retrovirus, which was a horrible scourge during the last two decades of the 20th century, medical technology took advantage of biological engineering to expand the range of all the available vaccines. Specifically, the biologists and the doctors purposely engineered new and more deadly retroviruses and bacteria to prove that a given vaccine class had a broad range of successful application. All this work was done, of course, under careful controls and at no risk to the populace. 
When the great chaos occurred, however, research monies were severely cut, and many of the medical laboratories had to be abandoned. The dangerous pathogens stored in isolated spots around the world were presumably all destroyed, unless, and here is where my speculation enters into the explanation, the retrovirus that is afflicting us here in New Eden is amazingly similar to the AQT-19 retrovirus engineered in 2107 at the Lafont Medical Laboratory in Senegal. It is possible, I will admit, that a naturally occurring agent could have a genome similar to AQT-19, and therefore my speculation could be wrong. However, it is my belief that all the AQT-19 in that abandoned lab in Senegal was not destroyed. I am convinced that this particular retrovirus somehow survived and mutated slightly in the subsequent century, perhaps by living in simian hosts, and eventually found its way into human beings. In that case, we are the ultimate creators of the disease that is killing us. There was an uproar in the gallery. Governor Watanabe again gaveled the audience to quiet, privately wishing that Dr. Turner had kept his conjectures to himself. At this point, the hospital director began his discussion of all the projects for which funding was needed in the coming year. Dr. Turner was requesting an appropriation double what his department had had in the past year. There was an audible groan on the Senate floor. The several speakers who immediately followed Robert Turner were really just window dressing. Everyone knew that the only other important speech of the day would be given by Ian Macmillan, the opposition candidate for governor in the elections three months hence. It was understood that both the current governor, Kenji Watanabe, and the choice of his political party, Dmitry Ulanov, favoured a significant increase in the medical budget, even if new taxes were required to finance it. Macmillan was reportedly opposed to any increase in Dr. Turner's funds. Ian Macmillan had been soundly defeated by Kenji Watanabe in the first general election held in the colony. Since that time, Mr. Macmillan had moved his residence from Beauvoir to Hakone, had been elected to the Senate from the Vegas district, and had taken a lucrative position in Toshio Nakamura's expanding business empire. It was the perfect marriage. Nakamura needed someone acceptable to run the colony for him, and Macmillan, who was an ambitious man without any clearly defined values or principles, wanted to be governor. It is too easy, Ian Macmillan began reading his speech, to listen to Dr. Turner, and then to open our hearts and purses, allocating funds for all his requests. That's what is wrong with these budget hearings. Each department head can make a strong case for his proposals. But by listening to each item separately, we lose sight of the larger picture. I do not mean to suggest that Dr. Turner's program is anything but worthy. However, I do think that a discussion of priorities is warranted at this time. Macmillan's speaking style had improved considerably since he had moved to Hakuni. He had obviously been carefully coached. However, he was not a natural orator so at times his practiced gestures seemed almost comical. His primary point was that the RV-41 carriers made up less than 5% of the population of New Eden, and the cost of helping them was incredibly expensive. Why should the rest of the citizens of the colony be forced to suffer deprivation for the benefit of such a small group, he said. Besides, he added, there are other, more compelling issues that require added monies, issues that touch each and every colonist and will likely impact our very survival. When Ian Macmillan presented his version of the story about the leggies that had rushed out of the adjoining module in Rama and frightened the colony exploration team, he made it sound as if their attack had been the first foray in a planned interspecies war. Macmillan raised the spectre of the leggies being followed by more fearsome creatures that would terrify the colonists, especially the women and children. Money for defence, he said, as money spent for all of us. Candidate Macmillan also suggested that environmental research was another activity, far more important for the general welfare of the colony, than the medical programme outlined by Dr. Turner. He praised the work being done to control the environment, and envisioned a future where the colonists would have complete knowledge of the coming weather. His speech was interrupted by applause from the gallery many times. When he did finally discuss the individuals suffering from RV-41, Mr. Macmillan outlined a more cost-effective plan to deal with their terrible tragedy. We will create a new village for them, he intoned, outside of New Eden, where they can live out their final days in peace. 
In my opinion, he said, the RV-41 medical effort in the future should be restricted to isolating and identifying all the mechanisms by which this scourge is passed from individual to individual. Until this research is completed, it is in the best interests of everyone in the colony, including the unfortunate people who carry the disease, to quarantine the carriers so that there can be no more accidental contamination. Nicole and her family were all in the gallery. They had badgered Richard into coming, even though he disliked political gatherings. Richard was disgusted by Macmillan's speech. For her part, Nicole was frightened. What the man was saying had a certain appeal. I wonder who is writing his material, she thought at the conclusion of his speech. She chastised herself for having underestimated Nakamura. Toward the end of Macmillan's oration, Ellie Wakefield quietly left her place in the gallery. Her parents were astonished, a few moments later, to see her down on the Senate floor, approaching the rostrum. So were the other members of the gallery, who had thought that Ian Macmillan was the last speaker of the day. Everyone was preparing to depart. Most of them sat down again when Kenji Watanabe introduced Ellie. In our civics class, in high school, she started, her nervousness apparent in her voice. We have been studying the colony constitution and the Senate procedures. It is a little-known fact that any citizen of New Eden may address one of these open hearings. Ellie took a deep breath before continuing. In the gallery, both her mother and her teacher, Eponine, leaned forward and grabbed the rail in front of them. I wanted to speak today, Ellie said more forcefully, because I believe I have a unique point of view on this issue of the RV-41 sufferers. First, I am young, and second, until a little over three years ago, I had never had the privilege of interacting with a human being other than my family. For both those reasons, I treasure human life. My word was picked carefully. A treasure is something you value greatly. This man, this incredible doctor who works all day and sometimes all night to keep us healthy, obviously treasures human life as well. When he spoke earlier, Dr. Turner didn't tell you why we should fund his program, only what the disease was and how he would try to combat it. He assumed you all understood why. After listening to Mr. Macmillan, Ellie said, glancing at the previous speaker. I have some doubts. We must continue to study this horrible disease until we can contain and control it, because a human life is a precious commodity. Each individual person is a unique miracle, an amazing combination of complex chemicals with special talents, dreams, and experiences. Nothing can be more important to the overall colony than an activity aimed at the preservation of human life. I understand from the discussion today that Dr. Turner's program is expensive. If taxes must be raised to pay for it, then perhaps each of us will have to do without some special item that we wanted. It is a small enough price to pay for the treasure of another human's company. My family and friends tell me sometimes that I am hopelessly naive. That may be true. But perhaps my innocence allows me to see things more clearly than other people can. In this case, I believe there is only one question that needs to be asked. If you, or some member of your family, had been diagnosed with RV-41, would you support Dr. Turner's program? Thank you very much. There was an eerie silence as Ellie stepped away from the rostrum. Then, thunderous applause erupted. Tears flowed in both Nicole's and Eponine's eyes. On the Senate floor... Dr. Robert Turner reached both his hands out to Ellie. Chapter 6 When Nicole opened her eyes, Richard was sitting beside her on the bed. He was holding a cup of coffee. You told us to wake you at seven, he said. She sat up and took the coffee from him. Thank you, darling, Nicole said. But why didn't you let Link? I decided to bring your coffee myself. There is news from the central plain again. I wanted to discuss it with you, even though I know how you dislike being jabbered at first thing in the morning. Nicole took a long, slow sip from her cup. She smiled at her husband. What's the news? she said. There were two more leggy incidents last night. That makes almost a dozen this week. Our defense forces reportedly destroyed three leggies who were harassing the engineering crew. Did the leggies make any attempt to fight back? No, they didn't. At the first sound of gunfire, they raced for the hole in the other habitat. Most of them escaped, 
as they did the day before yesterday. And you still think they're remote observers, like the spider bots in Ramas 1 and 2? Richard nodded. And you can just imagine what kind of a picture the others are developing of us. We fire on unarmed creatures without provocation. We react in a hostile manner to what is certainly an attempt at contact. I don't like it either, Nicole said softly. But what can we do? The Senate explicitly authorized the exploration teams to defend themselves. Richard was about to reply when he noticed Benji standing in the doorway. The young man was smiling broadly. May I come in, mother? he asked. Of course, dear, Nicole replied. She opened her arms wide. Come give me a big birthday hug. Happy birthday, Benji, Richard said, as the boy, who was larger than most men, crawled onto the bed and embraced his mother. Thank you, Uncle Richard. Are we still having a picnic in Sherwood Horace today? Benji asked slowly. Yes, indeed, his mother answered. And then tonight we are having a big party. Hooray, Benji said. It was a Saturday. Patrick and Ellie were both sleeping late because they did not have classes. Link served breakfast to Richard, Nicole and Benji, while the adults watched the morning news on television. There was a short film of the most recent leggy confrontation near the second habitat, as well as comments from both of the gubernatorial candidates. As I have been saying for weeks now, Ian McMillan remarked to the television reporter, we must dramatically expand our defence preparations. We have finally started to upgrade the weapons available to our forces, but we need to move more boldly in this arena. An interview with the weather director concluded the morning news. The woman explained that the unusually dry and windy recent weather had been caused by a modelling error in their computer simulation. All week long, she said, we have been trying unsuccessfully to create rain. Now, of course, since it's the weekend, we have programmed sunshine, but we promise it will rain next week. They don't have the slightest idea what they're doing, Richard grumbled, switching off the television. They're overcommanding the system and generating chaos. What's chaos, Uncle Richard? Benji asked. Richard hesitated for a moment. I guess the simplest definition is the absence of order. But in mathematics, the word has a more precise meaning. It is used to describe unbounded responses to small perturbations. Richard laughed. I'm sorry, Benji. Sometimes I talk in scientific gobbledygook. Benji smiled. I like it when you talk to me as if I'm normal, he said carefully. And sometimes I do understand a little. Nicole seemed preoccupied while Link was clearing the breakfast dishes off the table. When Benji left the room to brush his teeth, she leaned toward her husband. Have you talked to Katie? she asked. She didn't answer her phone yesterday afternoon or last night. Richard shook his head. Benji will be crushed if she doesn't show up for his party. I'm going to send Patrick off to find her this morning. Richard stood up from his chair and walked around the table. He reached down and took Nicole's hand. And what about you, Mrs. Wakefield? Have you scheduled some rest and relaxation anywhere in your busy program? After all, it is the weekend. I'm going by the hospital this morning to help train the two new paramedics. Then Ellie and I will leave here with Benji at ten. On the way back, I'll stop by the courtroom. I haven't even read the submitted briefs for the cases on Monday. I have a quick meeting with Kenji at 2.30 and my pathology lecture at 3. I should be home by 4.30. Which will give you just enough time to organize Benji's party. Really, darling, you need to slow down. After all, you're not a biot. Nicole kissed her husband. You should talk. Aren't you the one who works twenty or thirty straight hours when you're involved in an exciting project? She stopped a moment and became serious. All this is very important, darling. I feel we're at a cusp in the affairs of the colony and that I really am making a difference here. No question, Nicole. You are definitely having an impact. But you never have any time for yourself. That's a luxury item, Nicole said opening the door to Patrick's room, to be savoured in my later years. As they emerged from the trees into the wide meadow, rabbits and squirrels scurried out of their way. On the opposite side of the meadow, quietly eating in the middle of a patch of tall purple flowers, was a young stag. He turned his head of new antlers toward Nicole, Ellie and Benji as they approached him, and then bounded away into the forest. Nicole consulted her map, 
There should be some picnic tables here somewhere, right beside the meadow. Benji was kneeling down over a group of yellow flowers that were full of bees. Honey, he said with a smile. Bees make honey in their hives. After several minutes, they located the tables and spread out a cloth on top of one of them. Link had packed sandwiches. Benji liked peanut butter and jelly best, plus fresh oranges and grapefruit from the orchards near San Miguel. While they were eating lunch, another family traipsed through the other side of the meadow. Benji waved. Those people don't know it's my birthday, he said. But we do, Ellie said, raising her cup full of lemonade to make a toast. Congratulations, brother. Just before they were finished eating, a small cloud passed overhead, and the bright colours of the meadow momentarily dimmed. That's an unusually dark cloud, Nicole commented to Ellie. Nicole commented to Ellie. Moments later, it was gone, and the grasses and flowers were again bathed in sunlight. Do you want your pudding now? Nicole asked Benji. Or do you want to wait? Let's play catch first. Benji replied. He took the baseball equipment out of the picnic bag and handed a glove to Ellie. Let's go, he said, running out into the meadow. While her two children were throwing the baseball back and forth, Nicole cleaned up the remains of their lunch. She was about to join Ellie and Benji when she heard the alarm on her wrist radio. She pressed the receive button and the digital time display was replaced with a television picture. Nicole turned up the volume so that she could hear what Kenji Watanabe had to say. I'm sorry to bother you, Nicole, Kenji said, but we have an emergency. A rape complaint has been filed, and the family wants an indictment immediately. It's a sensitive case in your jurisdiction, and I think it should be handled now. I don't want to say anything else on the line. I'll be there in half an hour, Nicole responded. At first, Benji was crestfallen that his picnic was going to be cut short. However, Ellie convinced her mother that it was all right for her to stay in the forest with Benji for another couple of hours. Just as she departed from the meadow, Nicole handed the map of Sherwood Forest to Ellie. At that moment, another, larger cloud moved in front of the artificial New Eden sun. There was no sign of any life at Katie's apartment. Patrick was temporarily stymied. Where should he look for her? None of his university friends lived in Vegas, so he really didn't know where to start. He called Max Puckett from a public phone. Max gave Patrick the names, addresses and phone numbers of three individuals he knew in Vegas. None of these people is the kind you would want to invite home to dinner with your parents, if you know what I mean, Max said with a laugh. But they are all good-hearted and will probably help you find your sister. The only name Patrick recognized was Samantha Porter, whose apartment was just a few hundred metres from the phone booth. Even though it was the early afternoon, Samantha was still in her robe when she finally answered the door. I thought it was you when I looked on the monitor, she said with a sexy smile. You're Patrick O'Toole, aren't you? Patrick nodded and then shifted his feet uncomfortably during a long silence. Miss Porter, he said at length, I have a problem. You're much too young to have a problem, Samantha interrupted. She laughed heartily. Why don't you come inside and we'll talk about it? Patrick blushed. No, ma'am, he said. It's not that kind of a problem. I just can't find my sister Katie, and I thought maybe you could help me. Samantha, who had half turned to lead Patrick into her apartment, turned back to stare at the young man. That's why you've come to see me, she said. She shook her head and laughed again. What a disappointment. I thought that you had come to fool around. And then I could tell everybody, once and for all, whether or not you really are an alien. Patrick continued to fidget in the entryway. After several seconds, Samantha shrugged. I believe that Katie spends most of her time in the palace, she said. Go to the casino and ask for Sherry. She'll know how to find your sister. Yes, yes, Mr. Kobayashi, I understand. Wakaremas. Nicole was saying to the Japanese gentleman in her office. I can appreciate what you must be feeling. You can be sure that justice will be done. She escorted the man into the waiting room, where he joined his wife. Mrs. Kobayashi's eyes were still swollen from her tears. Their sixteen-year-old daughter, Mariko, was in the new Eden Hospital, undergoing a full medical examination. She had been badly beaten, but was not in critical condition. 
Nicole called Dr. Turner after she finished talking to the Kobayashis. There's fresh semen in the girl's vagina, the doctor said, and bruises on almost every square centimeter of her body. She's an emotional wreck as well. Rape is definitely a possibility. Nicole sighed. Mariko Kobayashi had named Pedro Martinez, the young man who had starred with Ellie in the school play, as the rapist. Could it be possible? Nicole rolled her chair across the floor of her office and accessed the colony database through her computer. Martinez, Pedro Escobar. Born 26th May, 2228, Managua, Nicaragua. Mother, unwed. Maria Escobar. Maid, domestic, often unemployed. Father, probably Ramon Martinez, black dock worker from Haiti. Six half-brothers and sisters, all younger. Convicted for selling Kokomo, 2241, 2242. Rape, 2243. Eight months Managua Correction Home. Model prisoner. Transfer to Covenant House in Mexico City, 2244. I.E. 1.86, S.C. 52. Nicole read the short computer entry twice before calling Pedro into her office. He sat down, as Nicole suggested, and then stared at the floor. A Lincoln biot stood in the corner throughout the interview and carefully recorded the conversation. Pedro, Nicole said softly. There was no response. He did not even look up. Pedro Martinez, she repeated more forcefully. Do you understand that you have been accused of raping Mariko Kobayashi last night? I'm sure I don't need to explain to you that this is a very serious accusation. You are being given a chance now to respond to her charges. Pedro still did not say anything. In New Eden, Nicole continued at length, we have a judicial system that may be different from the one you experienced in Nicaragua. Here, criminal cases cannot proceed to indictment unless a judge, after examining the facts, believes that there is sufficient reason for indictment. That is why I am talking to you. After a long silence, the young man, without looking up at all, mumbled something that was inaudible. What? Nicole asked. She's lying, Pedro said, much louder. I don't know why, but Mariko's lying. Would you like to tell me your version of what happened? What difference would it make? Nobody is going to believe me anyway. Pedro, listen to me. If on the basis of an initial investigation my court concludes that there is insufficient reason to proceed with the prosecution, your case can be dismissed. Of course, the seriousness of this charge demands a very thorough investigation, which means you will have to make a complete statement and answer some very tough questions. Pedro Martinez lifted his head and stared at Nicole with sorrowful eyes. Judge Wakefield, he said quietly, Mariko and I did have sex last night. But it was her idea. She thought it would be fun to go into the forest. The young man stopped talking and looked back down at the floor. Had you had intercourse with Mariko before? Nicole asked after several seconds. Only once, about ten days ago, Pedro answered. Pedro, was your love-making last night, was it extremely physical? Tears eased out of Pedro's eyes and rolled onto his cheeks. I did not beat her, he said passionately. I would never have hurt her. As he spoke, there was a strange sound in the distance, like the cracking of a long whip, except much deeper in tone. What was that? Nicole wondered out loud. Sounded like thunder, Pedro remarked. The thunder could also be heard in the village of Hakone, where Patrick was sitting in a luxurious suite in Nakamura's palace, talking to his sister Katie. She was dressed in an expensive blue silk lounging outfit. Patrick ignored the unexplained noise. He was angry. Are you telling me that you won't even try to make it to Benji's party tonight? What am I supposed to tell Mother? Tell her anything you want, Katie said. She took a cigarette from her case and placed it in her mouth. Tell her you couldn't find me. She lit the cigarette with a gold lighter and blew the smoke in her brother's direction. He tried to wave it away with his hand. Come on, baby brother, Katie said with a laugh. It won't kill you. Not immediately, anyway, he answered. Look, Patrick, Katie said, standing up and starting to pace around the suite. Benji's an idiot, a moron. We've never been very close. He won't even realize that I'm not there unless someone mentions it to him. You're wrong, Katie. He's more intelligent than you think. He asks about you all the time. 
That's crap, baby brother, Katie replied. You're just saying it to make me feel guilty. Look, I'm not coming. I mean, I might consider it if it were just you and Benji and Ellie, although she's been a pain in the ass ever since her wonderful speech. But you know what it's like for me around Mother. She's on my case all the time. She's worried about you, Katie. Katie laughed nervously and took a deep drag to finish her cigarette. Sure she is, Patrick. All she's really worried about is whether I'll embarrass the family. Patrick stood up to leave. You don't have to go now, Katie said. Why don't you stay for a while? I'll put on some clothes and we'll go down to the casino. Remember how much fun we used to have together? Katie started toward the bedroom. Are you using drugs? Patrick asked suddenly. She stopped and stared at her brother. Who wants to know? Katie said defiantly. You or Madame Cosmonaut, Dr. Governor, Judge Nicole Desjardins Wakefield? I want to know, Patrick said quietly. Katie walked across the room and put her hands on Patrick's cheeks. I'm your sister, and I love you, she said. Nothing else is important. The dark clouds had all gathered over the small rolling hills of Sherwood Forest. Wind was sweeping through the trees, blowing Ellie's hair behind her. There was a bolt of lightning and an almost simultaneous crack of thunder. Benji recoiled, and Ellie pulled him close beside her. According to the map, she said, we're only about one kilometre from the edge of the forest. How far is that? Benji asked. If we walk quickly, Ellie shouted above the wind, then we can make it out in about ten minutes. She grabbed Benji's hand and pulled him alongside her on the path. An instant later, lightning split one of the trees beside them, and a thick branch fell across the path. The branch struck Benji on the back and knocked him down. He fell mostly on the path, but his head landed in the green plants and ivy at the base of the trees in the forest. The noise from the thunder nearly deafened him. He lay on the forest floor for several seconds, trying to understand what had happened to him. At length, he struggled to his feet. Ellie, he said, looking at the prostrate form of his sister on the other side of the path. Her eyes were closed. Ellie, Benji now screamed, half walking, half crawling over to her side. He grabbed her by the shoulders and shook her lightly. Her eyes did not open. The swelling on her forehead, above and to the side of her right eye, was already the size of a large orange. What am I going to do? Benji said out loud. He smelled smoke and glanced up into the trees at almost the same moment. He saw fire leaping from branch to branch, driven by the wind. There was another bolt of lightning, more thunder. In front of him, down the trail in the direction that Ellie and he had been going, Benji could see that a larger fire was sweeping through the trees on both sides of the path. He started to panic. He held his sister in his arms and slapped her lightly on the face. Ellie, he said, please, please wake up. She did not stir. The fire around him was spreading rapidly. Soon this entire portion of the forest would be an inferno. Benji was terrified. He tried to lift Ellie up, but stumbled and fell in the process. No, 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 he shouted, standing again and bending to lift Ellie to his shoulders. The smoke was getting heavy. Benji moved slowly down the path, away from the fire, with Ellie on his back. He was exhausted when he reached the meadow. He gently placed Ellie on one of the concrete tables and sat on a bench himself. The fire was raging out of control on the north side of the meadow. What do I do now, he thought. His eye fell on the map sticking out of Ellie's shirt pocket. That can help me. He grabbed the map and looked at it. At first he could not understand any of it, and he began to panic again. Relax, Benji, he heard his mother say in a soothing voice. It's a little hard, but you can do it. Maps are very important. They tell us where to go. Now, the first thing always is to orient the map so that you can read the writing. See? That's right. Most of the time the up direction is called north. Good. This is a map of Sherwood Forest. Benji turned the map over in his hands until the letters were all right side up. The lightning and thunder continued. A sudden change in the wind pushed smoke into his lungs and he coughed. He tried to read the words on the map. Again, he heard his mother's voice. If you don't recognize the word at first, then take each letter and sound it out very slowly. Next, let all the sounds fall together until it makes a word you understand. Benji glanced at Ellie on the table. Wake up. Oh, please wake up, Ellie, he said. I need your help. 
Still, she did not move. He bent down over the map and struggled to concentrate. With painstaking deliberation, Benji sounded out all the letters, over and over, until he had convinced himself that the green patch on the map was the meadow where he was sitting. The white lines are the paths, he said to himself. There are three white lines running into the green patch. Benji looked up from the map, counted the three paths leading out of the meadow, and felt a surge of self-confidence. Moments later, however, a gust of wind carried cinders across the meadow and ignited the trees on the southern side. Benji moved quickly. I must go, he said, again lifting Ellie onto his back. He now knew that the main fire was in the northern portion of the map, toward the village of Hakone. Benji stared again at the paper in his hands. So, I must stay on white lines in the bottom part, he thought. The young man trundled down the path as another tree exploded in fire far above his head. His sister was over his shoulder, and the life-saving map was in his right hand. Benji stopped to look at the map every ten steps, each time verifying that he was still headed in the correct direction. When he finally came to a major trail junction, Benji placed Ellie gingerly on the ground and traced the white lines on the map with his finger. After a minute, he smiled broadly, picked up his sister again, and headed down the trail leading to the village of Positano. Lightning flashed one more time. The thunder boomed, and a drenching shower began to fall on Sherwood Forest. Chapter 7 Several hours later, Benji was sleeping peacefully in his room. Meanwhile, across the colony, the new Eden Hospital was a madhouse. Humans and biots were dashing about, gurneys with bodies were standing in the halls, patients were shouting in agony. Nicole was talking on the phone with Kenji Watanabe. We need every Tiasso in the colony sent here as quickly as possible. Try to replace those that are doing geriatric or infant care with a Garcia or even an Einstein. Have humans staff the village clinics. The situation is very serious. She could barely hear what Kenji was saying above the noise in the hospital. Bad, really bad, she said in response to his question. Twenty-seven admitted so far, four dead that we know of. The whole Nara area, that enclave of Japanese-style wood houses that is out behind Vegas, surrounded by the forest, is a disaster. The fire happened too fast. The people panicked. Dr. Wakefield, Dr. Wakefield, please come to number 204 immediately. Nicole hung up the phone and raced down the hall. She bounded up the stairs to the second floor. The man dying in room 204 was an old friend, a Korean, Kim Lee, who had been Nicole's liaison with the Hakone community during the time that she was provisional governor. Mr. Kim had been one of the first to build a new home in Nara. During the fire, he had rushed into his burning house to save his seven-year-old son. The son would live, for Mr. Kim had protected him carefully while he had walked through the flames. But Kim Lee himself had suffered third-degree burns over most of his body. Nicole passed Dr. Turner in the corridor. I don't think we can do anything for that friend of yours in 204, he said. I'd like your opinion. Call me down in the emergency room. They've just brought in another critical who was trapped in her house. Nicole took a deep breath and slowly opened the door to the room. Mr. Kim's wife, a pretty Korean woman in her mid-thirties, was sitting quietly in the corner. Nicole walked over and embraced her. While Nicole was comforting Mrs. Kim, the Tiasso, who was monitoring all of Mr. Kim's data, brought over a set of charts. The man's condition was indeed hopeless. When Nicole glanced up from her reading, she was surprised to see her daughter Ellie, a large bandage on the right side of her head, standing beside Mr. Kim's bed. Ellie was holding the dying man's hand. Nicole, Mr. Kim said in an agonized whisper as soon as he recognized her. His face was nothing but blackened skin. Even speaking one word was painful. I want to die, the man said, nodding at his wife in the corner. Mrs. Kim stood up and approached Nicole. My husband wants me to sign the euthanasia papers, she said. But I am unwilling, unless you can tell me that there is absolutely no chance he can ever be happy again. She started to cry, but stopped herself. Nicole hesitated for a moment. I cannot tell you that, Mrs. Kim, Nicole said grimly. She glanced back and forth between the burned man and his wife. What I can tell you is that he will probably die sometime in the next twenty-four hours, and will suffer ceaselessly until his death. 
If a medical miracle occurs and he survives, he'll be seriously disfigured and debilitated for the rest of his life. I want to die now, Mr. Kim repeated with effort. Nicole sent the Tiasso for the euthanasia documents. The papers required signatures from the attending physician, the spouse, and the individual himself if, in the opinion of the doctor, he was competent to make his own decisions. While the Tiasso was gone, Nicole motioned to Ellie to meet her out in the hall. "'What are you doing here?' Nicole said quietly to Ellie when they were out of earshot. "'I told you to stay at home and rest. You had a bad concussion.' "'I'm all right, mother,' Ellie said. "'Besides, when I heard that Mr. Kim was badly burned, I wanted to do something to help. He was such a good friend back in the early days.' "'He's in terrible shape,' Nicole said, shaking her head. "'I can't believe he's still alive.' Ellie reached out and touched her mother on the forearm. "'He wants his death to be useful,' she said. "'Mrs. Kim, talk to me about it. "'I've already sent for Amadou, "'but I need for you to talk to Dr. Turner.' Nicole stared at her daughter. "'What in the world are you talking about? "'Don't you remember Amadou Diaba? "'Eponine's friend. "'The Nigerian pharmacist with the Sanufu grandmother. "'He's the one who caught RV-41 from a blood transfusion.' Anyway, Eponine told me that his heart is rapidly deteriorating. Nicole was silent for several seconds. She could not believe what she was hearing. You want me, she said finally, to ask Dr. Turner to perform a manual heart transplant? Right now? In the middle of this crisis? If he decides now, it can be done later tonight, can't it? Mr. Kim's heart can be kept healthy at least that long. Look, Ellie, Nicole said, we don't even know. I already checked, Ellie interrupted. One of the Diasos verified that Mr. Kim would be an acceptable donor. Nicole shook her head again. All right, all right, she said. I'll think about it. Meanwhile, I want you to lie down and rest. A concussion is not a trivial injury. You're asking me to do what? An incredulous Dr. Robert Turner said to Nicole. Now, Dr. Turner, Amadou said in his British accent, it is not Dr. Wakefield who is really making the request. It is I. I beseech you to perform this operation. And please, do not consider it risky. You have yourself told me that I will not live more than three months longer. I know full well that I may die on the operating table. But, if I survive, according to the statistics you showed me, I have a fifty-fifty chance of living eight more years. I could even marry and have a child. Dr. Turner spun around and glanced at the clock on his office wall. Forget for a moment, Mr. Diaba, that it is past midnight and I have been working nine hours straight with burn victims. Consider what you are asking. I have not performed a heart transplant for five years, and I have never ever done one without being supported by the finest cardiological staff and equipment on the planet Earth. All the surgical work, for example, was always done by robots. I understand all that, Dr. Turner, but it is not really germane. I will certainly die without the operation. There will almost certainly not be another donor in the near future. Besides, Ellie told me that you have recently been reviewing all the heart transplant procedures as part of your work in preparing your budget requests for new equipment. Dr. Turner flashed a quizzical look at Ellie. My mother told me about your thorough preparation, Dr. Turner. I hope you're not upset that I said something to Amadou. I will be pleased to assist you in any way I can, Nicole added. Although I have never done any heart surgery myself, I did complete my residency at a cardiological institute. Dr. Turner looked around the room, first at Ellie, then at Amadou, and Nicole. Then that settles it, I guess. I don't see where you've given me much choice. You'll do it, Ellie exclaimed with youthful excitement. I will try, the doctor answered. He walked over to Amadou Diaba and extended both his hands. You do know, don't you, that there is very little chance you will ever wake up. Yes, sir, Dr. Turner, but very little chance is better than none. I thank you. Dr. Turner turned to Nicole. I'll meet you in my office for a procedure review in fifteen minutes. And by the way, Dr. Wakefield, will you please have a Tiasso bring us a fresh pot of coffee? 
Preparing for the transplant operation brought back memories that Dr. Robert Turner had buried in the recesses of his mind. Once or twice, he even imagined for several seconds that he had actually returned to the Dallas Medical Center. He remembered mostly how happy he had been in those distant days on another world. He had loved his work. He had loved his family. His life had been almost perfect. Doctors Turner and Wakefield carefully wrote down the exact sequence of events that they would follow before they began the procedure. Then, during the operation itself, they stopped to check with each other after each major segment was completed. No untoward events occurred at any time during the procedure. When Dr. Turner removed Amadou's old heart, he turned it over so that Nicole and Ellie, she had insisted on staying in case there was anything she could do to help, could see the badly atrophied muscles. The man's heart was a disaster. Amadou would probably have died in less than a month. An automatic pump kept the patient's blood circulating, while the new heart was hooked up to all the principal arteries and veins. This was the most difficult and dangerous phase of the operation. In Dr. Turner's experience, this segment had never ever been performed by human hands. Dr. Turner's surgical skills had been finely tuned by the many manual operations he had conducted during his three years in New Eden. He surprised even himself with the ease with which he connected the new heart to Amadou's critical blood vessels. Toward the end of the procedure, when all of the dangerous phases had been completed, Nicole offered to perform the few remaining tasks. But Dr. Turner shook his head. Despite the fact that it was almost dawn in the colony, he was determined to finish the operation himself. Was it the extreme fatigue that caused Dr. Turner's eyes to play tricks on him during the final minutes of the operation? Or could it perhaps have been the surge of adrenaline that accompanied his realization that the procedure was going to be successful? Whatever the cause, during the terminal stages of the operation, Robert Turner periodically witnessed remarkable changes in the face of Amadou Diaba. Several times, his patient's face slowly altered before his eyes, the features of Amadou becoming those of Carl Tyson, the young black man that Dr. Turner had murdered in Dallas. Once, after finishing a stitch, Dr. Turner glanced up at Amadou and was frightened by Carl Tyson's cocky grin. The doctor blinked and looked again, but it was only Amadou Diaba on the operating table. After this phenomenon had occurred several times, Dr. Turner asked Nicole if she had noticed anything unusual about Amadou's face. Nothing but his smile, she replied. I've never seen anyone smile like that under anesthesia. When the operation was over and the Tiassos reported that all of the patient's vital signs were excellent, Dr. Turner, Nicole, and Ellie were exultant, despite their exhaustion. The doctor invited the two women to join him in his office for one final celebratory cup of coffee. At that moment, he didn't yet realize that he was going to propose to Ellie. Ellie was stunned. She just stared at the doctor. He glanced at Nicole and then returned his gaze to Ellie. I know it's sudden, Dr. Turner said, but there's no doubt in my mind. I have seen enough. I love you. I want to marry you. The sooner the better. The room was absolutely quiet for almost a minute. During the silence, the doctor walked over to his office door and locked it. He even disconnected his phone. Ellie started to speak. No, he said to her with passion. Don't say anything yet. There's something else I must do first. He sat down in his chair and took a deep breath. Something that I should have done long ago he said quietly. Besides, you both deserve to know the whole truth about me. Tears welled up in Dr. Turner's eyes, even before he began to tell the story. His voice broke the first time he spoke, but then he collected himself and eased into the narrative. I was thirty-three years old and blindly, outrageously happy. I was already one of the leading cardiac surgeons in America, and I had a beautiful, loving wife with two daughters, aged three and two. We lived in a mansion with a swimming pool inside a country club community about 40 kilometers north of Dallas, Texas. One night, when I came home from the hospital, it was very late, for I had supervised an unusually delicate open-heart procedure. I was stopped at the gate of our community by the security guards. They acted rattled, as if they didn't know what to do, but after a phone call and some peculiar glances in my direction, they waved me through. Two police cars and an ambulance were parked in front of my house. Three mobile television vans were scattered in the cul-de-sac just beyond my home. 
When I started to turn into my driveway, a policeman stopped me. With flashbulbs popping all around and Klieg lights from the television cameras blinding my eyes, the policeman led me into my house. My wife was lying under a sheet on a cot in the main hall beside the stairway to the second floor. Her throat had been slit. I heard some people talking upstairs and raced up to see my daughters. The girls were still lying where they had been killed. Christy on the floor in the bathroom and Amanda in her bed. The bastard had cut their throats as well. Huge, desolate sobs wrenched out of Dr. Turner. I will never forget that horrible sight. Amanda must have been killed in her sleep, for there was no mark on her except for the cut. What kind of human being could kill such innocent creatures? Dr. Turner's tears were cascading down his cheeks. His chest was heaving uncontrollably. For several seconds he did not speak. Ellie quietly came over beside his chair and sat on the floor, holding his hand. The next five months I was totally numb. I could not work, I could not eat. People tried to help me, friends, psychiatrists, other doctors. But I could not function. I simply could not accept that my wife and children had been murdered. The police had a suspect in less than a week. His name was Carl Tyson. He was a young black man, 23 years old, who delivered groceries for a nearby supermarket. My wife always used the television for her shopping. Carl Tyson had been to our home several times before. I even remembered having seen him once or twice myself. I certainly knew his way around the house. Despite my days during that period, I was aware of what was happening in the investigation of Linda's murder. At first, everything seemed so simple. Carl Tyson's fresh fingerprints were found all over the house. He had been inside our community that very afternoon on a delivery. Most of Linda's jewelry was missing, so robbery was the obvious motive. I figured the suspect would be summarily convicted and executed. The issue quickly became clouded. None of the jewelry was ever found. The security guards had marked Carl Tyson's entry and departure from the community on the master log, but he was only inside Greenbrier for twenty-two minutes, hardly enough time for him to deliver groceries and commit a robbery plus three murders. In addition, after a famous attorney decided to defend Tyson and helped him prepare his sworn statements, Tyson insisted that Linda had asked him to move some furniture that afternoon. This was a perfect explanation for the presence of his fingerprints all over the house. Dr. Turner paused, reflecting, the pain obvious in his face. Ellie squeezed his hand gently, and he continued. By the time of the trial, the prosecution's argument was that Tyson had brought the groceries to the house in the afternoon and had discovered, after talking with Linda, that I would be in surgery until much later that night. Since my wife was a friendly and trusting woman, it was not unlikely that she might have chatted with the delivery boy and mentioned that I would not be home until late. Anyway, according to the prosecutor, Tyson returned after he finished his shift at the supermarket. He climbed the rock wall that surrounded the country club development and walked across the golf course. Then he entered the house, intending to steal Linda's jewelry and expecting everyone in the family to be asleep. Apparently my wife confronted him, and Tyson panicked, killing first Linda and then the children to ensure that there were no witnesses. Despite the fact that nobody saw Tyson return to our neighborhood, I thought the prosecution's case was extremely persuasive and that the man would be easily convicted. After all, he had no alibi whatsoever for the time period during which the crime was committed. The mud that was found on Tyson's shoes exactly matched the mud in the creek that he would have crossed to reach the back side of the house. He did not show up for work for two days after the murders. In addition, when Tyson was arrested, he was carrying a large amount of cash that he said he won in a poker game. During the defense portion of the trial, I really began to have my doubts about the American judicial system. His attorney made the case a racial issue, depicting Carl Tyson as a poor, unfortunate black man who was being railroaded on circumstantial evidence. His lawyer argued emphatically that all Tyson had done on that October day was deliver groceries to my house. Someone else, his attorney said, some unknown maniac had climbed the green briar fence, stolen the jewelry, and then murdered Linda and the children. 
The last two days of the trial I became convinced more from watching the body language of the jury than anything else that Tyson was going to be acquitted. I went insane with righteous indignation. There was no doubt in my mind that the young man had committed the crime. The thought that he might be set free was intolerable. Every day during the trial, which lasted about six weeks, I showed up at the courthouse with my small medical bag. At first the security guards checked the bag each time I entered, but after a while, especially since most of them were sympathetic with my anguish, they just let me pass. The weekend before the trial concluded I flew to California, ostensibly to attend a medical seminar, but actually to buy a black market shotgun that would fit in my medical bag. As I expected, on the day the verdict was being announced, the guards did not make me open my bag. When the acquittal was announced, there was an uproar in the courtroom. All the black people in the gallery shouted hooray. Carl Tyson and his attorney, a Jewish guy named Irving Bernstein, threw their arms around each other. I was ready to act. I opened my briefcase, quickly assembled the shotgun, jumped over the barrier, and killed them both, one with each barrel. Dr. Turner took a deep breath and paused. I have never admitted before, not even to myself, that what I did was wrong. However, sometime during this operation on your friend Mr. Diaba, I understood clearly how much my emotional outrage has poisoned my soul for all these years. My violent act of revenge did not return my wife and children to me, nor did it make me happy, except for that sick animal pleasure I felt at the instant I knew that both Tyson and his attorney were going to die. There were now tears of contrition in Dr. Turner's eyes. He glanced over at Ellie. Although I may not be worthy, I do love you, Ellie Wakefield and very much want to marry you. I hope that you can forgive me for what I did years ago. Ellie looked up at Dr. Turner and squeezed his hand again. I know very little of romance, she said slowly, for I have had no experience with it. But I do know that what I feel when I think about you is wonderful. I admire you. I respect you. I may even love you. I would like to talk to my parents about this, of course. But yes, Dr. Robert Turner, if they do not object, I would be very happy to marry you. Chapter 8 Nicole leaned over the basin and stared at her face in the mirror. She ran her fingers across the wrinkles under her eyes and smoothed her grey bangs. You're almost an old woman, she said to herself. Then she smiled. I grow old, I grow old. I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled, she said out loud. Nicole laughed and backed up from the mirror, turning herself around so that she could see what she looked like from the back. The Kelly green dress that she had planned to wear in Ellie's wedding fitted snugly against her body, which was still trim and athletic after all the years. Not too bad, Nicole thought approvingly. At least Ellie won't be embarrassed. On the end table beside her bed were the two photographs of Genevieve and her French husband that Kenji Watanabe had given her. After Nicole returned to the bedroom, she picked up the photos and stared at them. I couldn't be at your wedding, Genevieve, she thought suddenly, with a burst of sadness. I never even met your husband. Struggling with her emotions, Nicole crossed quickly over to the other side of the bedroom. She stared for almost a minute at a photograph of Simone and Michael O'Toole, taken the day of their wedding at the Node. And I left you only a week after your wedding. You were so very young, Simone, Nicole thought to herself. But in many ways, you were far more mature than Ellie. She did not let herself finish the thought. There was too much heartache in remembering either Simone or Genevieve. It was healthier to focus on the present. Nicole purposely reached up and grabbed the individual picture of Ellie that was hanging on the wall beside her brothers and sisters. So, you will be my third daughter to marry, Nicole thought. It seems impossible. Sometimes life moves much too fast. A montage of images of Ellie flashed through Nicole's mind. She saw again the shy little baby lying beside her in Rama too, Ellie's awestruck little girl face as they approached the node in the shuttle, her new adolescent features at the moment of awakening from the long sleep and finally Ellie's mature determination and courage as she spoke in front of the citizens of New Eden in defence of Dr. Turner's programme. 
It was a powerful emotional journey into the past. Nicole replaced Ellie's picture on the wall and started to undress. She had just hung her dress in the closet when she heard a strange sound, like someone crying, at the very limit of her hearing. What was that? she wondered. Nicole sat still for several minutes, but didn't hear any other noises. When she stood up, however, she suddenly had the eerie feeling that both Genevieve and Simone were in the room with her. Nicole glanced around her quickly, but she was still alone. What is going on with me? she asked herself. Have I been working too hard? Has the combination of the Martinez case and the wedding pushed me over the brink? Or is this another of my psychic episodes? Nicole tried to calm herself by breathing slowly and deeply. She was not, however, able to shake the feeling that Genevieve and Simone were indeed there in the room with her. Their presence beside her was so strong that Nicole had to restrain herself to keep from talking to them. She remembered clearly the discussions that she'd had with Simone prior to her marriage to Michael O'Toole. Maybe that's why they are here, Nicole thought. They've come to remind me that I've been so busy with my work I haven't had my wedding talk with Ellie. Nicole laughed out loud nervously, but the goosebumps remained on her arm. Forgive me, my darlings, Nicole said to both Ellie's photograph and the spirits of Genevieve and Simone in the room. I promise that tomorrow, this time the shriek was unmistakable. Nicole froze in her bedroom, the adrenaline coursing through her system. Within seconds she was running across the house to the study where Richard was working. Richard, she said, just before reaching the door to the study. Did you hear? Nicole stopped herself in mid-sentence. The study was a mess. Richard was on the floor, surrounded by a pair of monitors and a jumbled pile of electronic equipment. The little robot Prince Hal was in one hand, and Richard's precious portable computer from the Newton mission was in the other. Three Biots, two Garcias, and a partially disassembled Einstein were bending over him. "'Why, hello, darling,' Richard said nonchalantly. "'What are you doing here? I thought you'd be asleep by now.' Richard, I am certain that I heard an avian shriek. Only about a minute ago. It was close by. Nicole hesitated, trying to decide whether or not to tell him about the visit from Genevieve and Simone. Richard's brow furrowed. I didn't hear anything, he replied. Did any of you? he asked the Biots. They all shook their heads, including the Einstein, whose chest was wide open and connected by four cables to the monitors on the floor. I know I heard something, Nicole reiterated. She was silent for a moment. Is this another sign of terminal stress? She asked herself. Nicole now surveyed the chaos on the floor in front of her. By the way, darling, what are you doing? This, Richard said with a vague sweep of his hand. Oh, it's nothing special. Just another project of mine. Richard Wakefield, she said quickly. You are not telling me the truth. This mess all over the floor could not possibly be nothing special. I know you better than that. Now. What's so secret? Richard had changed the displays on all three of his active monitors and was now shaking his head vigorously. I don't like this, he mumbled. None at all. He glanced up at Nicole. Have you by any chance accessed my recent data files that are stored in the central supercomputer? Even inadvertently? No, of course not. I don't even know your entry code. But that's not what I want to talk about. Somebody has... Richard quickly keyed in a diagnostic security subroutine and studied one of the monitors. At least five times in the last three weeks. You're certain that it wasn't you? Yes, Richard, Nicole said emphatically. But you're still trying to change the subject. I want you to tell me what this is all about. Richard set Prince Hal down on the floor in front of him and looked up at Nicole. I'm not quite ready to tell you, darling, he said after a moment's hesitation. Please give me a couple of days. Nicole was puzzled. At length, however, her face brightened. All right, darling. If it's a wedding present for Ellie, then I'll gladly wait. Richard returned to his work. Nicole plopped down in the only chair in the room that was not cluttered. As she watched her husband, she realized how tired she was. She convinced herself that her fatigue must have caused her to imagine the shriek. Darling, Nicole said softly, a minute or two later. Yes? he answered, glancing up at her from the floor. Do you ever wonder what's really going on here in New Eden? I mean, why have we been left so utterly alone by the creators of Rama? 
Most of the colonists go about their lives with hardly a thought about the fact that they're traveling in an interstellar spaceship constructed by extraterrestrials. How can this be possible? Why doesn't the eagle or some other equally marvelous manifestation of their superior alien technology suddenly appear? Then maybe our petty problems... Nicole stopped when Richard started laughing. What is it? she said. This reminds me of a conversation that I had once with Michael O'Toole. He was frustrated because I would not accept on faith the eyewitness reports of the apostles. He then told me that God should have known that we were a species of doubting Thomases, and should have scheduled frequent return visits from the resurrected Christ. But that situation was entirely different, Nicole argued. Was it? Richard replied. What the early Christians reported about Jesus could not have been any harder to accept than our description of the node in our long, time-dilating journey at relativistic velocities. It's far more comforting for the other colonists to believe that this spaceship was created as an experiment by the ISA. Very few of them understand science well enough to know that Rama is way beyond our technological capability. Nicole was silent for a moment. Then there is nothing we can do to convince them. She was interrupted by the triple buzz that indicated an incoming phone call was urgent. Nicole stumbled across the floor to answer it. Max Puckett's concerned face appeared on the monitor. We have dangerous situation here outside the detention compound, he said. There's an angry mob, maybe seventy or eighty people, mostly from Hakanay. They want access to Martinez. They've already terminated two Garcia buyouts and attacked three others. Judge Mishkin is trying to reason with them, but they're in a nasty mood. Apparently, Mariko Kobayashi committed suicide about two hours ago. Her whole family is here, including her father. Nicole was dressed in a sweatsuit in less than a minute. Richard tried vainly to argue with her. It was my decision, she said as she climbed on her bicycle. I should be the one to deal with the consequences. She eased down the lane to the main bicycle path and then began to pedal furiously. At top speed, she would be at the administrative centre in four or five minutes, less than half the time it would take her by train at this time of night. Kenji was wrong, Nicole thought. We should have had a press conference this morning. Then I could have explained the decision. Almost a hundred colonists were gathered in the main square of Central City. They were milling around in front of the new Eden detention complex, where Pedro Martinez had been held since he was first indicted for the rape of Mariko Kobayashi. Judge Mishkin was standing at the top of the steps in front of the detention centre. He was speaking to the angry crowd through a megaphone. Twenty Biots, mostly Garcias, but with a couple of Lincolns and Tiassos in the group, had locked arms in front of Judge Mishkin and were preventing the mob from climbing the stairs to reach the judge. Now, folks, the grey-haired Russian was saying, if Pedro Martinez is indeed guilty, then he will be convicted. But our constitution guarantees him a fair trial. Shut up, old man, someone shouted from the audience. We want Martinez, another voice said. Off to the left, in front of the theatre, six young Orientals were finishing a makeshift scaffold. There was a cheer from the crowd as one of them tied a thick rope with a noose over the crossbar. A burly Japanese man in his early twenties pushed to the front of the crowd. Move out of the way, old man, he said. And take these mechanical dolts with you. Our quarrel is not with you. We are here to secure justice for the Kobayashi family. Remember Mariko, a young woman shouted. There was a crashing sound as a red-haired boy struck one of the Garcias in the face with an aluminium baseball bat. The Garcia, its eyes destroyed and its face disfigured beyond recognition, made no response, but did not give up its place in the cordon. The Bayots will not fight back, Judge Mishkin said into the megaphone. They are programmed to be pacifists, but destroying them serves no purpose. It is senseless, inane violence. Two runners, coming from Hakone, arrived in the square, and there was a momentary change in the focus of the crowd. Less than a minute later, the unruly mob cheered the appearance of two huge logs, carried by a dozen youths each. Now we will remove the pilots that are protecting that murderer, Martinez, the young Japanese spokesman said. This is your last chance, old man. Move out of the way before you are hurt. Many individuals in the crowd ran over to take positions on the logs they intended to use as battering rams. At that moment, Nicole Wakefield arrived in the square on her bicycle. 
She jumped down quickly, walked through the cordon, and raced up the steps to stand beside Judge Mishkin. Hiro Kobayashi, she shouted into the megaphone before the crowd had recognized her. I have come to explain to you why there will be no jury trial for Pedro Martinez. Will you come forward so that I can see you? The elder Kobayashi, who had been standing off to the side of the square, walked slowly over to the bottom of the steps in front of Nicole. Kobayashi-san, Nicole said in Japanese, I was very sorry to hear about the death of your daughter. Hypocrite! Someone shouted in English, and the crowd began to buzz. As a parent myself, Nicole continued in Japanese, I can imagine how terrible it must be to experience the death of a child. Now, she said, switching to English and addressing the crowd. Let me explain my decision today to all of you. Our new Eden constitution says that each citizen shall have a fair trial. In all other cases since this colony was originally settled, criminal indictments have led to a trial by jury. In the case of Mr. Martinez, however, because of all the publicity, I am convinced that no unbiased jury can be found. A chorus of whistles and boos briefly interrupted Nicole. Our constitution does not define, she continued, what should be done to ensure a fair trial if no jury of peers is to be involved. However, our judges have supposedly been selected to implement the law and are trained to decide cases on the basis of the evidence. That is why I have assigned the Martinez indictment to the jurisdiction of the New Eden Special Court. There, all the evidence, some of which has never heretofore been made public, will be carefully weighed. But we all know the boy Martinez is guilty, a distraught Mr. Kobayashi cried in response. He has even admitted he had sex with my daughter. And we also know he raped a girl in Nicaragua, back on earth. Why are you protecting him? What about justice for my family? Because the law, Nicole started to answer, but was drowned out by the crowd. We want Martinez. We want Martinez. The chant swelled as the huge logs, which had been laid on the pavement soon after Nicole's appearance, were again hoisted by the people in the square. As the mob struggled to set up a battering ram, one of the logs inadvertently crashed into the monument marking the celestial location of Rama. The sphere shattered, and electronic parts that had indicated the nearby stars tumbled out onto the pavement. The small, blinking light that had been Rama itself broke into hundreds of pieces. "'Citizens of New Eden!' Nicole shouted into the megaphone. "'Hear me out! There is something about this case that none of you know. If you will just listen!' Kill the nigger bitch, shouted the red-haired boy, who had struck the Garcia bot with a baseball bat. Nicole glared at the young man with fire in her eyes. What did you say? she thundered. The chanting suddenly ceased. The boy was isolated. He glanced around nervously and grinned. Kill the nigger bitch, he repeated. Nicole was down the steps in an instant. The crowd moved aside as she headed straight for the red-haired boy. Say it one more time she said, her nostrils flaring, when she was less than a metre away from her antagonist. Kill, he started. She slapped his cheek hard with her open hand. The smack resounded through the square. Nicole turned around abruptly and started toward the steps, but hands grabbed her from all sides. The shocked boy doubled up his fist. At that moment, two loud booms shook the square. As everyone tried to ascertain what was happening, two more blasts were detonated into the sky over the heads of the crowd. That's just me and my shotgun, Max Puckett said into the megaphone. Now if you folks will just let the lady judge pass. There, that's better. And then head on home. We'll all be better off. Nicole broke free from the hands that were holding her, but the crowd did not disperse. Max raised the gun aimed it at the thick knot of rope above the noose on the makeshift scaffold, and fired again. The rope exploded into pieces, parts of it falling into the crowd. Now, folks, Max said, I'm a lot more ornery than these two judges, and I already know I'm going to spend some time in this here detention center for violating the colony's gun laws. I'd sure as hell hate to have to shoot some of you as well. Max pointed his gun at the crowd. Everyone instinctively ducked. Max fired blanks over their heads and laughed heartily as the people began to scurry out of the square. Nicole could not sleep. 
over and over again. She replayed the same scene. She kept seeing herself walking into the crowd and slapping the red-haired boy. Which makes me no better than he is, she thought. You're still awake, aren't you? Richard said. Mm-hmm. Are you all right? There was a short silence. No, Richard, Nicole answered. I'm not. I'm extremely upset with myself for striking that boy. Hey, come on, he said. Stop beating yourself up. He deserved it. He insulted you in the worst way. People like that don't understand anything but force. Richard reached over and began rubbing Nicole's back. My God, he said. I've never seen you so tense. You're in knots from one end to the other. I'm worried, Nicole said. I have a terrible feeling that the whole fabric of our life here in New Eden is about to come unraveled, and that everything I have done or am doing is absolutely useless. You have done your best, darling. I must confess that I am amazed by how hard you have tried. Richard continued to rub Nicole's back very gently. But you must remember, you're dealing with human beings. You can transport them to another world and give them a paradise, but they still come equipped with their fears and insecurities and cultural predilections. A new world could only really be new if all the humans involved began with totally empty minds, like new computers with no software and no operating systems, just loads of untapped potential. Nicole managed a smile. You're not very optimistic, darling. Why should I be? Nothing I have seen here in New Eden or on Earth suggests to me that humanity is capable of achieving harmony in its relationship with itself, much less with any other living creatures. Occasionally there is an individual, or even a group, that is able to transcend the basic genetic and environmental drawbacks of the species, but these people are miracles, certainly not the norm. I don't agree with you, Nicole said softly. Your view is too hopeless. I believe that most people desperately want to achieve that harmony. We just don't know how to do it. That's why we need more education and more good examples. Even that red-haired boy. Do you believe he could be educated out of his intolerance? I have to think so, darling, Nicole said. Otherwise, I fear I would simply give up. Richard made a sound somewhere between a cough and a laugh. What is it? Nicole asked. I was just wondering... Richard said, if Sisyphus ever deluded himself into believing that maybe the next time the boulder would not roll down the hill again. Nicole smiled. He had to believe there was some chance the boulder would stay at the summit, or he could not have laboured so hard. At least, that's what I think. Chapter 9 As Kenji Watanabe descended from the train at Hakone, it was impossible for him not to recall another meeting with Toshio Nakamura, years before, on a planet billions of kilometres away. He had telephoned me that time too, Kenji thought. He had insisted that we talk about Keiko. Kenji stopped in front of a shop window and straightened his tie. In the distorted reflection, he could easily imagine himself as an idealistic Kyoto teenager on his way to a meeting with a rival. But that was long ago, Kenji thought to himself, with nothing at stake except our egos. Now, the entire fate of our little world. His wife, Nai, had not wanted him to meet with Nakamura at all. She had encouraged Kenji to call Nicole for another opinion. Nicole also had been opposed to any meeting between the governor and Toshio Nakamura. He's a dishonest, power-crazy megalomaniac, Nicole had said. Nothing good can come from the meeting. He just wants to find your weaknesses. But he has said that he can reduce tension in the colony. At what price, Kenji? Watch out for the terms. That man never offers to do something for nothing. So why did you come? A voice inside Kenji's head asked him, as he stared at the huge palace his boyhood associate had built for himself. I'm not certain exactly, another voice answered. Maybe honour. Or self-respect. Something deep in my heritage. Nakamura's palace and the surrounding homes were built of wood in the classic Kyoto style. Blue tile roofs, carefully manicured gardens, sheltering trees, immaculately clean walkways. Even the smell of the flowers reminded Kenji of his home city on a faraway planet. He was met at the door by a lovely young girl in sandals and kimono, who bowed and said, Ohari Kudasai, 
in the very formal Japanese way. Kenji left his shoes on the rack and put on sandals himself. The girl's eyes were always on the floor as she guided him through the few western rooms of the palace into the tatami mat area, where, it was said, Nakamura spent most of his free time gambling with his concubines. After a short walk, the girl stopped and pulled aside a paper screen, decorated with cranes in flight. Dozo, she said, gesturing inside. Kenji walked into the six-mat room and sat cross-legged on one of the two cushions in front of a shiny black lacquer table. He will be late, Kenji thought. That's all part of the strategy. A different young girl, also pretty, self-effacing, and dressed in a lovely pastel kimono, came noiselessly into the room, carrying water and Japanese tea. Kenji sipped the tea slowly while his eyes roamed around the room. In one corner was a wooden screen with four panels. Kenji could tell from his distance of a few metres that it was exquisitely carved. He rose from his cushion to take a closer look. The side facing toward him featured the beauty of Japan, one panel for each of the four seasons. The winter picture showed a ski resort in the Japanese Alps smothered in metres of snow. The spring panel depicted the cherry trees in blossom along the Kama River in Kyoto. Summer was a pristine clear day, with Mount Fuji's snow-capped summit rising above the verdant countryside. The autumn panel presented a riot of colour in the trees surrounding the Tokugawa family shrine and mausoleum at Nikko. All this amazing beauty, Kenji thought, suddenly feeling deeply homesick. He has tried to recreate the world we have left behind. But why? Why does he spend his sordid money on such magnificent art? He is a strange, inconsistent man. The four panels on the back side of the screen told of another Japan. The rich colours displayed the Battle of Osaka Castle in the early 17th century, after which Iayatsu Tokugawa was virtually unopposed as shogun of Japan. The screen was covered with human figures, samurai warriors in battle, male and female members of the court scattered throughout the castle grounds. Even the Lord Tokugawa himself, larger than the rest and looking supremely content with his victory. Kenji noticed with amusement that the carved shogun bore more than a passing resemblance to Nakamura. Kenji was about to sit back down on the cushion when the screen opened and his adversary entered. Omashido sama deshida, Nakamura said, bowing slightly in his direction. Kenji bowed back, somewhat awkwardly because he could not take his eyes off his countryman. Toshio Nakamura was dressed in a complete samurai outfit, including the sword and dagger. This is all part of some psychological ploy, Kenji told himself. It is designed to confuse or scare me. Ano, hajimemashoka, Nakamura said, sitting down on the cushion opposite Kenji. Koshaka, oishi desu na? Totomo, oishi desu, Kenji replied, taking another sip. The tea was indeed excellent. But he is not my shogun, Kenji thought. I must change this atmosphere before any serious discussion starts. Nakamura-san, we are both busy men, Governor Watanabe said in English. It is important to me that we dispense with the formalities and cut straight to the heart of the matter. Your representative told me on the phone this morning that you are disturbed about the events of the last twenty-four hours and have some positive suggestions for reducing the current tension in New Eden. This is why I have come to talk to you. Nakamura's face showed nothing. However, the slight hiss as he was speaking indicated his displeasure with Kenji's directness. You have forgotten your Japanese manners, Watanabe-san. It is grievously impolite to start a business discussion before you have complimented your host on the surroundings and inquired about his well-being. Such impropriety almost always leads to unpleasant disagreement, which can be avoided. Oh, I'm sorry, Kenji interrupted, with a trace of impatience, but I don't need a lesson from you, of all people, on manners. Besides, we are not in Japan, we are not even on Earth, and our ancient Japanese customs are about as germane now as the outfit you are wearing. Kenji had not intended to insult Nakamura, but he could not have had a better strategy for causing his adversary to reveal his true intentions. The tycoon rose to his feet abruptly, for a moment the governor thought Nakamura was going to draw his samurai sword. All right, said Nakamura, his eyes implacably hostile. We will do this your way. Watanabe, you have lost control of the colony, 
The citizens are very unhappy with your leadership, and my people tell me there is widespread talk of impeachment and or insurrection. You have botched the environmental and RV-41 issues, and now your black woman judge, after innumerable delays, has announced that a nigger rapist will not be subject to a trial by jury. Some of the more thoughtful of the colonists, knowing that you and I have a common background, have asked me to intercede, to try to convince you to step aside before there is widespread bloodshed and chaos. This is incredible, Kenji thought, as he listened to Nakamura. The man is absolutely out of his mind. The governor resolved to say very little in the conversation. So, you believe I should resign? Kenji asked, after a protracted silence. Yes, answered Nakamura, his tone growing more imperious. But not immediately. Not until tomorrow. Today you should exercise your executive privilege to change the jurisdiction for the Martinez case away from Nicole Desjardins Wakefield. She is obviously prejudiced. Judges Ianala or Rodriguez, either one, would be more appropriate. Notice, he said, forcing a smile, that I am not suggesting the case be transferred to Judge Nishimura's court. Is there anything else? Kenji asked. Only one more thing. Tell Ulanov to withdraw from the election. He doesn't have any chance to win and continuing this divisive campaign will only make it more difficult for us to pull together after the Macmillan victory. We need to be united. I foresee a serious threat to the colony from whatever enemy inhabits the other habitat. The Leggies that you seem to believe are harmless observers are just their advance scouts. Kenji was astonished by what he was hearing. How had Nakamura become so warped? Or had he always been this way? I must stress that time is of the essence, Nakamura was saying, especially with respect to the Martinez issue and your resignation. I have asked Kobayashi-san and the other members of the Asian community not to act too hastily, but after last night I'm not certain I can restrain them. His daughter was a beautiful, talented young woman. Her suicide note makes it clear that she could not live with the shame implied by the continual delays in the trial of her rapist. There is genuine anger throughout. Governor Watanabe temporarily forgot his resolution to remain quiet. Are you aware, he said, also standing up, that semen from two different individuals was found in Mariko Kobayashi after the night during which she was allegedly raped, and that both Mariko and Pedro Martinez repeatedly insisted that they were alone together the entire evening? Even when Nicole hinted to Mariko last week that there was evidence of additional intercourse, the young woman stuck to her story. Nakamura momentarily lost his composure. He stared blankly at Kenji Watanabe. We have not been able to identify the other party, Kenji continued. The semen samples mysteriously disappeared from the hospital laboratory before the full DNA analysis could be completed. All we have is the record of the original examination. That record could be wrong, asserted Nakamura, his self-confidence returning. Very, very unlikely. But at any rate... Now you can understand Judge Wakefield's dilemma. Everyone in this colony has already decided Pedro is guilty. She did not want a jury to convict him wrongly. There was a long silence. The governor started to depart. I am surprised at you, Watanabe. Nakamura said at length. You've missed the point of this meeting entirely. Whether or not that Jigaboo Martinez raped Mariko Kobayashi is really not that important. I have promised her father that the Nicaraguan boy will be punished, and that's what counts. Kenji Watanabe stared at his boyhood classmate with disgust. I'm going to leave now, he said, before I become really angry. You will not be given another chance, Nakamura said, his eyes again full of hostility. This was my first and final offer. Kenji shook his head pulled back the paper screen himself, and walked out into the corridor. Nicole was walking along a beach in beautiful sunlight. Ahead of her, about fifty metres, Ellie was standing beside Dr. Turner. She was wearing her wedding dress, but the groom was dressed in a bathing suit. Nicole's great-grandfather, Omer, was performing the ceremony in his long green tribal robe. Omer placed Ellie's hands in Dr. Turner's and began a Sanufu chant. 
He raised his eyes to the sky. A solitary avian soared overhead, shrieking in rhythm with the wedding chant. As Nicole watched the avian flying above her, the sky darkened. Storm clouds rushed in, displacing the placid sky. The ocean began to churn and the wind to blow. Nicole's hair, now completely grey, streamed out behind her. The wedding party was in disarray. Everyone ran inland to escape the coming storm. Nicole could not move. Her eyes were fixed on a large object being tossed upon the waves. The object was a huge green bag, like the plastic bags used for lawn trash back in the twenty-first century. The bag was full and was coming toward the shore. Nicole would have tried to grab it, but she was afraid of the moiling sea. She pointed at the bag. She yelled for help. In the upper left-hand corner of her dream screen, she saw a long canoe. As it drew closer, Nicole realized that the eight occupants of the canoe were extraterrestrials, orange in color, smaller than humans. They looked as if they were made from bread dough. They had eyes and faces, but no bodily hair. The aliens steered the canoe over to the large green bag and picked it up. The orange extraterrestrials deposited the green bag on the beach. Nicole did not approach until they climbed back into their canoe and returned to the ocean. She waved goodbye to them and walked over to the bag. It had a zipper, which she carefully opened. Nicole pulled back the top half and stared at the dead face of Kenji Watanabe. Nicole shuddered, screamed, and sat up in bed. She reached over for Richard, but the bed was empty. The digital clock on the table read 2.48 a.m. Nicole tried to slow her breathing and clear her mind of the horrible dream. The vivid image of the dead Kenji Watanabe lingered in her mind. As she walked over to the bathroom, Nicole remembered her premonitory dreams about the death of her mother, back when she was only ten years old. What if Kenji is really going to die, she thought, feeling the first wave of panic. She forced herself to think about something else. Now, where is Richard at this time of night, she wondered. Nicole pulled on her robe and left the bedroom area. She walked quietly past the children's rooms, toward the front of the house. Benji was snoring as usual. The light was on in the study, but Richard was not there. Two of the new biots plus Prince Hal were also gone. One of the monitors on Richard's work table still contained a display. Nicole smiled to herself and remembered their agreement. She touched the keys Nicole on the keyboard, and the display changed. Dearest Nicole, the message appeared. If you awaken before I return, do not worry. I plan to be back by dawn, eight o'clock tomorrow morning at the very latest. I have been doing some work with the 300 series biots, you remember, the ones that are not completely programmed in firmware and therefore can be designed for special tasks, and have reason to believe that someone has been spying on my work. Therefore, I have accelerated the completion of my current project and have gone outside New Eden for a final test. I love you. Richard It was dark and cold out in the central plain. Richard tried to be patient. He had sent his upgraded Einstein, Richard referred to it as Super AI, and Garcia 325, over to the second habitat probe site before him. They had explained to the night watchman, a standard Garcia biot, that the published experiment schedule had changed and that a special investigation was presently going to be conducted. With Richard still out of sight, Super AI had then withdrawn all the equipment from the opening into the other habitat and placed it on the ground. The process had consumed over an hour of precious time. Now that Super AI was finally finished, he signalled Richard to approach. Garcia 325 cleverly led the watchman biot off to another area around the probe site so it wouldn't be able to see Richard. He wasted no time. Richard pulled Prince Hal out of his pocket and put him into the opening. Go quickly, Richard said, setting his small monitor up on the floor of the passage. The opening into the other habitat had been gradually widened over the weeks so that it was now approximately a square, eighty centimetres on a side. There was more than enough room for the tiny robot. Prince Hal hurried through to the other side. The drop from the passage to the inside floor was about a metre. The robot adroitly attached a small cable to a stanchion he glued to the floor of the passage and then let himself down. Richard watched Hal's every move on his screen and communicated instructions by radio. 
Richard had expected that there would be an outer annulus protecting the second habitat. He was correct. So, the basic design of the two habitats is similar, he thought. Richard had also anticipated that there would be an opening of some kind in the inner wall, some gate or door through which the leggies must come and go, and that Prince Hal would be small enough to enter the inside of the habitat by the same portal. It did not take long for Hal to locate the entrance into the main part of the habitat. However, what was obviously a door was also more than twenty metres above the floor of the annulus. Having watched the video recordings of the leggies moving up vertical surfaces on the bulldozer biots at the Avalon survey site, Richard had prepared for this possibility as well. Climb, he ordered Prince Hal, after a nervous glance at his watch. It was almost six o'clock. Dawn would be coming soon in New Eden. Soon thereafter, the regular scientists and engineers would be returning to this probe site. The entrance to the inside of the habitat was one hundred times Prince Hal's height above the floor. The robot's ascent would be the equivalent of a human going straight up a sixty-story building. At home, Richard had had the little robot practice by scaling the house, but he had always been there beside him. Were there grooves for hand and footholds on the wall Hal was climbing? Richard could not tell from the monitor. Were all the correct equations in Prince Hal's mechanical engineering subprocessor? I'll find out soon enough, Richard thought, as his star pupil began his climb. Prince Hal slipped and dangled by his hands once, but eventually succeeded in making it to the top. However, the ascent took another thirty minutes. Richard knew he was running out of time. As Hal pulled himself onto the window sill of a circular porthole, Richard saw that the robot's ingress into the habitat was blocked by a mesh screen. However, a small part of the interior was barely visible in the dim light. Richard carefully positioned Hal's tiny camera so that it could see through the gridwork. The watchman insists it must return to its main station, Garcia 325 announced to Richard on the radio. It is required to make its daily report at 0630. Shit, thought Richard. That's only six minutes. He moved Hal slowly around on the lip of the porthole to see if he could identify any objects in the habitat interior. Richard could see nothing specific. Shriek, Richard then ordered, switching the robot's audio volume to full. Shriek until I tell you to stop. Richard had not tested the new amplifier he had installed in Prince Hal at its maximum output. He was therefore astonished at the amplitude of Hal's avian mimicry. It resounded from the passage, and Richard jumped back. Pretty damn good, Richard said, after collecting himself, at least if my memory is accurate. The watchman biot was soon upon Richard, following its pre-programmed instructions by demanding his personal papers and an explanation of what he was doing. Super AI and Garcia 325 tried to confuse the watchman, but when it could not obtain Richard's cooperation, the biot insisted it must make an emergency report. On the monitor, Richard saw the entire mesh screen swing open and six leggies swarm onto Prince Hal. The robot continued to shriek. The watchman Garcia began to broadcast its emergency. Richard was aware that he had only a few minutes before he would be forced to leave. Come, damn it, come, he said watching the monitor in between furtive glances behind him in the central plane. There were no lights yet approaching from his home colony in the distance. At first, Richard thought he had imagined it. Then it repeated, the sound of large wings flapping. One of the leggies was partially obscuring his view, but moments later Richard definitely saw a familiar talon reaching out for Prince Hal. The avian shriek that followed confirmed the sighting. The image on the monitor became fuzzy. If you have a chance, Richard screamed into the radio. Try to return to the passage. I'll come back for you later. He turned around, quickly packing his monitor in his bag. Let's go, Richard said to his two biot associates. They began to run toward New Eden. Richard was triumphant as he hurried toward home. My hunch was right, he said exultantly to himself. This changes everything. Now... I have a daughter to give away. Chapter 10 The wedding was scheduled to take place at seven o'clock in the evening in the theatre at Central High School. The reception, for a much larger group, was planned for the gymnasium, an adjacent building no more than twenty metres away. All day long Nicole struggled with last-minute items, rescuing the preparations from one potential disaster after another. She did not have time to contemplate the significance of Richard's new discovery. 
He had come home full of excitement, wanting to discuss the avians and even who might be spying on his research, but Nicole had simply not been able to focus on anything except the wedding. They had both agreed not to tell anyone else about the avians until after they had had a chance for a lengthy discussion. Nicole had gone for a morning walk in the park with Ellie. They had talked about marriage, love and sex for over an hour, but Ellie had been so excited about the wedding that she had not been able to concentrate fully on what her mother was saying. Toward the end of their walk, Nicole had stopped under a tree to summarize her message. Remember at least this one thing, Ellie, Nicole had said, holding both her daughter's hands in hers. Sex is an important component of marriage, but it is not the most important. Because of your lack of experience, it is unlikely that sex will be wonderful for you at the beginning. However, if you and Robert love and trust each other, and both of you genuinely want to give and receive pleasure, you will find that your physical compatibility will increase year after year. Two hours before the ceremony, Nicole, Nye and Ellie arrived together at the school. Eponine was already there waiting for them. Are you nervous? the teacher said with a smile. Ellie nodded. I'm scared to death, Eponine added, and I'm only one of the bridesmaids. Ellie had asked her mother to be matron of honour. Nye Watanabe, Eponine and her sister Katie were the bridesmaids. Dr. Edward Stafford, a man who shared Robert Turner's passion for medical history, was the best man. Because he had no other close associates except for the buyouts at the hospital, Robert picked the rest of his attendants from the wakefield.